is touching the truth. During an unremarkable day on the 19th of July of the year 1999, a nine-year-old boy named Harry Potter with untidy jet black hair and almond-shaped startlingly green eyes behind a pair of old and worn glasses, sat alone in the cupboard under the stairs of number four, Privet Drive. Harry realized at a young age that he was able to cause strange things to happen, moving things without touching them, changing the colors of objects, and stuff like that, things his relatives would call freakishness. At the same time, he realized that his relatives would punish him even more harshly every time this happened. Harry was a smart kid and soon realized he could control this strange ability of his, he determined was magic and decided the best course of action was to actively suppress it. As far as he knew, suppressing it prevented these accidents from happening which, although had not made his relatives treat him better, it had made sure they didn't treat him worse. Most of the time anyways. Which was a win in his young eyes. He already felt the whole day the pressure deep in his gut making him ache but since there was an accident today that wasn't even caused by him, his relatives still blamed him for it, the cupboard he was in had a lock on it and he was unable to leave it. His relatives, the Dudleys, were upstairs trying and failing to fix a game station Dudley had gotten for his birthday a month ago but had broken accidentally. Rather than admit the truth, he blamed Harry even though everyone knew Harry would never step foot into Dudley's room. Dudley was currently whining that Harry's aunt and uncle should buy him a new one while Harry was suffering locked away in his dark cupboard. Harry doubted anyone cared for his suffering or that his own birthday was supposedly next week. The strange thing however was that although Harry was sure his relatives were upstairs fussing over the stupid game station, he could have sworn he heard footsteps outside his cupboard door. At that thought, he instantly realized how pathetic it was that he had considered the cupboard his. That was like saying the trash can belonged to the trash. This wasn't his space, it was just the prison they put him in. Harry felt the pressure build up in his bones and they somehow felt worse than they did when they were broken, which he had experienced often during his young life. He decided to go all in and ask softly to whoever might be out there, Hello. Can I come out? I don't feel so good. A few moments later Harry heard what could only be described as a woman sobbing. Was someone crying out there? Several sounds came and it seemed that there might have been several people on the other side of the door. The door jared itself as it looked like someone was going to open it but then Harry heard someone mutter something that sounded like, stupefy, followed by a heavy thump like something dropped onto the floor and someone saying in a gruff but sad voice, you know the rules, the past cannot be changed. Only observed or the consequences could be devastating. I'm sorry. The footsteps moved further away towards the direction of the front door and Harry heard from the other side of the cupboard door the gruff person say, I'm sorry Mr. Potter. This is not what you deserve. But I promise you, you'll be in a much better place soon. Harry could hear the bitter sadness behind the gruff stranger's voice and wondered what that person could possibly mean. How could he get to the better place, his cupboard was locked. The team from the Department of Mysteries left after using a variety of scanning and medical analysis spells through Harry's cupboard door and now were aware of the exact physical condition of the boy who lived as well as the details of the space he had been living in for the last nine years. Every member of the group's heart ached, but when using time turners to determine the cause of a catastrophic event, they were forbidden from stopping it, no matter how unjust or heartbreaking it was. Messing with time often has devastating consequences. Some time after the strangers left and silence returned, Harry felt his body ache and crack. A moment later, Harry Potter's body exploded as he released a mass of semi-solid magic formed black mist in a massive destructive burst of magic. Harry had a hard time keeping his consciousness as wounds formed all over his tiny body, as the dark mist burst out of him. His magic being drained from the blood wards placed on him many years ago, made it hard to survive this outburst of his obscurest transformation. He had to use all of his willpower to endure the hellish pain from his initial obscurus transformation. However, the blood wards which were placed to protect him from magical s who sought him with ill intent had been draining his magic reserves for years. They were supposed to be powered by love and would only use Harry's magic as a fuel source during an emergency, but not a single trace of love for Harry could be found in the home forcing the blood wards to rely on Harry's own magic instead. There was a reason they were considered highly illegal. Harry actually would have become an obscurial two years prior had it not been for the constant drain delaying his magic from going critical after years of being consciously suppressed. 
the destructive black mist that could not be seen by non-magicals quickly dissipated and with that, nothing was left of Harry Potter in this world. The assembled members of the Department of Mysteries watched without a single dry eye. They were a stoic profession but this tragedy was something that would have the entirety of Greater Magical Britain drowning in tears before the next sundown. What none of the watchers concerned themselves with was the fate of the Desleys. The residence had been obliterated to the point nothing stood higher than a meter off the ground from what was once a two-story building. No one would bother searching the wreckage for survivors. What was interesting was that the blood wards actually contained the explosion, preventing damage to the surrounding houses while amplifying it within the property line. The blood wards were of course examined and analyzed thoroughly and would be documented for later review. After getting a few more readouts they left for the agreed-upon location to wait until their originals had gone back in time before they could return and give their reports. Although the Departments of Mysteries employed those who sought answers to questions no one had ever answered, none of them were looking forward to giving the answers to the questions of what happened today to their fellow members. If possible, it might be better to put a lid on it, but they highly doubted that would be possible. Perhaps it would be for others, but not for Harry Potter. More than one had already determined a means to have it leak in a way that could not be traced back to them. They would not allow this matter to be swept under the rug. Fueled by the critical mass of his own magic reserves a rift in space opened and sucked the bloody and dying body of the young boy into it as everything of the house around him got obliterated. A normal human, wizard or not would be unable to survive in a rift of raw space like this. But Harry was in the midst of his transformation into an obscurus and was as good as unstoppable. An obscurus transforming into the black misty energy was unkillable by anything in the wizarding world, especially during the initial transformation. The force of the destructive space and the dark mist of the energy were clashing as the boy traveled through the rift protecting him somehow from the rift while his body was hurt by the dark mist itself. More and more of the obscurus got destroyed by the raw power of space before the boy finally got propelled out of the rift. Harry's devastated body landed in the middle of a beautiful green field at the border to a forest. The small boy only barely holding on to his consciousness through all the pain he was feeling from the destruction of his small body, opened his eyes and watched the breathtaking sky above him. It's so beautiful. But why is it purple? He questioned as he stared at it while his view was fading and breathing became harder and harder. His obscurus was completely destroyed by the force of the space rift and his magical reserves were depleted nothing could protect or heal him anymore, as Harry Potter was taking his last breath before he was completely consumed by darkness, the last thing he saw was dark smoke leaving from his scar with a loud inhuman cry. The boy who lived was dead, attracted by the massive release of magical power from the dimensional rift a beautiful young girl with white skin, blue eyes, and her most outstanding feature long and beautiful crimson red hair arrived at the clearing. Her name is Rias Gremory, the current ten-year-old heiress of the House of Gremory, one of the seventy-two pillar clans from the underworld. What happened here? Why did I feel a massive amount of energy in this field just now, she muttered as she arrived at the beautiful clearing. She was currently exploring the back area behind her family's home before she felt a massive disturbance close by. Being a curious child, she instantly headed for the place without care of possible dangers and consequences, since this territory was well guarded by her family. Looking around the vast green field, she soon discovered a small bloodied shape laying on the ground. Causing her to rush to the small body. Who would dare to do something like this? He isn't much older than me, she cried out as she saw in what shape the small boy was. Oh no, he is dead. How could people be so cruel, cried Rias as she inspected the wounded boy for any life signs. He died not long ago. She realized as she still could feel the presence of his soul clinging to his mortal vessel. After hesitating for a moment, thinking about her own situation, she quickly came to a decision and had a determined look on her beautiful face. I won't accept that. Nobody deserves such a fate. Especially not a boy, not older than me. I can save him. Pulling a small, elegant carved wooden box out of her bag. She opened the finely carved box, revealing a collection of fourteen white chess pieces, with one missing from the box. The queen piece to be exact. Thinking for a moment she pulled one of the white knight pieces out of the wooden box, before placing it on the black-haired boy's chest. The knight began to glow with a crimson aura but nothing more happened. It's not enough. Does he have a sacred gear or some kind of special power? Muttered Rias now a bit excited, 
that her random act of kindness could earn her a strong ally in the future. She instantly pulled a rook piece which held the worth of five pawn pieces, two more than a knight or bishop piece, and also placed it on his chest as the white rook also began to glow in the crimson aura, but still, nothing happened. Next, she tried it with two knight pieces, a total worth of six pawns. As they glowed in crimson aura she felt it was close but still not enough. After that she tried it with seven pawn pieces, she felt she was close but it still didn't work. At last, she pulled all her eight pawn pieces almost of equal value to a queen piece, that she previously used on Aquino a few days prior. As she wanted to place them on the dark-haired boy's chest, she was overwhelmed by a strange feeling causing her to stop for a moment. Right now she felt very confused, unlike her other pieces this felt like a major decision as if it was affecting the fate of the whole world. How could this be? She asked herself before shaking her head overcoming her hesitation and placing all eight of them on the boy's chest. They began to glow crimson red as they got absorbed by the boy, whose hearts began to beat once again. Hearing him breathe once again made Rhea sigh in relief, it worked. I am so glad. But being worth eight pieces, he must possess a really powerful secret. His demonic energy reserves are very high for a freshly reincarnated devil. Almost reaching mid-class level. She realized as she observed the now sleeping boy. Soon after her older brother's knight Suji Okita arrived at the scene, he was looking for her since she was missing for a while now, and Akino grew worried that she didn't return yet after her lessons ended. There you are Lady Rias. What happened here? Who is your young friend? After a short explanation, he helped her by carrying the young boy back to the Gremory mansion, where one of the servants with medical expertise took care of the wounds on his body before letting him rest and stabilize his new demonic energy reserves. DXD, 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 DXD. MMMH, what happened, muttered Harry Potter still disoriented as he slowly opened his eyes, discovering an unfamiliar roof in a very spacious room. Where am I? What's going on, questioned the young boy, before he remembered the pain that he experienced before the world turned dark for him. Did I die? Feeling a warm body at his side he spotted a girl with the most beautiful crimson hair he could imagine, similar age to him hugging him closely, as both of them lay on the softest and biggest bed he ever saw in his life. Admittedly he didn't see many, only the ones of the Desleys when he was cleaning their rooms, but he was pretty sure this bed was unreasonably big since it could easily fit ten people comfortably. Harry was observing the strange situation he found himself in, being hugged felt very nice he had to admit, is this what the other children felt when their parents hugged them? He questioned the warm feeling inside him. Su Su. After a few moments, the girl began to move and opened her eyes as Harry stared into two very beautiful blue orbs, completely mesmerized by them. As the young girl was similar staring back into his emerald green eyes. That's not the time for that, he realized that he was very impolite, eh, hello I am Harry. Nice to meet you. He greeted the girl shyly. Ahem, how did I get here? And why are we in the same bed, he asked her with a deep blush as he realized the both of them were completely naked. With a beautiful smile, she smiled at me, good morning, Harry. It's nice to meet you. I am Rias Gremory. She introduced herself, are your wounds okay, asked the girl now with a bit of worry in her eyes. Wounds? He muttered confused before he remembered how his whole body began to explode and tear open as the black mist tore out of him under massive pain. I seem to feel fine, just a bit sore but no pain. He replied. Did you treat me? One of my family's servants did treat your wounds. You gave me quite the shock when I found you bloodied and broken in the field. So it wasn't my imagination. He muttered, I am honestly baffled that I am still alive. I should be dead. You were dead, she answered now with a sad glow in her eyes. What? Please don't make jokes like these I am clearly still alive. He muttered a bit startled. It's no joke. You died. I brought you back. She explained calmly while still holding on to Harry. You brought me back, he questioned shocked, before stopping for a moment and realizing something. Was she like him? Could she also use magic? Did you use magic? he asked hesitantly. You know about magic? asked Rias with a raised brow, do you belong to one of the magician orders? Magician orders? There is something like that. 
No, I am just Harry. I just always had this ability to make things happen with my magic. He explained as he carefully watched her expression. Wait, a moment. You can just make things happen, without any calculations or similar, she questioned now confused, don't need human magicians need careful calculations for any kind of spell. I don't need any calculations. I just need to feel and will something and it happens. But I mostly can only move things. I never practiced it very much. My relatives never liked anything related to magic so I kept it suppressed. Explained Harry, now a bit more confident since the girl was obviously aware of magic, and didn't act like it was something abnormal or freakish. That shouldn't be possible. Only races like devils and angels can perform imagination-based magic, at least as far I am aware. She cried out completely confused. Devils and angels are real, asked Harry now innocently staring at her with an open mouth. Eh, yes, she replied flustered that she was so fast without explaining anything. I am a devil. And you are now too. That's how I brought you back to life. Reincarnating you into a devil. Eh. I am a devil now. Yes, and I am your master now. Sorry, that was the only way to save your life. She added a bit unsure since this was only the second person she brought back as a devil. You are my master. Will you hurt me? Or make me do bad things? Asked Harry with worry and sadness in his beautiful emerald orbs remembering the treatment of the Desleys. No, no, no. Nothing like that. Cried Rias out, being a devil, doesn't mean evil. And you are not a slave. It's more like employment. Breathing out with relief but still suspicious of the whole situation, Harry decided he didn't know enough and first needed to see where this was going, before he decides on a course of action for the future, he didn't have a place to go to anyway, I see, that sounds better. So what now? We should get dressed first. My family wants to meet you and there are many things we have to discuss. She replied as she stood up from the bed. They changed into a fresh set of clothes, Harry's old ones were discarded since they were mostly sheds anyway. He was happy to wear something for once that wasn't worn by anyone else before and a few sizes too big for him. After they finished changing, they headed to meet with Rhea's family, especially her older brother wanted to talk to Harry once he woke up. He apparently held some kind of important position in devil society, devil, a word that Harry still had trouble getting comfortable with, he was a devil now. They are not necessarily evil Harry, just a different race. Don't be discriminatory because of their name. He calmed himself internally as he followed Rias. They passed many doors in, this massive mansion before they arrived in front of an elegant wooden door decorated with many carvings. This whole place was gigantic, and Harry felt that he only saw a very small part of it now. The Desleys would have been outright jealous if they ever saw this place. Once Rias knocked on the wooden door, and a voice from inside told them to enter. They stepped inside a massive drawing room. One of these places rich people use to welcome guests. Just in an outrageous size even for normal rich humans, at least that's what Harry believed after seeing this room. Four people were waiting for them inside the spacious room, two quite similar looking men with the same crimson hair as Rias, one of them a bit older looking, with a short red beard, and two women one of them looks like an older version of Rias with brown hair and violet eyes. The other one a young beautiful woman who has back long silver white hair with long braids on both sides and red eyes, she was also wearing a French maid outfit. Ah, uh, Ri you and your new friend are finally awake, greeted the older man, I am Zioticus Gremory, the head of house Gremory and father of Rias, this is my wife Venelana, my son Serzex Lucifer and his wife Graphia Lucifuge. It's good to see that you are a fine young man. Good morning, I am Harry Potter. Thank you for helping me out, sir. Introduced Harry himself politely while thinking about the name of one particular individual, Lucifer. Like the fallen angel and original devil Lucifer. Meanwhile, Serzek straightened up at the name Harry Potter as he recognized it. While Zioticus replied amiably, not to worry young man, and call me Zioticus. As a member of my daughter's peerage, you are part of our family now. Eh, are you sure? Am I not something like a servant or employed, questioned Harry confused, still unfamiliar with the structures of the underworld. Technically that's true, in the eyes of the devil society, you would be considered a servant. But our family handles this quite differently. 
We treat our servants and employees well and with respect, and our peerages are part of our family. Explains Ziodicus with a smile before turning to Serzex, but it seems my son knows something about you, young man. Do you want to share it with the rest of us, Serzex? Harry is quite famous in the right circles. Are you aware of that Harry? asked Serzex carefully. I am famous. How could that be? I am just Harry, replied the young boy confused and unsure. There are many supernatural communities in the world. One of them consists of wizards and witches, called the Wizarding World. A community of magic users, with the ability to use image-based magic quite similar to us devils. Explained Serzex. Ah, I remember them they were, one of our society's attempts to create more devils after so many of us died during the Great War. We don't have any contact with them anymore since the ones responsible for their creation deemed them a failure. And Harry is one of them, questioned Ziodicus interested. Everyone in the room now looked at Serzex with interest, yes, and not just anyone. He is one of the most famous people in their community. Almost on the same level as Merlin who also originated from their community, and is famous in the whole supernatural world. Why would I be famous? Although I am aware that I possess magic, I didn't even know there was a bigger magical community I am part of. That's what I guessed. Combined with the circumstances of your arrival this makes your whole life concerning. First of all, I would like to know how you grew up and what you know. It would allow me to fill in the blanks better. If you are fine with it Harry, offered Serzex having a hunch about the boy's life. After thinking things through, Harry nodded and began to retell the story of his young life, while the adults were serious from the start and already guessed that there had to be something wrong, Rias was excited at first that she could learn more about her new peerage member. Which quickly changed into sadness and tears as she learned about the hard life and abuse he had to endure. Once Harry was finished he was quickly engulfed in a hug by Rias who had tears in her eyes. I am so sorry that you had to live with such vile people, even if they are still alive you will never have to return to them. She said as the others in the room nodded. Harry still was unsure of what he should think, but he had to admit the hug felt nice. I see it is as I guessed. Your story explains the energy readings we got from the area you arrived at. The dark mist that broke out of your body was the result of yourself suppressing your magic, you developed something called an obscurus. A parasitic being formed through your magic, you seem to have reached its critical mass and it began to become uncontrollable. But you somehow opened a rift in space and arrived here in the underworld, the only reason Rhea was able to reincarnate you is because your obscurus was destroyed by the destructive force in the rift. Or else the transformation would have annihilated your body in its entirety. At the same time, the transformation protected you from the rift. Explain Serzek seriously, now that you are a devil, you won't have to fear suppressing your demonic energy, but it's still not advisable or your sinful desires could become uncontrollable and you could rampage or something similar. Harry nodded solemnly, as he realized what cruelty the Desleys caused him, and even that they probably knew he was a wizard and they lied to him his whole life, do you know who my parents were and what happened to them? Serzex nodded, yes, it's closely related to the reason you are so famous in your magical community. Around eight years ago the wizarding community was at the height of a war, around twice a century a dark lord or lady appears amongst wizards and witches and tries to conquer it. This time the dark lord who used the prejudices of one side to lead them was on the verge of winning the whole war, until one fateful night he decided to attack your home in order to kill you for a reason I am not aware of. He killed both your parents before he also tried to kill you with one of the most powerful spells a wizard could perform, the killing curse which usually kills any normal mortal. But somehow you were able to reflect the curse and vanquished that dark lord. I am sure your mother performed a powerful piece of magic, by sacrificing herself since there are remains of a sacrificial protection spell on you. And as the only known survivor of the curse and vanquisher of their dark lord, you earned massive fame in the wizarding world. Soon after you were hidden away and nobody knew where. After processing this massive amount of information and revelations, Harry had to know, what was the name of my parents' killer? He called himself Lord Voldemort. The fear of him is so strong, that they even today don't dare to say his name. And usually resort to calling him you know who. But that's pretty much all I know about him since the wizarding community is very insular and doesn't interact with the bigger supernatural world. Replied Serzek seriously. Was he really that powerful? It depends, for the wizarding community yes. 
but in the larger picture not really. He has the strength of about a high-class devil which is basically reached by most adult devils after a few years. Even the killing curse is only lethal for low-class devils and may hurt a high-class one. Explain Sirzex. I see. That's a lot to take in. Muttered Harry while he was still hugged by Rius who tried her best to support him. We understand. Replied Venelana, Rhea's mother, warmly before adding, I think it's best if we stop this discussion for today. And let you have some rest, you learned a lot of new things about the world and yourself and will need some time to digest it. Thank you. Muttered Harry. Rhea, get Harry something to eat and lead him later back to his room so he can get some sleep. Of course mother. After a supple meal, Rhea showed Harry back to his room, who was still deep in thought about what he learned, and he decided to just recover for the rest of the day as he was still feeling extremely weak and exhausted. At least he finally knew the truth about his parents, and that they probably loved him since they fought to protect him until their last breath. He was also worried about why Voldemort targeted him, what was so special about a toddler that one of the most powerful beings of a community filled with other witches and wizards wanted to kill said toddler. So many questions he had no answers to since the involved parties were dead and the devils just had rudimentary access to information in that particular community since they were of no major concern. At the end of the day, he fell asleep much calmer, since at last he now knew who he was and where he came from. DXD, 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 DXD. The next morning Harry was woken up by an excited Rias, the red-haired beauty pulled him out of his bed and forced him to quickly dress up. Come on Harry. You slept enough. It's time to show you the mansion and the area. But first I want to introduce you to my queen. One of my closest friends. Queen, thought a confused and now nervous Harry as he got pulled by the red-haired girl towards a room close to his own, in the same section of the mansion. This is my personal living room. For my and my peerage's personal use. This is where I will usually meet my friends. Explained Rias as she opened the wooden door and pulled him inside. Inside there was a nice but more modern decorated room, with multiple seating possibilities and a table, a TV, and multiple different drawers. Waiting for them already was a beautiful young girl around their age with long and silky black hair, tied in a ponytail. She had nice violet eyes and wore nice cute clothes as she was currently enjoying a cup of tea while she sat at the table. There you are. Smiled the dark-haired girl with a strained but polite smile as they entered the room. This is Harry, Aquino. The new member of my peerage. Introduced Rias with a bright smile as they stopped at the table, and Harry, this is my queen Aquino. It's nice to meet you, Harry Cohen. Greeted Aquino as she looked at the nervous boy carefully as her previous experiences made her mistrustful of the male gender. Harry instantly straightened up and performed a slight bow as he greeted the girl, eh. Yeah. It's an honor to meet you, your majesty. Trying his best to remember how people in the telly would interact with the British royal family while meeting them. This was hard for Harry since he never was allowed to watch television with the Desleys and only managed to catch a few fleeting glances, while he was grabbing or bringing something for them. The other two people in the room were at first startled for a few moments as they looked at the nervous boy before they broke out into giggles, while the atmosphere lightened considerably up. Era era, you fuffufu, giggled Aquino, no need to treat me like royalty, Harry Cohen. My role as a member of Rias Peerage is just queen. There is no longer any royalty in devil society, just nobility. Role? What does that mean, asked Harry a bit confused and embarrassed. Ah, uh, I didn't explain that yet. Neither about devils in general. Remembered Rias while she was still smiling amused, long time ago, there was a three-sided war between the devils, the fallen angels, and God with its angels' followers. All three sides had a large army and they fought for almost eternity. As a result, all three sides lost most of their troops and the war finished several hundred years ago with no side winning. Aquino continued with the explanation, I heard that most of the pure devils passed away in that war. Even after the war, there are still problems between the devils, the fallen angels, and God. Even though the fallen angels and God's side also lost most of their troops, we are still in a position where we can't let our guard down, or else we will be in trouble. Rhea spoke again, then the devils looked for many ways to bring their numbers up again. Harry remembered that wizards and witches are just the result of one of these attempts. 
In the end, they decided to use a system to form a small group of soldiers. And that is the evil piece. Evil piece? Harry listened carefully. Devils with peerage decide to use the traits of the humans game, chess, to their servant devils. It was also sarcasm because most of the servants are devils that were reincarnated from humans. Since then, chess became a popular game in the underworld. We'll leave that aside. Devils who are masters are the king of the peerage. In our case, that is me. From there, they created five special traits that consist of a queen, knight, rook, bishop, and pawn. Since they couldn't make an army, they decided to have a small number of devils and give them enormous powers. This system was made in the past few centuries, and this unexpectedly became popular amongst devils with a peerage. What became popular? The game chess, asked Harry as he watched the excited girl giving him an explanation. They started to compete against each other. For example like, my knight is stronger, or, no, my rook is stronger. As a result, high-class devils started to play a game like that of chess against each other using their servant devils. We call it the, raiding game. Anyway, this game became very popular amongst the devils. Now, there are even tournaments for it. The strength of their pieces and also how strong they are at the game affects the devil's social position and their peerage. There is a thing called peace collection where they gather humans with talents and make them into their pieces. It's very popular recently. Talented servants become their status. Will I also have to fight in these raiding games, questioned Harry interested. I'm not a mature devil yet, so I can't participate in the official tournament. Even if I could, there are things that I need to go through, or else I can't play. My peerage consists only of you and Aquino for now, we won't be participating in a game for a few years yet. I met Aquino just last month. Explained Rias, remembering something with a frown before she smiled again. But we will absolutely participate one day since I want to become the rating game champion. She said with conviction. I see. It sounds interesting. Will I be able to get my own peerage one day, asked Harry interestingly, since he wanted to learn how restricted he was in this new society. Yes, you can get your own set once you reach the rank of a high-class devil. Your demonic power is at that point stable enough that you can support and reincarnate devils. Replied Rias. Stable? Right now the demonic power inside you is very unstable and volatile. Since I gave you a bit of my demonic power to reincarnate you, it is stable around me. That's also one of the reasons I slept with you the first day. If you were to run away, you would slowly lose control and become corrupted if your will isn't powerful enough. This is what we call a stray devil, they usually go berserk and hurt innocents. Rias explained seriously. Oh. Murmured Harry, having his obscurest transformation and the pain still present in his mind. As for the roles in a peerage, each piece has a value, the highest value piece is the queen, followed by the rook, bishop, and knight, with the least valuable being the pawn. Aquino received the queen piece which gives a major boost to all her abilities. The queen acts as the right hand of the king. Then there is the knight which gives a major boost to speed and dexterity, and the rook with a boost to strength and endurance. The bishop piece gives a huge boost in magical abilities. Which piece do I have? asked Harry hopefully. You are my pawn. Replied Rias when she saw Harry's downcast look she began to laugh, don't worry Harry. You are misunderstanding again. We count the value of each piece in pawns, the more powerful or potential the target has the more value we need to reincarnate it. For example, the queen is worth, nine pawns. The rook five, the bishop and knight each three. But you not only can use one piece each you can use multiple of each piece. I tried to reincarnate you with a rook and later two knight pieces. But both didn't have enough value to reincarnate you. I needed all of my eight pawn pieces to successfully reincarnate you. Said Rias brightly. What? Harry was shocked, how could that be? I am just Harry. There is nothing special about me. Even my wizard heritage is a watered-down version of being a devil as far as I understood that. I believe there is a sacred gear inside of you. Deciding that it was better to test on one of the trainings ground all of them quickly changed into sports clothes and headed out. Soon they arrived outside the Gremory mansion, at one of the training grounds. As Harry arrived he couldn't wait any longer and had to ask, 
so what is a sacred gear? Sacred gear is an irregular power that is bestowed to certain humans. For example, most of the people whose names are recorded in history are said to be possessors of a sacred gear. They use the power of their sacred gear to record their name in history. Explained Rhea standing in front of Harry on a wide barren field. Presently, there are people who possess sacred gears within their bodies. Do you know those people who play an important role worldwide? Most of those people possess a sacred gear. Added Aquino as she had more experience in the human world than Rias. Rias continued with her explanation, many sacred gears are only useful in human society, something like a sacred gear that gives you an enchanting voice, these things only work on beings outside the supernatural world. But there are also some powerful ones that are very useful in supernatural world. It isn't unlikely that you would have been recruited or killed for your sacred gear by someone from the other factions of the supernatural world in the future if you didn't land here. In order to be born with a sacred gear you need to be human, at least partially. Wizards are mostly human with a small part of devil genetic. I see. How do we find out whether I have a sacred gear? How do I use it? Asked Harry after getting a basic understanding, that it was some kind of weapon or ability he was born with. Stretch your hand out. Requested Rias, as she reminded herself what she learned about sacred gears during her lessons, close your eyes and imagine the strongest being that comes to your mind. Harry followed her guidance strongest being. Like whom? Uncle Vernon. No, he wasn't strong, all he could do was beat and suppress me. And I am weak. Eh, I don't know who to think of. I can't think of anyone. Admitted Harry after a while. Think of someone from animes or movies. Like Son Goku, advised Rias excited with stars in her eyes. Anime. What's that? I've never seen a movie. Replied Harry unsure of what he should do, still trying to find a good memory of a strong person. You never, saw a movie and don't know anime, questioned Akino baffled. While Rias' expression changed into an angry one as she remembered what she learned of Harry's past, these bastards. She cursed in an unladylike manner. After a short explanation, Harry realized that even Dudley wouldn't know anime since Uncle Vernon, would have dubbed it something like, Jap garbage and kept it out of his home. Don't worry Harry we will fill you in on all of that, she said once again excited, now she had someone she could pull with her for her most favorite hobby. Can't you really think of anybody strong? It just needs to be someone using some kind of move. Harry thought deeply as he remembered in the darkest depths of his mind a dark silhouette with a stick whipping said stick at him and a sickly green lightning headed at him. Is that Voldemort? Doesn't matter right now. Focus Harry. He thought as he told Rias that he had one. Then imagine it, and imagine that person in a particular pose where he looks the strongest. Harry copied that silhouette standing with his stick in front of Harry pointing it at him as Rias' voice continued guiding him. Now mimic the pose of that person. You have to imagine it strongly, okay? You cannot hold back. He nodded as he copied the stance of the silhouette stretching his hand out, instead of the stick he used his index finger. Copying his movement aggressively whipping his finger in an empty direction. Through the depths of his memories, he remembered the angry voice of the man shouting, Avada Kedavra. For a moment he felt the demonic power inside of him moving trying to leave his body through his finger, but it acted as if it wasn't sure what to do. Oh, it was a spell. But this time I didn't focus on wanting anything specific. He realized, good, that it didn't work I think it was the killing curse Mr. Serzex talked about. Now, open your eyes. The underworld is filled with demonic power, the sacred gear will be able to appear more easily. Harry opened his eyes and a bright emerald green flash originated from his chest and engulfed the three children. Everything turned white for them before they appeared in an almost empty space stretching unending in each direction. Only a small tree stood in front of them. Is this my sacred gear? asked Harry unsure of what happened, as he rather expected a sword or something to appear in his hands. I believe it is. Nodded Aquino as she looked around the space, your sacred gear seems to transport us to a different dimension or a pocket dimension. She guessed. Meanwhile, Rias thoughtfully stared at the small tree in front of them. After observing it for a while she turned to the other two, I think I know what sacred gear you have. Harry tries to imagine we are standing on a wide field filled with grass. Okay. Nodded the boy as he concentrated, 
thinking of the beautiful green field he crashed on as he landed in the underworld. He also thought of the fascinating purple sky in the underworld, with nice and fluffy white clouds. After a few seconds, the space around them began to change, and suddenly they were standing on the wide field Harry was imagining. They were able to stare into the distance as the grass was unending. The only thing that remained was the tree, it still stood unchanged in front of them. I knew it. Shouted Rias now completely excited, your sacred gear is amazing. Really? What is it? asked Akino interested, she couldn't identify it yet since her formal education just began recently and she didn't learn much about the different sacred gears yet. Harry was also watching Rias with interest, as she started to tell them, you have one of the thirteen Longinus. The Longinus are the most powerful sacred gears in existence, each one of them has the potential to kill God. Kill God? That sounds scary. Said Harry as he stared in awe at the tree in the middle of the endless space. Yes, but it still takes a lot of work to reach that level. Nodded Rias as she continued, a lot of it depends on your own personal strength, your creativity, and mastery of your sacred gear. But we will definitely earn a lot of attention with such a sacred gear since you are part of my peerage. That's true. We better don't announce to the public that I have a Longinus. At least until we are stronger. Agreed Harry, since he learned early in his life the safest thing was to keep a low profile. He always kept his grades below Dudley, suppressed his magic and similar so he wouldn't earn the ire of the Desleys. We should still inform my parents and big brother, they will make sure that you receive proper training and help to keep the news under wraps. This shouldn't be that hard since this particular sacred gear doesn't manifest like an object and just transports us to a dimension. We will just tell the public if necessary it is a space sacred gear. Added Rias. Harry nodded before asking, so what is my sacred gear called and what does it do? You have Innovate Clear also known as the miniature garden of the green tree of innovation and sacred gear that lets one impersonate God. It allows you to create an artificial pocket universe that can create and support life, and anything else you want. However, anything created in there can only live in that universe. Oh, so I could create here anything. Muttered Harry as he imagined a nice garden table with a few chairs surrounding it. They appeared instantly in front of them and he felt a tiny bit more tired, I see that's how it works. But can that really kill God? Considering you can create anything you imagine, and are basically God here. You are not limited to things that really exist in our universe, you can also create fictional things as long you can imagine it, Harry. Once I showed you some anime, you will realize how powerful this sacred gear truly is. Especially since you even can create life in here. As long you can pull anyone inside and have enough imagination you are unbeatable. That truly sounds powerful. Agreed Akino in wonder. Harry also nodded now that he thinks about it, it was really a strong ability to possess. He wanted to know more about the things he could do and thought about a small ginger cat with green eyes he dreams of. And suddenly heard a small mew as said cat appeared in front of them and looked at them. Oh, dash, cooed the girls until they suddenly got interrupted as a green flash appeared and they landed outside on the training ground once again. Before Harry could say anything a wave of exhaustion overcame him and the world around him turned black as he fell to the ground. Harry learned that the creation of life inside Innovate Clear was still beyond him, the only reason he succeeded in creating the ginger cat, that Rias named Tora which is supposed to mean tiger in Japanese, is because he has a high level of familiarity with it since he dreamed of Tora regularly. They theorized that Harry may have had such a cat before the attack on his home in 1991 happened. Whether the original cat was still alive after the attack none of them was sure, since there was a not so small chance it survived the attack of Voldemort. It's been a few days since he lost consciousness after exhausting himself while testing his sacred gear, currently, Harry was dragged by Rias to another part of the massive mansion as she wanted to show him something amazing. Happy birthday, shouted multiple voices as they entered one of the many large living rooms. It was filled with people that were watching them with amusement, as they saw the shocked expression of Harry, who himself completely forgot that today was his birthday. There were Lord and Lady Gremory, Sirzex and his wife Grafia who was still wearing her maid outfit, but wore a small smile on her face, Pekino. But also three unknown people, two girls of the same age as Harry and one slightly older around Sirzex's age, who could be in her twenties or a few centuries old, since Devil could become ten thousand years old. A fact that still baffled Harry. 
Both of the young girls were dark-haired and had glasses, one of them had long hair the other had short ones and was currently glaring at the older girl who was excited jumping up and down. The excited older girl was short of stature and had long black hair tied into twin tails and blue eyes. Surprise! We decided to throw you a surprise birthday party, said Rias proudly with a large smile as she watched him with her large blue eyes. I never told you my birthday. Whispered Harry in shock, as he never celebrated his birthday before. Big Brother obviously began to investigate as much about you as possible. Now come on Harry, I want to introduce you to my friends. Rhea said as she pulled him impatiently towards the two unfamiliar girls. This is my friend, Sona the heiress of House Citri, and my first friend. Introduced Rhea the girl with a short bob cut, before pointing at the other long-haired girl, and her queen Tsubaki Shinra. Hello, it's nice to meet the both of you. I am Harry Potter the pawn of Rhea. Greeted Harry the both of them slightly awkwardly with all the attention on him. Greetings, Mr. Potter. It's good to meet you too. I wish you happy birthday. Greeted Sona followed by Tsubaki. Eh, just call me Harry. Thank you for coming to my birthday. Replied Harry. You also may call me Sona. Answered Sona with a slight smile. And meet Tsubaki. Added her queen, just as the third unfamiliar person injected herself into the conversation. Oh you really look like a male version of Sotan. So cute especially with the British accent. Cooed the older girl, happy birthday to you, male Sotan. So, Tan, muttered Harry confused as he stared at the hyperactive girl in front of him. Nay-san please stop. I am really sorry Harry-san, this is my older sister Seraphal Leviathan. Even she doesn't look and act like it, she is one of the four Satans like Serzek Sama, the leaders of the underworld. Interjected Sona with a blush as she pulled Seraphal away from the confused boy. Really? She seems to have a unique personality like Mr. Serzek's. It's nice to meet you Ms. Leviathan. Nodded Harry as he already met Serzek a few times over the last few days and became more familiar with his quirks, especially his Siskon personality, is there a Japanese or Asian area in the underworld? You use the honorifics like in one of Rhea's animes. Asked Harry interested to learn more about the underworld. Oh, Rhea's didn't tell you yet. The culture of the underworld is generally more based on Europe, but my sister is responsible for foreign affairs and has a lot to communicate with different factions, and picked up some of their habits. Especially since the relationship with the Shernat faction is currently strained. Explained the bespectacled girl, as for me, Rias and I are planning to go to Japan for our high school and university education. I am already practicing proper Japanese etiquette to blend in. I was planning to tell Harry about it once he got more comfortable, and ask him whether he wants to join us too. Explained Rias. It sounds interesting, I would love to see more of the world. Agreed Harry interested, but how will I visit school? I am technically dead in the human world and have no formal education. Don't worry about that. From next week on you will join me and Akino in our lessons. From time to time we will even have lessons with Sona and her peerage. Homeschooling in the underworld is off a higher quality than in the human world. Not only do we have personal lesson plans fit for every person, but we also study subjects beyond any human school, like etiquette, politics, and even magic. She explained excited that Harry would join them from now on. Etiquette and politics? Why would I need that? Am I not technically a servant? questioned Harry with confusion. This time Lord Ziodicus Gremory replied with a proud smile, although House Gremory as does House Citri treat our peerage and servants like family, you are technically right. You still are a member of the peerage of the future head of House Gremory and will have to know how to act on official occasions and in public. But also with your Longinus, don't worry everyone present is already aware of it and won't share it, we want you to make some friends without having to lie to them, he added as he saw Harry's look about revealing his sacred gear, with your Longinus, you will have a high status in our society, because in the end what matters most is power. Additionally, you yourself are of noble birth and have an image to preserve in the wizarding world. I am, asked Harry as he got handed a nicely packed package by Lady Venelana. Which he opened after she nodded supportively. Inside was an old book with the title, Chronic of the Most Ancient and Most Noble House of Potter written in golden letters on the leather binding. 
This is the history of your family, unfortunately, it's not an actual version, since we were only able to acquire it from the possessions of a distantly related family. Such chronics are usually kept in family possession, we believe the most actual version may be in your family vault. Explained Venelana. I have a vault. There are still things of my family left, asked Harry as he looked up from the book. This time it was Sarah Fall who responded since as Satan responsible for foreign affairs, she was responsible for the investigation of Harry's background in the wizarding world and also communicated with the goblins, one of the races aware of the bigger supernatural world inside the wizarding world. Right now you have access to a trust vault, which refreshes every year with up to 2,000 galleons from the family vault. Galleons are gold coins used in the wizarding world and are more than enough for your school things and to live comfortably for one year. But the main vault is only accessible by the head of House Potter, which you can only become once you are an adult which normally happens at 17 in the wizarding world. Your parents have gone into hiding since they somehow were aware that Voldemort was targeting them. But they hid most of their valuable belongings and family artifacts in the family vault with the goblins before they magically hid themselves in a smaller house. Your family once had a mansion, but only the property remained, the building got destroyed during the war. Added Serzex. That's fine. I am happy that not everything of my parents and ancestors is gone and I one day will learn more about them. Said Harry with a content smile. You won't have to wait that long. Said Sarah Fall proudly as she pulled another wrapped gift out, as Harry undid the wrapping another book was revealed, this one much newer, my contacts in the wizarding world were able to collect pictures of your parents mostly from their school time. As Harry opened up the album, he saw a couple standing in front of a lake with a massive castle behind them winking at the camera. It's moving, he said with wonder. Yes, the wizarding world advanced in a different way, instead of adapting their own versions of technology. They enhanced existing ones with magic, and now moving pictures are the standard there. Explained Sarah Fall. Harry still receives more gifts today like a collection of anime series, the collected works of Shakespeare, a chess set, and more, but his family chronic and the album of his parents were his highlights. After having a wonderful birthday party for the first time in his whole life, Harry fell at night asleep contently. DXD, 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 DXD. And, the second chapter for you guys today. Will there be more? We will see. Enjoy. It seems Harry will also be influenced by Ria's love for anything from Japan, like anime and manga. In the week after his surprise birthday party, he joined Rias and Akino in their lessons. He had to cover a lot of topics since he was already behind them by quite a bit, his holding back during his regular school years while living with the Desleys, to prevent them from punishing him more, didn't help him now and had quite the impact on his level of education compared to his age class. Holding back was no longer a possibility for him, it was quickly discovered by Sona an aspiring educator herself, during one of their shared lessons. It earned him quite the scolding and disappointed look, especially from Lady Gremory and Grafia. Not wanting to disappoint people who are so nice to him, he tried his best from now on, and was able with personal tutoring and a lot of private reading and studying, to close the gap between him and the others. Besides regular lessons like math, science, geography, history, and so on, both of the human world and the supernatural world, they even got him books about the history of the wizarding world, and his social lessons like etiquette and politics, he also began to learn the basics of magic. Different from human magician a devil didn't need calculations to perform magic, but it made magic much easier and more powerful. The most prominent example is the magical expertise of Ajuka Beelzebub, who is able to enhance his demonic magic to such a ridiculous level with calculations, that he was able to create magic so unique that only he can perform it similar to a bloodline like the power of destruction. While Rias was already so advanced that she began to study her unique bloodline the power of destruction more thoroughly, and Akino who learned magic from her parents as a child already began to study more advanced elemental spells, Harry was still learning the basics. For now, he focused on small-scale elemental spells like a fireball or wind gust while also enhancing them with calculations, which he was studying in sync with his math lessons. As for his physical training, he had no problem keeping up with them, since he is always quite fit. Being fit and fast was the best way to handle Dudley and his gang, so Harry always made sure he was in top shape. Especially with the regular boost from turning into a devil. 
And so months passed and Harry Potter kept living with the Gremories and advanced rapidly in all areas of his education. Not only were his health problems fixed, but he also became stronger and healthier. During this time he learned a lot about his sacred gear, Innovate Clear. Unfortunately, the underworld didn't have much information about that particular Longinus besides the basics since it was never in possession of a devil. And the previous users always kept a low profile and never really made large waves like the two heavenly dragons or the wielder of the true Longinus. But with the guidance of Sir's ex Bishop McGregor Mathers, a powerful and knowledgeable magician and one of the founders of Golden Dawn, one of the most famous magician organizations in the world, who become one of his tutors from time to time, especially in magic and his sacred gear, Harry was able to figure quite a lot out about Innovate Clear. He was able to truly create anything but the more complex the thing was like a computer for example, or powerful like a divine weapon, or both like some living being the more stamina and demonic energy it would cost him to create it. Anything he created inside his the universe of his sacred gear would remain there like the cat living inside, of course, he could erase it if he wanted. It could also act as his personal inventory space, anything he put from the outside world could be taken out again. But anything he created inside had to remain there. The more he understood the object he created like its chemical composition, or how physics affects it, the less energy he needed to create the object. This also works with emotional attachment, like in the case of his cat, for now, he had still to succeed in creating any other living animal even an insect. Every time he tried it he felt his reserves massively draining. He focused on studying and understanding the objects and things he wanted to create in his universe. For one of the experiments with his sacred gear suggested by Mr. McGregor Mathers. Harry put a potted flower inside and let it grow to see what would happen with it, in the end, he could take all parts of the flower out even the ones that grew inside. But the most amazing discovery of that test is that his demonic energy reserves would develop a very tiny bit faster while the flower was inside. It was only detectable because his reserves were still small as a low-class devil. Mr. McGregor Mathers theorized that his personal universe was directly connected to his demonic power reserves and his soul, and the life force generated through the potted plant cycle of life added to the energy of the universe. Helping expand Harry's energy reserves. From then on one of the things he focused on was to create a small ecosystem in his universe, by creating nutritious earth and water inside of it and planting many plants and seeds he brought from the outside to accelerate his demonic power growth but also allowing himself to have a hobby with a nice garden. Often Rias and Aquino would join him and help him out with his garden during their free time. From time to time Sona and Tsubaki would also join. Finally the classes for the day are over, cried Rias happily out as they entered her personal living area in the Gremory mansion after a long day of classes and sat down in the comfortable armchairs. Yes, they are quite tiring. Agreed Aquino who had currently a fake smile on her face, that she wore from time to time if something that Harry was unaware of bothered her. Today she wore it after a dancing class during which she had to partner up with him. Although Harry couldn't figure the reason behind it out yet, but he knew her well enough already that he realized she hadn't a problem with him in particular but with the male gender. Someone must have hurt her before he met her. As Harry was thinking about that problem, a knock on the door interrupted his thoughts. Rias Chan, I wanted to talk with you about something said Sirzex as he entered the living room. What is it, Onyesama? Rias questioned, having also started to use Japanese honorifics in preparation for their time in Japan, and stood up to face her brother while Akino and Harry bowed their heads down in respect for one of the four Satans. Having learned more about the underworld and devil society, Harry knew who he should be treating respectfully. I have a new peerage member for you, Sirzex replied with a smile and everyone gained a look of confusion while Harry thought he saw a sad and angry glint in his eyes for a small moment. A new peerage member? Rias asked as she looked at her brother with excitement. Yes, here she is. Sirzex stepped to the side revealing a tiny little petite cute girl with short white hair cut in a bob cut with bangs going over her forehead, her eyes were golden, her most notable feature being a pair of white kitty ears sticking out from the top of her head and a white cat tail from her bottom. She looked rather nervous and frightened like a kitten being taken to a new home. She has some special circumstances so she can't really stay anywhere else. If you wish to know more about these circumstances you will have to ask her yourself. Once he said his part he decided to leave since his little sister had to learn to handle such situations herself. And my name is. S. H. Chiron. 
The girl muttered her name in a little voice as she avoided eye contact with anyone in the room. Chiron, nice to meet you. Rias greeted the little petite girl with a warm welcoming smile trying to make the girl feel more at ease, but to no avail. Chiron didn't seem to like being called by her name and they all seemed to take notice of that, Rias, Aquino, and Harry exchanged looks with one another trying to figure out what to do. Harry felt like the small girl like him and Aquino had a troubled past, and they had to be careful in their approach with her. Do you want to sit down? asked Harry with a warm smile. After the little girl took a place in the living room she didn't really interact with anyone even when they tried to include her in their discussions. Once it became dark outside and the stars shined in a bright purple, they showed Chiron her room before leaving her for the night. Before Rias and Harry parted ways to their own rooms, Harry grabbed the still troubled looking Rias by her arm, it might be best to let her sort out her own feelings before we try and open up to her. Whatever she's going through I doubt we can do anything to comfort her. Maybe we should give her some space. He explained. But Dash, Rias tried to find a good reason, but she couldn't find any way to argue against Harry on this and decided to stay silent before she nodded and also headed to her room. You are right. Thank you, Harry. Sleep well. You too, Rias. The situation with Chiron didn't change over the course of the next few weeks, every attempt of communication would be ignored. It became so troubling that she would go off to hide somewhere and only come out when there was food. She was pretty much acting like an abused cat, mistrustful of people. Harry remembered a little cat, that was hurt by Dudley and his friends, and began to always hide from other humans. Back then he felt sad for the small animal, and often secretly fed it some sausages he secretly stole from the Desleys. They ate that much that a missing sausage from time to time wouldn't even be noticed. After a while, the cat even began to trust him and it even let him pet it, until it got captured by animal services and brought to a shelter for strays. Harry already knew that Chiron was often hiding on the roof of the mansion. He spotted her often while he was enjoying his favorite perk as a devil, his wings. Often he would head out and practice his abilities to fly, just to enjoy the freedom in the sky, and since she arrived he often saw her sitting on the roof watching the sky. I have a plan to get Chiron to trust us. He said to Rias one day. Really? What do you need? What's your plan? asked the crimson-haired girl who often wore a troubled face since the small white-haired girl arrived. All you need to do for now is to tell the kitchen staff that they should let me use the kitchen. Said Harry a bit annoyed since he was thrown every time out when he wanted to use the kitchen. That's easy. But will this really work? She is eating with us every day and it doesn't affect her, asked Rias confused. Don't worry. I have years of experience in the kitchen and I believe with tasty desserts I will be able to get her to open us to us. She strikes me as someone with a sweet tooth. Explained Harry with a smile. From that day Harry would spend some time after his training and lessons in the kitchen, to prepare some nice sweets. Before he goes for his daily flight he approaches the little white-haired girl sitting on the roof of the mansion. Hey, Chiron, greeted Harry carefully before the girl even registered his presence. Chiron's ears instantly twitched as she turned around eyeing Harry suspiciously, her tail standing on attention as she was ready to flee instantly, what do you want, she asked confused as she kept her distance. I made some pudding. There is also some for you. Explained Harry with a warm smile as he watched her with his emerald green eyes, before putting the glasses with pudding on the floor, I will leave it here. If you want it it's yours. Once he said his piece he flew off the roof and began to enjoy the sky while keeping secretly an eye on the small cat girl. Who was eyeing the glasses of Pudi Ding with a longing expression for a few minutes, as her two white tails were excitedly swinging around. After sniffing the pudding and looking around that nobody was watching her, she snatched the pudding and began to eat it with much gusto and a happy smile. From then on Harry would make every day some nice sweets like cakes, pudding, crepes, and more, and share some with everyone before bringing some to Chiron, who would already wait for him. After a while, she began to thank him and talk with him from time to time. After a few weeks, Harry could even sit down beside her and they would enjoy their sweet snack in silence together while watching the unique purple sky of the underworld. Today was the day Harry decided to take the straightforward approach, to find out what happened to the white-haired girl. As they were sitting together on the roof enjoying a nice vanilla muffin he asked, do you want to talk about who hurt you? As the words left his mouth Chiron's body froze and she looked away from him while she remained silent. 
This situation stayed that way for a small while before Harry spoke again, I take that as a no. Then I guess I have to guess what your problem is. Having seen the pain in Chiron's eyes multiple times during his life, every time he tried to learn more about his parents from his aunt. Especially about his mother, for some strange reason, his aunt believed his mother had betrayed her, leaving her behind in the human world as she went off to the wizarding world. His aunt was so hurt that she developed a deep hatred, for magic, his mother, and even him. He learned that as Sarah Fall investigated his family, and some old neighbors of his grandparents from his mother's side remembered how the relationship between his mom and his aunt began to sour and turn bitter after she became eleven. Not wanting this little girl to become a bitter and hateful person like his aunt he was determined to help her overcome her issues. Someone you trusted and loved betrayed you and now you feel sad, right? Harry asked and Chiron flinched with her eyes widening a little. I take that as a yes. Now if I were to guess who this person was, I would say either a parent or a sibling. Harry noticed the small girl flinching again at the mention of the word sibling. Sibling then, I see. Are you the same? Chiron muttered as she gazed at Harry slightly with big sad eyes. Not really, but I experienced the outcome of such a broken relationship, even if it was never caused with bad intentions. Said Harry thoughtfully, do you want me to tell you the story of what happened between my mother and her sister? She said nothing but was now focused on Harry, from what I learned, once my mother turned eleven, she learned that she was special and could go to a place to study magic. While my aunt was a completely normal human, that was when the rift between the both of them began to form, my aunt become jealous of my mother and their relationship become colder and colder. While they still kept contact my aunt felt like the wizarding world, that is the magic community my parents were part of, was taking my mom away from her. Retold Harry with a hint of sadness in his voice, the final break happened after my mother graduated from the magic school. The wizarding world was in the midst of a terrible civil war, my parents just gave birth to me, and for some reason, the leader of the dark side who started the civil war, the so-called Dark Lord, decided he needed to kill me. So my parents decided they had to go into hiding. In order to protect my aunt my mother had to cut off any contact with her since she and her family were completely normal humans. From my mother's letters I learned that she and my aunt had a big fallout, my aunt felt like my mom was betraying her for the wizarding world. Chiron was trembling a bit as she was thinking about something herself. In the end even if it happened to protect her, my aunt began to hate anything related to magic including my mother. The evil wizard still found my parents and killed them, but through something my parents did I survived and was brought to live with my aunt. Said Harry with a bit of pain in his voice, from then on my aunt would let her resentment out on me, which led to my eventual death and reincarnation as a devil. Finished Harry as he wanted to spare her from the details of his hurtful childhood. Meanwhile, Chiron had tears in her eyes and began to hug him, while he calmed the little girl down. My Wanisama. Chiron uttered trying to hold back her tears as she felt she also needed to share her story. As she killed our former master because she was drunk with power. That's what I heard. And now she's, she's. A wanted criminal. Harry finished and Chiron couldn't hold back her tears and cried into the boy's chest. What is your older sister's name? Sniff. Kuroka. Chiron replied. I see. Harry gently stroked the girl's head. We should go back inside now. Everyone has been worried sick about how they could help you. Why? Why do they care? Chiron questioned. Because you are like family to me now. Rias climbed up onto the tower with them and looked at Chiron with a warm loving smile, she knew that Harry would try today to talk to the small girl and decided to listen to them with Aquino. Family? Chiron questioned as Aquino also climbed up. That's right, you're a part of our family now, Chiron, Aquino replied with a warm loving smile. We love you and care for you, we eat together, we laugh together, we have fun together, and that makes us family, Rhea said and embraced the little Nicomeda in a hug and Chiron started crying even more and Aquino even joined in on the hug. Hey, since you seem so uncomfortable with your name, how about I give you a new one? Rhea suggested which piqued the petite Nicomeda's interest. Oh, I know. How about Kaneko? You look so much like a kitten after all. Kaneko. I like it. Chiron uttered with a little happy smile on her lips. Thanks, Harry. I didn't know how to help her. Muttered Rias to her pawn. No problem. 
replied Harry with a warm smile, we are family after all. From then on Chiron took the name Kaneko Tuju, and joined their peerage after reincarnating with one rook piece, enhancing her strength greatly. Since she didn't have a last name, neither as Chiron nor Kaneko, but learned that everyone else had one, she decided on Tuju which simply meant rook in Japanese. Harry learned that the Yukai are a collection of supernatural races with animal features residing in Japan, specifically Kyoto, under the protection of the Shinto pantheon, together with different exorcist clans based in Japan, they form the Shinto faction. And the Nakomata race was recently massacred by devils after Kuroka killed her pure-blooded devil master and after that relationship between devils and the Shinto faction turned cold. After hearing that he felt that something about the whole situation was wrong. His suspicions confirmed themselves even further after Kaneko joined them during their lessons. She was very far behind, besides the basics of reading and writing she learned almost nothing. The person who taught her all she knew was her older sister, who by Kaneko's description was a very loving and caring person. In contrast, the peerage she belonged to was very cold and distant, if not abusive, including their so-called master from the Nibirius clan. For Harry, it sounded more like the pure-blood devil from the Nibirius clan was using Kuroka for some purpose, and she did her best to shield her younger sister from everything. Probably Kaneko didn't even realize how bad things really were because her sister shielded her. So it was no wonder that in her eyes her loving older sister suddenly went mad with power. Kuroka probably killed the Nibirius devil because Kuroka was no longer enough, and he may have decided to use Kaneko for his vile deeds next. Whatever it was he did to Kuroka, be it sex, torture, or some sick experiments, Harry would have acted similarly and protected his younger sibling no matter what. But why did she leave her little sister behind, asked Harry himself, after coming to the conclusion that something about this whole incident was wrong, maybe she didn't want to raise Kaneko while she was hunted down. She counted on one of the Satans intervening and protecting her. Protecting her from whom? Are there more factions? Realizing that he couldn't find an answer himself by just theorizing, he decided to wait a few days until it was the right time. DXD, 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 DXD. Knock, knock, come in, said the voice from the other side of the door, before Harry opened it and stepped into a big, well-furnished office. Behind a massive wooden desk was a crimson-haired man sitting, currently working on a large pile of documents. This was the office of Sir's ex Lucifer inside the Gremory mansion, since he was also living in his own part of the massive complex with his wife, he of course had also an office where he usually worked from, completing his work as one of the four Satans. Hello, Harry. What brings you here? asked Sir's ex with a smile as he stopped working on the documents. Harry closed the door behind him, and sat down in a comfy chair in front of the desk with a serious look, I came here to learn the truth about Kaneko. What truth are you speaking about Harry? You already learned that her older sister become drunk on her power and killed the master of her peerage, then leaving Kaneko behind, letting her endure the anger of many devils for killing a rare pure-blooded one. Explained Sirzex still with a smile but behind his eyes Harry could see that it was a false one, as he had a serious glint in them. Oh, really? After learning a bit more about Yukai, I couldn't find anything about them getting drunk on their power. Some kind of yukai can go into heat, but that doesn't result in killing anyone. Much rather their master would have lost his innocences. Even a panic reaction if she were in danger, which also happens to humans by the way, wouldn't make a yukai lose control, she would have just become much stronger and her senses would have heightened. But why would Kuroka be in danger from her own peerage and master, questioned Harry innocently as he directly stared into Serzek's eyes. Sometimes you are too smart for your own good. Muttered Serzex, too much knowledge can be a very dangerous thing, Harry. Well since Kaneko is now part of Rhea's peerage, part of the family, shouldn't we be at least somewhat aware of the truth? We are already involved now. Asked Harry still not budging and staring at Serzex. The older man sighed, before replying to the younger boy, that's true. But the others are not mature enough, or have still enough with their own issues to handle, so this should stay between us. Even you still have your issues. Added Serzex. I won't share it with the others until I deem it necessary. Nodded Harry. Anything I tell you now is unofficial information. This is a complicated case with much politics and a lot of cover-up involved. They especially tried to hide it from the four Satans, some. Said Serzex with seriousness no longer wearing a smile, 
Did you know there are currently multiple factions in our devil society? I guessed it. Replied Harry with a nod. Well this isn't really a secret, there are technically three in total, there is the faction which some of the more liberal noble houses like Gremory and Citri are part of, which is called the Four Satan Faction, under the leadership of the current Four Satans. We are holding our power because we have the strongest members like myself in our faction. Next is the Great King Faction, which is involved in this mess, they are a faction of many old noble houses, under the leadership of my ancestor Zekram Bale. They have more conservative and traditional values and are not really happy with the whole reincarnated devil system. They are for example responsible that any reincarnated devils are mainly servants and similar. Their power comes from the sheer economic power of these ancient devil houses, and their strengths aren't too bad, but they have no one on a similar level like myself. The last faction isn't really relevant for this discussion and is a rebel faction currently in hiding. Explained Surzex. I see. That is really a complex political situation. So the main problem comes from Kuroka being a reincarnated devil, asked Harry, as he understood more of the political landscape in the underworld. Yes and no, that is a convenient reason to cover this whole mess up. Even massacre the whole Nakushu clan. What my spies discovered was that Kuroka's master experimented on her in order to create a devil on the level of myself. They developed some kind of senjutsu technique, which allowed her to sacrifice herself to permanently give someone else more power. But she had to do it willingly. She didn't want that so they wanted to try it with her younger sister. And the rest you already know. The exact documentation was already destroyed, so I don't have any proof. Only the words of my spy. Replied Serzex with a deep sigh as he rubbed his head. And there is nothing you could do to help her now, asked Harry as from his understanding Kuroka was completely innocent. Nobody should be forced to sacrifice herself to give someone else more power. She only acted in self-defense. No there is nothing I can do for Kuroka. I already put my foot down by saving little Kaneko when they tried to make an example of her. They tried to silence her that way. Even if she didn't know anything, it wasn't a risk they wanted to take. He replied with a tired voice, the situation in the underworld is completely unstable. There is only peace because the Great King faction is kinda working with Four Satan faction, even if their ideals differ so much. If I push anymore, the overall situation could turn into more turmoil and even result in a war. Having understood how hard of a job Serzex has, Harry could only agree with his assessment. He never experienced war himself, but this situation was indeed better than a war even if it meant the sacrifice of one person now. But still, there had to be something he could do, is there really nothing we can do to help Kuroka? She is Kaneko's sister which makes her basically family. Right now, there is nothing we can do. Or rather I can do. Said Serzex with a glint in his eyes, but in the future, there is something you could do. If you are strong enough, nobody could say anything if you are selfish from time to time. All you have to do is to become strong enough or show enough promise. By then a few years would have passed and most wouldn't care anymore. Strength, it always comes down to strength. Thought Harry with determination, the world can really be unfair sometimes, but if I am strong enough I will be able to protect the people important to me. After having learned the truth behind Kaneko's and Kuroka's circumstances, Harry realized he needed to be stronger. Having people he considered family made him very happy, this was what he wished for all his life. This motivated him to work extra hard, every morning before his lessons he would work on his physical fitness and work hard on his hand-to-hand -hand combat capabilities with a servant of the Gremory family. During his lesson he works hard on learning as much as possible, since they all had teachers focusing on their individual learning speed, there was no need to hold back. Not being held back by general class speed because of other students or being punished for being better than others like with the Desleys, Harry tried to learn as much as possible and reached a far faster than he did in school even when he tried. He always was intelligent, and being able to control his magic from young age proved that, but since becoming a devil he was able to think much clearer. For some reason, even his famous lightning-shaped scar had become less visible. But all his other progress aside, he worked the hardest on his magic. Having learned that he was a wizard by birth, made him focus on magic the hardest. He felt that was what brought him closest to his family. Of course, physical fighters could also be powerful and fast, but by the time they reached him, he already teleported away and shot some destructive spell at them. 
Not that he would forget his physical training, but it wasn't his main focus. After having learned the basics of elemental magic, some basic barrier magic, the standard teleportation, and summoning magic every devil needed to know to reach their contracts, and also learned how to form standard magic circles to enhance his spells, he began to focus on a far more advanced topic, elemental combination spells. Although it was considered an advanced topic of magic, far harder to learn than more powerful variants of single elemental spells, his teacher McGregor Mathers was of the opinion that it was much easier to master, if his head wasn't filled with a lot of magical knowledge already. Learning to combine more powerful elemental spells, isn't hard once a magic user mastered combining the basic ones, since the principles are the same it's just scaled up. But someone who has already learned high class magic or even ultimate class magic will have a hard time to learn combining even the simplest elemental spells, since he is already familiar enough with casting them, that they would have to work against their own instincts, making them relearn every spell they already learned. For them, it was much easier to just learn to combine advanced spells, which is much harder than just scaling up later on. And so Harry worked hard on combining basic elemental spells, a simple water whip spell combined with the beginner lightning spell, shock, creates a simple but effective shock whip. Allowing one to grab onto an enemy and shock them. A beginner wind spell combined with a simple fireball creates a small firestorm comparable to a mid-class spell. All these were the combinations Harry thought of himself. Since his teacher didn't want to limit his creativity, and at the same time had a lot of fun with it. Just when he had a solid grasp of dual elemental spells, and wanted to think of some bigger combinations like triple or even quadruple combined spells the time for his magic lessons ended. Normally he would spend some more time if he were as motivated as right now, but today was full moon, and he had another commitment and couldn't commit more time for practice. Thank you for your time, Mr. Mathers. Thanked Harry his teacher as he packed his stuff and stored it in his sacred gear. You are welcome, Harry. Keep your pace up and you will one day become one of the most powerful magic users of the world. Said McGregor as he smiled proudly at his young student. He always liked to teach and explain things, but it was even more fun to do it for a talented student. And Harry sucked knowledge about magic up. What is a familiar? Asked Kaneko interested. It's an existence that assists devils in many aspects of their lives. It's one of the basic must-haves for a devil. By forming a contract with a familiar, it becomes your unique summonable partner. It can assist you in many aspects. For example, once we start to form contracts, they can help you hand out leaflets with summoning circles on them. Also, they are useful for scouting and stuff like that. But strong ones can even assist in battle. Explained Rias as a red bat appeared on her palm after making a sound, this is my familiar. A bat in the same crimson hair color as Rias, how interesting. Thought Harry as he observed the small hovering bat. This one here is mine. Added Akino as she summoned something that looked like a palm-sized oni. Oh, you already got your familiar Akino, asked Harry as he knew she just joined Rias Peerage a few weeks before him. Yes, I met mine before I became devil. Replied the dark-haired girl with a distant look. Since we only limited time, and the teleportation circle is ready. Get in. Said Rias as a magic circle already on the floor began to glow in red, now let's head out and capture your familiars. DXD, 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 DXD. As the red glow of the teleportation magic circle vanished, Harry found himself in an unfamiliar forest. A lot of giant trees were growing in this forest as not much light shines onto the ground. This place was the forest of familiars. Even though it was quite dark, his devil eyes still worked flawlessly. As he spotted Rias in front of him turning around, this forest is filled with many different familiars. Harry and Kaneko will find their familiar here. She explained to the three others who came to this forest for the first time. Once Rias finished speaking, something rustled amongst the crown of the trees as someone dropped in front of them. Surprising us was a middle-aged man wearing rough clothes. My name is Satuji of Madara Town. I'm a devil in training, aiming to become the familiar master. Introduced the weird guy himself. Mr. Satuji I brought the ones I spoke of. Greeted Rias as she introduced us to the so-called familiar master. He, a nerd with glasses, and a cute cat girl. Okay. Leave it to me. I will get you the best familiars like no one ever has, 
boasted the middle-aged dude as Harry stared annoyed at him. Kaneko, Harry. He is an expert in familiars. We will catch familiars in this forest as he guides and advises us. Okay. Yes, we nodded at Rias. So what kind of familiar do you want? Strong one. Fast one. Or one with poison. Not sure, what type do you recommend? Satuji-san smiles at Harry's question and gets out a thing that looks like a catalog. The one he points at is a creature with a great ferocity that is drawn out on the whole page. This is what I would recommend. One of the Dragon Kings. Chaos Karma Dragon, Tiamat. It's a legendary dragon. It's also the only female among the Dragon Kings. Even until now, there hasn't been a devil who has caught her yet. That would be obvious. Since it's said to be as strong as a Mao. Is this dude high, thought Harry with a deadpan expression, eh, I don't think anyone among us is on a level that we could get a Satan level being as our familiar. We will probably die if we try that. But we haven't even tried yet, chirped Rias happily in, maybe we can do it. Are you serious said Harry's face before he turned to the familiar master, I don't think I need a familiar like that. Don't you have something else? Harry asked before he remembered something. Maybe a snake I can talk to them. You can talk to snakes, asked the others as they stared at Harry in wonder. Yes, teacher says it is a bloodline. I often talked with the garden snakes at home when I was working in the garden. They made some nice conversations. Though we are not sure why I have that bloodline since I am unrelated to the wizard family who had that ability. Explained Harry thoughtfully. Ha ha ha. I see. Laughed the aspiring familiar master with jealousy, then how about this one? Hydra. He showed Harry the image of a gigantic serpent with many heads. It looks strong but I don't think it is on our level. But maybe I can talk to it, pondered Harry. This one is amazing. It has one of the deadliest poisons in the world. There are no devils in this world which can endure its poison. On top of that it is immortal. The worst creature in the world which even kills its master. See? Pretty useful right? Yup, we definitely would die if attempted to form a contract with one. Are you sure you don't want to try to get a Hydra Harry? A Hydra is a rare but powerful familiar. My big brother told me there is one deep in this forest, said Rias as she looked deep into the forest with excitement. Nope, I don't have a death wish. The strongest among us is you with a mid-class devil strength. This Hydra sounds absolutely like something an ultimate class has to handle. Let's look for Kaneko's cat familiar for now. Replied Harry as they followed Satuji deeper into the forest to an area where cat familiars usually hung out. Listen up, in this part of the forest different cat familiars are living. Like Neasles, Shadow Cats, Kate Sith, Thundercats, and from time to time even some really rare ones. So search around we should be able to find a good cat familiar here, explained Satuji as he pointed at the clearing around us. While the moon shone through the crowns of the trees, they explored the area until they finally spotted a small white baby cat. Oh, you are really lucky. This is one of the rare types I spoke of. Said Satuji as they carefully got closer to the small white cat hiding in the thicket, this is a moon cat. They are a really fast breed of cat and have a limited control over light, specifically moonlight allowing them to move at a fast speed and even turn invisible by bending the light around them. Unfortunately, their attack capabilities are low, since they are unable to use light offensive. While Satuji explained the small cat's capabilities, the white animal spotted Kaneko and tilted its head before it jumped into her arms with a happy cry. As the white-haired cat girl caught it, she began to pet the small cat who was now comfortably resting in her hands. It took instantly a liking to you. Said Harry with a warm smile, as he watched Kaneko playing with the young white cat. Instead of her usually expressionless face she now had a smile on her face. This is an awesome match. There should be no problem with it becoming your familiar. Added Satuji from behind them. HNN. Nodded Kaneko as she decided to turn the cat into her familiar. In the name of Kaneko Tuju, I order you. You shall become my familiar and respond to my contract. We returned to the entrance of the forest. Kaneko opened a green magic circle in front of us. The white moon cat is located in the middle of the magic circle, 
and the contract ceremony between Kankyo and the familiar she named Shiro is about to take place. Since Kaneko still didn't learn much about magic, Harry was assisting her with the magic circle. He was already the best magic user in their peerage. Although Rias and Akino had their own fields of magic they excelled in, Harry already surpassed them in a general understanding of magic. It seems the ceremony is progressing really well since Shiro didn't resist at all and even aided them. As the magic circle starts to gradually lose its light. Because the contract has finished, the small cat jumped into Kaneko's arms and begins to lick her face. While Harry was happy that the ceremony was a success since it was the first time he performed one. You have a really good affinity for cat familiars, young lady. Moon cats are usually very hard to form contracts with and use their innate abilities to hide from devils. Said Satuji as he saw that the contract was a success. Shiro is obviously a very smart cat. And knows who would make a good partner, said Kaneko with conviction as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. Well, now it's time to get you a familiar nerd. Decided Satuji as he looked at Harry. The boy once again was getting pissed off by the rude middle-aged dude, but held himself back as he still needed his help, please lead me to an area where a lot of snake types live. Decided Harry since being able to talk with one familiar directly seemed to be a smart choice. They headed even deeper into the forest than for the cat familiars, even past a lake and headed for the other side. As they followed the familiar master, they heard loud roars from the direction they were heading to. It's best if we wait for a while. Decided Satuji a bit nervous as he looked in that direction, it seems like one of the larger familiars picked a fight with the Dragon King Tiamat. I didn't actually think she would be inside the forest today. He muttered. Feeling a powerful and deadly pressure from there, all of them agreed to keep their distance for a while. The fight deeper inside was going on for a while before they heard a loud shriek as if something was in pain before everything calmed down. It seems the fight ended. Said Harry as they could no longer hear anything going on, and the pressure also vanished. Yes, it should be safe now. But we should hurry, the faster we find your familiar the better since this is one of the more dangerous parts of the familiar forest. Agreed Satuji as he lead them further on. They arrived in a marsh-like area, which was much wetter and filled with more exotic plants. This is the part of the forest that snakes usually enjoy the most. Here live many different types of snakes from small ones like magical cobras, to unique ones like runespores or even big ones like gigantic serpents. Look around and see what you can find. The others waited as Harry explored the area, he took longer than Kaneko in finding a familiar. Not because he didn't spot it any, but because none of them felt right for him. Although he had enjoyable talks with many of them, although they were aggressive in the beginning, the moment they found out he was a speaker, apparently this was the name snakes gave people who could talk to them, they stopped trying to attack him and even were eager to become his familiar. But his instincts told him to keep looking. And one thing Harry learned was to trust his instinct. As he searched further and further he heard a young voice, Mom, in the language of snakes. He spotted a tiny snake with beautiful shiny black scales which currently was sad. In front of it was the carcass of a much bigger snake, with tiny bite marks. Although it's so small, it seems to be very deadly. I need to be careful. Thought Harry as he watched the scene. Hello young one, what happened to you? Why are you sad, greeted Harry the small snake as he carefully got closer. You are a speaker. Mom told me about why, Mom, said the snake before it began to cry again. What happened to your mother? asked Harry again as saw the sadness in the small snake's eyes. The stupid big blue lizard killed her. Because she didn't want to give her more of her territory. Explained the small black serpent with a downcast head. This must have been the big fight we heard a while ago. Realized Harry, remembering the loud roar, this small snake must be from a very strong race. Its mother could fight a dragon king for a while. I am sorry to hear that. Do you have anywhere to go? asked Harry. No, our home got destroyed. My mom told me to keep my distance until the fight is over but she didn't survive. So I don't know what I should do now. Dot. How about you come with me? I am currently searching for a familiar. I even have a place where you can live in and have as much space as you want. Dot offered Harry still a bit careful about the small snake, since he wasn't sure whether he would survive a bite. That sounds fine. 
Mom always told me to ignore and scare away the normal people and bats, but someone who speaks the noble tongue is a good ally. I would like to become your familiar that replied the young snake. Okay then let's form a contract. I am Harry. Do you have a name? asked Harry with a smile. No, I am still very young. Mom didn't name me yet. You can choose one for me, replied the small snake. You have such beautiful shiny black scales. How about I call you Noir like night, offered Harry after thinking for a moment. Hmm, Noir. Yes, that sounds good. Section 2. After Harry formed a contract with the small snake he returned to the others after telling it not to attack anyone. I got my familiar this is Noir. Although I am not sure what kind of species it is from. Greeted Harry as he explained what he learned about Noir. It's beautiful. Such shiny scales. Odd Rias as she watched the small serpent coiling around Harry's hand. Hmm, I never saw any species like this. Based on what you described its mother should be either a hydra but they are not black, or a basilisk there are very few of them, and even fewer have black scales, but this one is missing their yellow eyes. Or a lunga half serpent, half dragon, but there aren't any in the forest. I can't think of anything else snake-like that could fight a dragon king for a while. Explained Satuji thoughtfully. Well, it doesn't matter. We will learn more in the future once more has grown. Decided Rias as she realized they wouldn't come further, let's get home. Once they arrived at home, Harry bought Moir into his the universe of his sacred gear. Once he confirmed that he could summon him anytime, since Innovate Clear was directly connected to himself, he began to prepare a home for Noir. For now, the little snake was still living around his garden and he fed him with meat from the outside world, while it would also eat some grown crops from the garden. This whole operation would take a few days, first, he changed the composition of the infinite space into oceans, they were not really oceans or a part of what he could control. He could travel around the infinite space and change how it looks, but it was more an illusion of how it looked, a filler that only gave the feeling something was there. Only around the areas he actually created something the things were real. The things he actually could control were the things he already created, or brought into the sacred gear, which for now consist of a big garden of different crops, a flower field, a small forest in its beginning stages which he planted, a small hut with gardening tools and furniture. All of that he placed on one island, this would be from now on his garden island to grow some plants, in the future he was planning to grow even magical and other useful herbs there. For now, he was using it to raise the amount of energy in his personal space of his sacred gear, and with it his demonic power. One of the new things he learned was that the energy that goes into his demonic power reserves wasn't anything he created or brought in, but the life force each plant was giving off into the environment. So if he were to exhaust himself, his things wouldn't disappear suddenly. Next, he created another island, which would become Noir's new living area. This whole process took a few weeks, even with being on the brink of reaching the reserves of a mid-class devil he couldn't create that much yet. Although he was able to create the island in one day since creating some earth wasn't that hard. The composition of other things was more complex since he also created a swamp area, some cliffs, and even a nice beach with white sand. He took this opportunity to conduct another experiment, after seeding the whole area with different kinds of grass seeds from outside Harry tried to accelerate their growth. Which turned out to be a successful experiment. Growing the plants faster was less energy consuming than creating completely new ones, he even could bring the grass to the outside world, since they weren't created with his sacred gear. Unfortunately, he didn't have the energy to change the properties of the grass yet. This was almost as energy intensive as creating an animal like a cat. Once he confirmed that he was able to grow his plants, he requested a myriad of different plants from the servants in the Gremory Mansion, some for swamp areas, like fungi, then some that he would plant around his beach, and even in the ocean, like some algae. Then a few trees, bushes, and similar for a nice forest. Harry put every part of his free time into creating a nice biotope for Noir, consisting of a swamp area, a forest, a grass plain, some caves, a pond, and even a beach. In the end, he even ordered mice, rats, squirrels, and other small animals to be put onto the island. He also put fish into the pond. To prevent Noir from being lonely he also added some non-magical snakes to the island from the outside, you are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. So what do you think, asked Harry the small black snake as he showed him, his new home. It's amazing. 
There is everything I could want. Gushed the small reptile as it was satisfied with its new home. I'm glad. I tried to create a balanced ecosystem with you being at the top of the food chain that he explained as he put much thought into the island, he wanted his familiar to be able to grow as strong as possible. I don't know how big you can become, but once you outgrow this place we will change it up and expand it. Thank you, Harry. You are the best, thanked the small snake him before he left this place and teleported to the outside world. After leaving his sacred gear, he headed for the training area as he had scheduled a meeting with his teacher today. Once he entered the large training room they always used for magic practice, he instantly spotted his teacher who already was waiting for him. Hello, Mr. Mathers the first hope you didn't have to wait, greeted Harry as he hurried to the older magician. No need to worry Harry. You are on time. I was just curious about what you discovered that you wanted to show me. Replied McGregor Mathers with a curious smile, you sounded very excited over the phone. Well, I figured something amazing out. Look. Harry positioned himself in front of one of the targets, as he stretched his hand out aiming with his palm, as a green magic circle appeared in front of him. Poison bullet, he chanted as a sickly green projectile shot from the magic circle impacting the target, as it began to melt and dark mist rose from it. Interesting, you were able to create a spell by yourself for an advanced element like poison, even though I didn't teach you anything about elements beyond the basic fire, water, wind, earth, and lightning yet. And still, you were able to learn an advanced element like poison. Analyzed Mathers fascinating as he observed the effect of the poison spell. And it's quite strong for such a beginner level spell, the poison is deadly for anyone below high class level without a technique that helps with resistance from these kinds of attacks. Hee <laughs> hee, you are wrong Mr. Mathers. I didn't learn any advanced or sub-elements yet. Declared Harry proudly, I am channeling the poison energy from my familiar, the other snakes and poisonous plants inside the universe of my sacred gear, explained Harry with a happy expression. After all, he was now experimenting for a while trying to use his sacred gear in combat, besides pulling someone inside of it and fighting them there. Although he was basically a god in there, it still relayed a lot about his own strength to control anything inside, right now there isn't much difference between fighting outside and inside. It is even harder to get an opponent inside of that sacred gear, anyone with enough experience or careful enough could dodge any attempt. Although it is a sacred gear similar to Dimension Lost, he only was able to pull people inside with Innovate clear from a close combat range as he had to actually pull people if they weren't willing. While Dimension Lost could create dimensions from a distance with its flexible controllable fog. That was a major difference between these two so similar sacred gears, for. Now that he actually figured a way out to channel the energies and things inside his sacred gear into his own spells, gave him a ton of other ways to use his sacred gears. That's quite impressive. I never heard any other user of this sacred gear do something similar. Alas, we don't know much about any of them. At least I never heard anything about a caster type, who possessed Innovate Clear. Most people I heard of were close combat fighters, and used their universe to their advantage after pulling their opponents inside. Analyze the old wizard, are you only able to channel energies from things you can also pull out again? No, look. Said Harry as he cast the spell again, and this time just a stinky green blob flew out hitting the target and sliding down as the poison released a slight mist, this time I channeled the poison from some daffodils I copied for practice inside my sacred gear. And I was still able to channel it. Although I can't use anything major yet. I believe this ability can become very powerful in the future. Especially once I can create more powerful things or even on a conceptual level. Replied Harry excitedly. Yes, that's quite true. I wonder if your spells become stronger if you learn an actual spell of the poison element and channel your poison energy from your sacred gear into it. Since you mastered combining low-class elemental spells for the basic elements, this should be our next lesson. I will teach you how to cast poison elemental spells. Remember I only learned mid-class level spells for this element myself, since they were never my type. Neither do I know of any devils of do use poison spells. Even amongst human magicians, there are few since other elements are more destructive and effective. Explained his teacher after thinking for a moment, so if you want to go further in the future, you will have to study the poison element yourself. Almost one year after being reborn as a devil, Harry finally reached the demonic power level of a mid-class devil. His improvement speed is really fast for a child reincarnated as a devil. 
Children usually developed slower than adult or teenage reincarnated devils since their body was still in development, but learning to control their demonic power was much easier since they were naturally growing with it. Although he was now a mid-class devil in strength and ability, he didn't qualify for a promotion exam yet, since he didn't have any military accomplishments, neither participated in raiding games or finished contracts yet. Although he will start with some simple contracts soon to get some practice in. Reaching that level of demonic power reserves unlocked new possibilities for his sacred gear, he finally was able to perform terraforming on a larger scale, creating whole islands in one go. In the end, he was able to create a whole planet round the size of Earth's moon in a few days. This planet flew in a large infinite dark and empty space, being lighted by artificial lights emulating sunlight for now. The planet was mostly water on its surface carrying multiple islands, including his garden, and Noir's home island. There were also multiple empty islands that Harry created in his free time, so he had some ready if he ever needed a new one. He also created some plants to populate them, no longer getting plants from the outside, since the amount he needed to do something effective was tremendous at this point. Plants created by him also raise the overall energy level of the universe as they spread naturally, it just costs him an initial investment, that he was already able to pay with peak low-class reserves if he did it gradually. Interestingly the leap from low-class to mid-class changed his demonic power in quality. He had no real way to quantify it. But after entering the realm of a mid-class devil energy-wise, he could do around 10 times more than a day before, when he still was a peak low-class. But the most important change is, that he finally was able to create small animals. Tora the ginger cat he created which was living on his garden islands, was a small miracle. Since it didn't seem to be only a matter of quantity in demonic power but also quality. Well at least it got a bit of workout now, and didn't need to rely on food from Harry anymore, since he created as a first test mice for Tora to hunt. They weren't just simple mice, Harry created them with specific behavior patterns useful for him. First, they wouldn't feed on his crops, only wild plants outside of his fields. Next, he ordered them to taunt Tora once they reached a certain age. And lastly only to breed until they reached a certain population, so they wouldn't overcrowd his island. And the mice followed the behavior from now on instinctively. This level of control over lifeforms that he created gave him many possibilities to create completely unique ecosystems and made him realize where the name, sacred gear that lets one impersonate God, came from. He also tested to change already existing animals afterward but was unable to do so. Not because it was impossible, he just didn't have enough energy yet. He also felt that it was possible to change the things he brought in from the outside, but it felt, even more, energy intensive. Even changing a simple stone from the outside world felt expensive, and he didn't mean changing its form or look. No, he tried to change its properties so that it would explode if it impacted something. He could change the shape of the stone and bring it outside, it would be really overpowered if he could modify anything with special properties and bring it out. But unfortunately, he couldn't try it yet. But even with these small things he could accelerate his development again, for example, he created small worms that would feed on any weeds and pests he brought with the seeds from the outside, and turn them into a powerful fertilizer accelerating the growth of his plants. Yes, he could grow them by using his authority as the god of this small universe, but he wouldn't gain anything since he didn't get any new energy from the forcefully grown plants, since it was used in the process. So he spread the worms on every island. Allowing them to tilt and fertilize any piece of ground on this small planet. He also created some squirrels and small apes, that are designed to assist him in taking care of his garden, they water plants, harvest ripe crops, replant them, and expand the garden with more. As payment, they are allowed to use a part of their harvest as food. Unfortunately simple animals like that are his current limit, he didn't have enough power or understanding to create more useful animals for combat. Although he wished to create some small animals with elemental powers, so he could channel them into his spells. But he simply didn't understand enough to create them, and the amount of energy to substitute this understanding was massive. But how does a magical or supernatural animal use the elements? He had no idea. A squirrel harvests nuts from nature, and an ape has hands similar to a human, giving them such behavior wasn't that hard. The same for the worms, they increased the nutrients in the ground naturally, and also improved the drainage, he just improved these natural features a bit and added a new behavior in their eating habits. Lord Gremory also decided he wouldn't allow the servants to capture anything powerful like that for him, 
since it would be a good adventure for Harry to do it himself and gain some real-life experience once he was a bit older. Instead, he told the boy to study more and expand the arsenal he had available, so his gains would be bigger later on point one day after one of his solo lessons, Harry was on the way back to his room when he saw Rias coming from her parents' private area of the mansion. Her crimson hair waved behind her as she walked with a downcast look in the direction of her own room. She was deep in her thoughts and had a sad look in her eyes, as she didn't even register that Harry was there. Hey, Rias. What going on? asked Harry softly, as the girl was close to him. Oh, Harry I didn't see you there. What are you doing here? she replied a bit startled as she didn't spot the boy there. She quickly put a small smile on her face, trying to act as she usually did. Well, this is my room. Said Harry dryly as he pointed at the wooden door he was standing in front of. He knew that something was wrong with her, during this last year he got quite close with the other members of the peerage. At least close enough to know if something bothers them. Although there was a bit of distance with Aquino, they still got on petty well, it was as if something was holding her back, he developed a relationship with Kaneko and Rhea similar to siblings. If something was wrong he wanted to help her, I can see something is bothering you. Please let me help you. Don't hide your problems, aren't we a peerage? Shouldn't we trust each other? For a moment the beautiful crimson-haired girl stared at him before tears began to appear in the corners of her eyes. Harry quickly pulled her into a hug before opening his door and guiding her inside, although he had still trouble with physical contact with most people, this wasn't the case with Rias, Shu, everything will be fine. No, it won't. My parents just told me that there is an arranged marriage contract for me. She cried into his shoulder as they sat down on a sofa in his room, and I will have to handle it myself. A marriage contract? Harry knew that it wasn't unusual amongst noble devil houses to form marriage contracts, he didn't know that House Gremory would also do it, with their different views from other devil houses, is it a political thing? Could it be they have no choice? Do you know your fiancé? Maybe it isn't that bad. He could be a nice guy, tried Harry to calm the girl down. It's Riser Phoenix. The third son of the Phoenix house. Cried Rias as she hugged him even harder. Oh. He muttered as he had heard of Riser Phoenix learning about devil society was part of his political lessons, also learning about different rumors. He had to visit some of the different cities regularly to learn about the different ongoings in the society. Riser Phoenix was a notorious womanizer and his peerage was a harem that already was half full, instead of quality pieces he collects a large number of beautiful girls. This wouldn't be so special amongst devils if he didn't start so young. He is already 18 years old, 8 years older than Rias, and these kinds of rumors started when he was 1-0. Oh. Apparently, he was also very arrogant and speaks of himself in the third person like royalty. Pretty much like one of these asshole young masters, from one of the novels he read on the devil net in his free time. Besides his family status, not a good match for the heiress of the Gremory house. Why would Lord and Lady Gremory choose such a person for Rias? No, wait. Rias did you say they said you will have to handle it yourself? Yes, they told me the contract is set already for a few years. I will have to handle the details myself. According to the current conditions, I have time until I finish university in the human world. She said downcast. It's a test. Realized Harry. What? What do you mean? she asked confused. Your parents are testing you, they want to prepare you for your future position as clan head. Explained Harry, seeing through the ploy, realizing that if Rias isn't even able to handle a contract with a third son, she wouldn't be a good fit for such a position, do you have a copy of the contract? No, I was too distracted, to ask for one. She muttered a bit embarrassed. Then get one. It turned out, Harry's analysis was true. Rias had no problem getting a copy of the contract from her father, he had it already ready and was just waiting for her to ask for it. Once she returned with it, Harry carefully studied it. Rias watched him anxiously as he read through the contract, hmm, I see. He muttered concentrated. This was pretty much a standard marriage contract, overall straightforward. House Phoenix has paid a pretty decent dowry since it was Riser who was marrying above his standing. Marrying the future head of any noble family as a third son is a pretty decent deal for any house. There were multiple profitable business deals agreed upon this contract, that would even remain if it was breached. 
since this contract was only formed as a sign of their agreement to binding the houses even closer together and could be substituted. The interesting part and for Harry confirming this was a test for Rius, was that the date for the marriage was based on a concession clause from House Phoenix. They allowed Rius to finish university in the human world, which isn't the standard for devil society. Some marriages were consummated at 16, most at 18. The tricky part here was that House Phoenix could change that part if they had a legitimate reason to. Like Rias or her peerage insulting or harming them in public. This was pretty much a trap for her if she acted bratty towards them because she didn't read that they could change the date. Most importantly there was also a way to break it, any changes to the contract or annulment had to be agreed upon by both involved parties. In this case not their houses but Rias and Riser themselves, even their house heads can't change the contract anymore. Any conflicts will be decided through a rating game. Okay, I have bad news and good ones. Said Harry after finishing reading all the details of the contracts. The bad first please. Requested Rias, as she nervously watched the raven-haired boy. You will have to act nice to Riser in public. Explained Harry seriously as this was very important. What? I will have to act like a good bride for him. Doing what he wants, she cried out in despair. No, nothing like that. He can't force you to do anything. At least until the marriage, then you have to try your best to get a child with him to continue the bloodline. After that, you even can live away from him. But we don't want to get it that far. Said Harry explaining in more detail, you need to be polite to him and House Phoenix, no humiliating him in public, no insults and stuff like that. You still can tell him politely that you don't want to marry him, that's even required if we want to break the contract. But if you or the others act in any way harmful towards House Phoenix they can cut the marriage date short. And force you to already marry at 18. Oh. Muttered Rias as she realized how she would have harmed herself if she acted as she planned to in the future, thank you, Harry, if it weren't for you I would have acted like a fool. I am a failure as heiress and king. She said with a small voice. Don't say anything like that. You are doing good in this test. Encouraged Harry her. But if it weren't for you. I wouldn't even have realized they were testing me and fail utterly. Replied Rias with tears in her eyes. Wrong. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses, nobody is perfect. And that's what a peerage is for. We balance each other out. Me figuring this ploy out, is part of our combined strength. This small speech brought a smile and a blush to Rhea's beautiful face as she watched the boy, who just encouraged her. Thank you, Harry. You are right. How do we break this contract? Well isn't that clear? We have to get stronger and beat Riser and his peerage in a raiding game before the marriage. Answered Harry with a wolfish grin. On July 31, 2000, Harry entered the usual dinner room inside the Gremory mansion, as the others were already there waiting for him at the prepared breakfast table. The moment he passed through the door and got spotted by the other members of the peerage, they rushed to him. Good morning, Harry. Happy birthday, greeted Rias him energetically. NN, happy birthday. Added Kaneko as she hugged the boy. From me also a happy birthday, Harry. Wish to Kino him, with a smile. Thank you, everyone. Let's have some breakfast. Today's gonna be busy. Thanked Harry them with a warm feeling inside him. This year was no surprise party planned for him since he would already expected it. But still a regular one. Sona, Tsubaki, and two new members of her peerage whom she met through family connections, accompanied by Sona's older sister Sarah Fall will come later for a small party. There will also be Rhea's parents, Serzex, his bishop and Harry A.S. magic teacher McGregor Mathers will also be there. Grafia won't be there since she is highly pregnant and soon due, Rhea's can't wait to meet her nephew. Harry couldn't wait for his party, he enjoyed his first party greatly last year, especially the gifts that let him learn more about his family and parents. Although he also really enjoyed the anime and books he got, they inspired him with his sacred gear and gave him many great ideas. He also hoped that Rias would enjoy the more private setting, her own birthday in April wasn't that great. It was in a public setting with many nobles attending including her fiancé Riser. The pervert first looked at Rias then at Lady Gramary's chest and had instantly a perverted grin on his face. 
He even tried to force Rias to sit with him during the celebration, which led to a small conflict between them. Flashback. Ah, Rias come sit with Riser. So Riser can show the public Riser's fiancé. Said the 18-year-old Riser to the 11-year-old crimson-haired girl as he grabbed her arm and pulled her to him, with a smug grin. Rias was instantly pissed off and was about to punch Riser when Harry who was accompanying her with Aquino stepped in. Kaneko wasn't present since she didn't feel well in the presence of so many people who wanted to execute her. Please, let go of Lady Rias' arm. Said Harry with a cold but polite tone as he grabbed Riser's arm stopping him from pulling Rias while channeling demonic power into his muscles to strengthen them. Who do you think you're a filthy shrimp? How dare someone lowly as you to interfere in Riser's business, he complained as his hands started to burn. Although he already reached the level of high-class devil his strength wasn't that great yet, since he focused more on pleasure than training. Riser relied mostly on his natural abilities of his phoenix bloodline. Instantly Harry channeled water energy from his sacred gear and combined it with a water spell protecting his hand. Even though he only had regular water in his sacred gear with no special properties, it still raised the strength of his spells a bit, since it wasn't only magically created water. As Riser's quickly created Phoenix Fire did no damage to Harry, the older boy wanted to create a fireball to burn the younger boy, but Harry interrupted him with a cold look, remember your position. Rias has no obligation to follow any of your commands, even after your marriage. You the third son of a Marquis-ranked clan, are manhandling the next head of the Gremory clan a Duke-ranked one, and trying to attack one of their retainers. Having enough common sense and not disregarding his education, Riser realized how bad that situation looked for him, and stopped, Riser won't forget that, commoner. He said before turning around and started walking away. You okay Rias? asked Harry concerned. Yes, thank you, Harry. She replied still upset about what happened. Her mood would only better later, when she got gifts from her peerage after the official party. Especially the gift Harry prepared for her, self-made figures from Dragon Ball that Harry created inside his sacred gears, with raw materials from the outside. Flashback End As Harry was remembering his first meeting with Riser while enjoying his breakfast, he suddenly smelled smoke. He wasn't the only one, the others also stopped their discussion and started looking for the source. As suddenly in a gust of flames a burning bird appeared. It had crimson feathers and a golden tail as long as a peacock's, his claws and beak were also golden. A real phoenix. It landed in front of Harry and held a letter between its beak as the phoenix held it out to him under the gaze of the others in the room Harry took the letter from the phoenix and read the address on the envelope, 1. Mr. H. Potter. Harry's Bedroom. Gremory Mansion. Gremory Territory. Underworld. The envelope was thick and heavy, made of yellowish parchment, and the address was written in emerald green ink. Turning the envelope over, Harry saw a purple wax seal bearing a coat of arms, a lion, an eagle, a badger, and a snake surrounding a large letter H. From whom is it Harry? asked Rias as she eyed the phoenix carefully who was still waiting. I am not sure. But I think it may be from the magic school my parents went to. He said as he carefully inspected the seal. He never learned its name but wasn't at that castle, he saw in the pictures he got last birthday. It looks like it. Said a voice from behind them, Zioticus Gremory was standing in the door entering the room, Happy birthday Harry. He said as he approached the table looking at the phoenix curiously, before observing the letter. I felt something break through the observation barrier around the mansion and came here to investigate. Never thought that the wizards could be so resourceful to even possess a real phoenix. He explained, well we wanted to talk with you about it anyway today Harry. Since they managed to contact you themselves, I suggest you read the letter first before we discuss it further. Harry nodded as he ripped the envelope open and pulled two pieces of paper out of it, the first was a letter. Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Headmaster, Albus Dumbledore, Order of Merlin, First Class, Grand Source, CHF, Warlock, Supreme Mugwump, International Confeed. Of Wizards, 4. Dear Mr. Potter. We are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Please find enclosed a list of all the necessary books and equipment. The term begins on September 1st. We await your owl by no later than July 31st. Yours sincerely. 
Minerva McGonagall. Deputy Headmistress. So the school where my parents met is called Hogwarts. Said Harry after reading the letter and checking the unique list of supplies out. That's right according to our information, it's the best school for wizarding magic in the world. Although the others aren't far behind. But it's the first magic school created by wizard kind. Explained Ziodicus as Harry wondered what he wanted to tell him, we wanted to ask you today if you want to go to Hogwarts or another wizard kind magic school. Me going to Hogwarts? But wouldn't that mean I am away from Rias and the others for the majority of the next seven years? Asked Harry unsure if he should take that offer, on one hand, would love to visit the same school as his parents and even learn about the magic they practiced, on the other hand, he didn't want to stay apart from his new family for so long. Do it Harry we won't run away. And you will see us on holidays. Your devil phone and laptop are working around magic, and have anywhere in the human world connection to the devil net. We can talk anytime. Encouraged Rias him, as she could clearly see his inner conflict. Yes you can visit during winter holidays and Easter holidays during the term, and during summer you are either way required to return. And don't worry about Japanese schools, we will make sure that you have access to any materials you need to self-study and get you all the necessary exams and documents. According to our plan schedule Rias and the others are either way starting middle school when they are one year older than the rest since she needs to finish certain aspects of her education here first. You can join them during their second high school term. Explained Ziodicus as he did take the education of his daughter and her peerage quite seriously. Seeing that Harry still wasn't convinced Rias added, and think about all the different kinds of magic you can learn. Of course, after devils accidentally created wizards and witches, and deemed them a failure thousands of years ago during the Great War, they didn't teach them any magic. Wizards developed all their magic themselves and created quite the unique magic system for themselves. They have different kinds of space and teleportation magic, runes, alchemy, smaller elemental magics, magics that fall in many different categories they call charms, and even black and white magic. We even discovered traces of time manipulation. Added Ziodicus, although wizards aren't as strong as most races in the supernatural world, they could still establish themselves as one of the weaker factions, there is nothing wrong with their spells, they just lack the firepower to make them stronger. Although that's not wholly true. There are signs that some wizards reached the ultimate class level in history, for example, the founders of your school. Hearing about the different kinds of magics, Harry could study there he became immensely tempted. One of the things he loved the most was to learn magic, after being forbidden from thinking anything unusual for so long, he developed a deep love for magic. And the Gremory family was happily supporting him with that behavior. Black and white magic, were rare classes of magic powered respectively by negative or positive emotions, while time manipulation was only really possible with specific sacred gears or rare bloodline powers, won't I fall back in my magic studies with teacher? Not really. McGregor always planned to let you develop your personal style and spells. All powerful magic users do that, at least if they want to reach Satan class strength or higher. And you have all the potential to be one, that's why he from the start taught and encouraged your creativity with magic. He never planned to teach you many specific already completed spells, instead always taught you a lot of theory, some example ones, and let you create your own. So you going doing Hogwarts will be quite beneficial for you since you will be able to learn a lot of new spells and theories that are mostly restricted to wands and be able to recreate them on your own. Anything else you can learn during your summer holidays? Replied Ziodicus, with an encouraging smile, as he could see that Harry was almost there. Okay, I will go to Hogwarts. All of you are really convincing, relented Harry, the letter says I have to send my reply today with an owl. Can you take my reply back? asked Harry the phoenix who was still waiting on the table, hashtag. As the bird nodded, Harry got a piece of paper from inside his sacred gear and wrote down that he would be honored to attend Hogwarts, eh, Lord Gremory do you know where we can get all the things on the shopping list? I recognize most of the ingredients for these potion classes they are easy to get in the underworld, and the clothes are probably manageable if I had the proper designs, but I don't recognize any of the books or where to get a wand. Don't worry about that. I already know where to get them. Just ask them to send you your train ticket. Answered Lord Gremory, as he already learned a lot about how the wizarding world worked from Seraphall. Okay. I will do that. After finishing writing his reply he folded it and put it in an envelope, he handed it over to the phoenix. 
which grabbed it and then disappeared in a gust of flames. So where will we get all the stuff? Are we visiting the human world? Can we go with you? asked Rias with an excited glint in her eyes. Lord Gremory nodded at that, yes all of you can join us. It will be quite a unique view. We will be visiting London. Let's do it on Friday. It shouldn't be too full then. Decided Lord Gremory, for now you have to get ready, after all, we will be having guests in the afternoon. Remembering that it was Harry's birthday today, all of them returned to their breakfast and then got ready for the party later. But none of them could calm their excitement of visiting the human world soon, Harry enjoyed his birthday tremendously, not only were all his friends there, he made new ones too. First, he met Sona's two new peerage members, Momo Hanakai and Rea Kusaka which she met through her Citri family connections. He instantly hit off with the two girls and formed a positive first impression. Another person present during the birthday was Serorg Bale whom he previously met during Rhea's birthday party in April. He is a nice enough guy if he just would stop challenging him for a fight, a real muscle head. Serorg was accompanied by his queen Keisha Abaddon a polite blonde girl, who somehow manages to keep Serorg in control. On Friday after this party, Rhea's whole peerage met up with Lord Gremory, who was already waiting for them, are all of you ready, asked the over a thousand-year-old devil. Yes, how do we get to London? With the devil train, asked Rhea's as she knew that warping between worlds was illegal, only with special permission from one of the four Satans it was allowed. No, your brother allowed us to directly teleport to the hotel in London owned by Gremory Large Enterprise. Replied Ziodicus, from there we will take a car, the driver is already waiting for us. Gremory Large Enterprise is the main business enterprise owned by the Gremory clan, Ziodicus is the current CEO. They own various business ventures in the underworld as well as the human world. In the human world, the Gremory Large Enterprise operates several travel agencies and hotels in various countries including the hotel in Britain they were currently teleporting to. Yeah, that's better for such a short trip to the human world. Agreed the group as they stepped into the red glowing teleportation circle Lord Gremory had created. Once the car arrived on Charing Cross Road, they stepped out of the vehicle, we will call you once we are finished. Please take a break since it could take a few hours told Lord Gremory the driver before closing the door. So is here the place where we can get my school things, asked Harry as he looked around the crowded street. Almost. The entrance is here. Said Lord Gremory as he began to look around, until he spotted an old pub a bit down the road, giving off the feeling of magic, that has to be it. The Leaky Cauldron. Read Aquino out loud as they halted in front of it. All of them could feel the magic, some kind of illusion, but it didn't affect them since they were magical by nature, looks a bit old and run down. Well, it was built in the 1500s. Wizards are a bit backward, possessing magic and a longer lifespan, which made them progress slower in many aspects of culture and technology. You could say magic is a curse and blessing for the wizarding world. Explained Ziodicus as he remembered the investigation report Seraphal sent him, let's head in. The inside it was very dark and shabby. A few old women were sitting in a corner, drinking tiny glasses of sherry. Behind the counter stood an old bartender, who was quite bald and looked like a toothless walnut. They walked directly through the bar, out into a small, walled courtyard, where there was nothing but a trash can and a few weeds. Empty. Said Kaneko who looked confused around, she currently hit her ears and tails with magic so she wouldn't get any unpleasant attention. Not quite, the entrance is behind this wall. Explained Ziodicus as he observed the wall, you just have to touch it with magic in a specific pattern. Wizards usually use their wand since it gives off a tiny bit of magic by default, but we can just coat our fingers in magic and do the same. Watch carefully Harry and remember it since you will come here often. As Lord Gremory touched the wall three times in a specific pattern, a small hole appeared growing wider and wider as it formed into a stone archway, an archway onto a cobbled street that twisted and turned out of sight, this is Diagon Alley, he introduced as he himself also looked curiously at the site. The group quickly stepped into the alley as the archway closed behind them, all of them were looking around interested, one shop close by sold cauldrons in different sizes, there was an apothecary with different ingredients, and so on. Harry wasn't sure whether he should be disappointed or excited, for one the architecture and technology of the wizarding world seemed to be at the level of the Middle Ages, on the other hand, there were many unique magical sites. 
alternative solutions for problems other societies solved with technology. Even the underworld used rather technology for most of the things here, magic was instead more combat-oriented. So what should we get first, he asked as he pulled his shopping list out, in preparation for this visit he exchanged his monthly allowance for British pounds. Not so fast. We need money first. Chuckled Lord Gremory as he saw the eager boy, did you forget already that they use a different currency here? Remembering what he was told about his vault last year, he looked a bit sheepish having forgotten that in his excitement, right, galleons wasn't it? So we need to go to that goblin bank? Oh, goblins. Aren't there different goblin tribes in the underworld, asked Rias interested as she remembered having read of them, they are supposed to be excellent blacksmiths. That's correct. Centuries ago there was a big split between the different goblin factions. Some of them live in the underworld now, under the Glagiolabla's clan. Explained Ziodicus, as the rest of the group remembered Zephyrdor Glagiolabla's from a branch family of that clan that was currently a possible heir. Did that particular branch even reproduce with goblins, thought Harry as he remembered Zephyrdor's unique features, while the current Lord Glagiolabla's looked completely normal. The goblins living in Asia joined the Yukai faction. While the European ones became part of the wizarding world. Continued Lord Gremory as they headed down the street, looking at the many magical sights. Books, flying brooms, different magical artifacts, and more, on their way Kaneko got attracted by an ice cream store called Florian Fortescue's Ice Cream Parlor. Don't worry we will try some later. Said Harry with a smile. And then. Nodded the white-haired girl happily. Soon they arrived at a snow-white multi-storied marble building, which had Gringotts Wizarding Bank written on it. The entrance was guarded by two armored goblins in scarlet and gold, at each side of a massive door. As the group approached the entrance, the goblins tensed as they felt the power of Ziodicus. It was clear that different from wizards, goblins were far more sensitive to supernatural powers they would be wary if someone with ultimate class reserves approached. The average strength of most wizards was mid-class, with a handful of weaker high-class signatures mixed in, children were mostly low-class level in their magical reserves, that's what Harry observed as they walked down the street. So it was no wonder that they were nervous if someone so powerful approached. It's more impressive that they were able to keep so calm, they were excellently trained in discipline. As they passed through the massive door, they were greeted by another silver door, with a warning for thieves written on it. After reading it for a moment they headed on into the bank. They arrived in a big marble hall, filled with wizards waiting in rows for different parts of a long counter. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools behind these long counters, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins in brass scales, and examining precious stones through eyeglasses. Behind them were hundreds of different doors leading to different parts of the bank. Lord Gremory led the confidently to a goblin with a golden nameplate in front of him, which nobody was standing in front of, clearly meant for a different kind of clientele. Feeling the massive power, in front of him the goblin looked up from his work. Most impressively was that the teller didn't flinch like the guards, and just politely greeted them, How can I help you, Lord? Lord Gremory. I have two pieces of business with your bank today, Mr. Gornick, replied Ziodicus equally politely after reading the name from the plate. The goblin clearly had an idea after hearing the name of whom or what he was dealing with, Ah, welcome. What can I help you with, Lord Gremory? First I would like to open a business vault under the Gremory name with your bank and exchange some valuables into local currency. Meanwhile, young Mr. Potter here would like to access his trust vault. Explained Ziodicus, as he was planning to expand the business of the Gremory large enterprise into the wizarding world. Having access to more markets never hurt. Recognizing the name Potter, the goblin searched the group and spotted Harry as he was the only boy amongst them, does Mr. Potter have his key, asked the goblin not shocked that Harry was still alive. The goblins had ways to know whether their clients died and were aware that the boy was still alive. Of course, they never shared that fact with the arrogant wizards. Unfortunately not. I never received it. It must have been amongst the belongings of my parents. Answered Harry. Then we will have to test your identity and create a new key. There will be a small fee of five galleons, transferred from the family vault for that. Nodded the goblin as such cases weren't unusual, be aware that the next time you lose your key it will cost you 100 galleons. Once the car arrived on Charing Cross Road, they stepped out of the vehicle, we will call you once we are finished. 
please take a break since it could take a few hours. Told Lord Gremory the driver before closing the door. So is here the place where we can get my school things, asked Harry as he looked around the crowded street. Almost. The entrance is here. Said Lord Gremory as he began to look around, until he spotted an old pub a bit down the road, giving off the feeling of magic, that has to be it. The Leaky Cauldron. Read Aquino out loud as they halted in front of it. All of them could feel the magic, some kind of illusion, but it didn't affect them since they were magical by nature, looks a bit old and run down. Well, it was built in the 1500s. Wizards are a bit backward, possessing magic and a longer lifespan, which made them progress slower in many aspects of culture and technology. You could say magic is a curse and blessing for the wizarding world. Explained Ziodicus as he remembered the investigation report Seraphal sent him, let's head in. The inside it was very dark and shabby. A few old women were sitting in a corner, drinking tiny glasses of sherry. Behind the counter stood an old bartender, who was quite bald and looked like a toothless walnut. They walked directly through the bar, out into a small, walled courtyard, where there was nothing but a trash can and a few weeds. Empty. Said Kaneko who looked confused around, she currently hit her ears and tails with magic so she wouldn't get any unpleasant attention. Not quite, the entrance is behind this wall. Explained Ziodicus as he observed the wall, you just have to touch it with magic in a specific pattern. Wizards usually use their wand since it gives off a tiny bit of magic by default, but we can just coat our fingers in magic and do the same. Watch carefully Harry and remember it since you will come here often. As Lord Gremory touched the wall three times in a specific pattern, a small hole appeared growing wider and wider as it formed into a stone archway, an archway onto a cobbled street that twisted and turned out of sight, this is Diagon Alley, he introduced as he himself also looked curiously at the sight. The group quickly stepped into the alley as the archway closed behind them, all of them were looking around interested, one shop close by sold cauldrons in different sizes, there was an apothecary with different ingredients, and so on. Harry wasn't sure whether he should be disappointed or excited, for one the architecture and technology of the wizarding world seemed to be at the level of the Middle Ages, on the other hand, there were many unique magical sites. Alternative solutions for problems other societies solved with technology. Even the underworld used rather technology for most of the things here, magic was instead more combat-oriented. So what should we get first, he asked as he pulled his shopping list out, in preparation for this visit he exchanged his monthly allowance for British pounds. Not so fast. We need money first. Chuckled Lord Gremory as he saw the eager boy, did you forget already that they use a different currency here? Remembering what he was told about his vault last year, he looked a bit sheepish having forgotten that in his excitement, right, galleons wasn't it? So we need to go to that goblin bank. Oh, goblins. Aren't there different goblin tribes in the underworld, asked Rias interested as she remembered having read of them, they are supposed to be excellent blacksmiths. That's correct. Centuries ago there was a big split between the different goblin factions. Some of them live in the underworld now, under the Glagiolabla's clan. Explained Ziodicus, as the rest of the group remembered Zephyrdor Glagiolabla's from a branch family of that clan that was currently a possible heir. Did that particular branch even reproduce with goblins, thought Harry as he remembered Zephyrdor's unique features, while the current Lord Glagiolabla's looked completely normal. The goblins living in Asia joined the Yukai faction while the European ones became part of the wizarding world. Continued Lord Gremory as they headed down the street, looking at the many magical sights. Books, flying brooms, different magical artifacts, and more, on their way Kaneko got attracted by an ice cream store called Florian Fortescue's Ice Cream Parlor. Don't worry we will try some later. Said Harry with a smile. And then. Nodded the white-haired girl happily. Soon they arrived at a snow-white multi-storied marble building, which had Gringotts Wizarding Bank written on it. The entrance was guarded by two armored goblins in scarlet and gold, at each side of a massive door. As the group approached the entrance, the goblins tensed as they felt the power of Ziodicus. It was clear that different from wizards, goblins were far more sensitive to supernatural powers they would be wary if someone with ultimate class reserves approached. The average strength of most wizards was mid-class, with a handful of weaker high-class signatures mixed in, children were mostly low-class level in their magical reserves, that's what Harry observed as they walked down the street. 
so it was no wonder that they were nervous if someone so powerful approached. It's more impressive that they were able to keep so calm, they were excellently trained in discipline. As they passed through the massive door, they were greeted by another silver door, with a warning for thieves written on it. After reading it for a moment they headed on into the bank. They arrived in a big marble hall, filled with wizards waiting in rows for different parts of a long counter. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools behind these long counters, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins in brass scales, and examining precious stones through eyeglasses. Behind them were hundreds of different doors leading to different parts of the bank. Lord Gremory led the confidently to a goblin with a golden nameplate in front of him, which nobody was standing in front of, clearly meant for a different kind of clientele. Feeling the massive power, in front of him the goblin looked up from his work. Most impressively was that the teller didn't flinch like the guards, and just politely greeted them, How can I help you, Lord? Lord Gremory. I have two pieces of business with your bank today, Mr. Gornick, replied Ziodicus equally politely after reading the name from the plate. The goblin clearly had an idea after hearing the name of whom or what he was dealing with, Ah, welcome. What can I help you with, Lord Gremory? First I would like to open a business vault under the Gremory name with your bank and exchange some valuables into local currency. Meanwhile, young Mr. Potter here would like to access his trust vault. Explain Ziodicus, as he was planning to expand the business of the Gremory large enterprise into the wizarding world. Having access to more markets never hurt. Recognizing the name Potter, the goblin searched the group and spotted Harry as he was the only boy amongst them, does Mr. Potter have his key, asked the goblin, not shocked that Harry was still alive. The goblins had ways to know whether their clients died and were aware that the boy was still alive. Of course, they never shared that fact with the arrogant wizards. Unfortunately not. I never received it. It must have been amongst the belongings of my parents. Answered Harry. Then we will have to test your identity and create a new key. There will be a small fee of five galleons, transferred from the family vault for that. Nodded the goblin as such cases weren't unusual, be aware that the next time you lose your key it will cost you 100 galleons. The group got split up at this point, Gornick guided Lord Gremory to a private office, while Rias, Aquino, and Kaneko waited in a waiting room. Meanwhile, Harry was guided by another goblin called Griphook to another office where he had to put a drop of his blood into a small bowl, filled with different runic symbols forming a magical circle. Harry did his best to memorize the magic circle so he could study it in the future. After a short moment, the circle began to glow, and a key began to form and absorbed the drop of blood. Yes, this is the key to the Potter Trust Vault, everything seems to be in order, Mr. Potter. Confirmed Grip Hook after the circle stopped its work and the goblin observed the key. Harry could feel the goblin use some kind of spell to inspect the key. Any other key will no longer work. Please keep this one save Mr. Potter. Explained the goblin before guiding the boy further into a stony tunnel with torches on the wall, leading to a rail tracks into the depths. After driving with a small cart through a maze of twisting passages, taking a route impossible to remember. Harry even spotted a dragon at the end of a corridor as they were passing by, if he were just a human he wouldn't be able to have spotted it at such a fast speed. But with his superior devil sight and fast reactions he was able to see it clearly even in the darkness. He was saddened by what he saw, it was a green dragon, chained to a wall, and blind. Harry vowed that he would one day free it, no creature should have to live such a life. Soon after passing an underground lake, they stopped beside a small door in the passage wall and stepped out of the cart. After opening the vault and seeing the hills of golden, silver, and copper coins, he requested some privacy. Harry remembered that Seraphal said, his trust vault would refill every year to up to 2,000 galleons from the main vault. Reasoning that there must be enough money in the main vault, he put all of the coins inside the vault into his sacred gear, which he also uses as his personal inventory. After finishing he closed the vault door and signaled Griphook that they could head back. Once he learned how wizarding currency works, he asked Griphook about statements for the main family vault. Unfortunately a witch or wizard with no wand rights only has access to a trust vault. Even if he is the heir, and or last of his family. Replied the goblin while driving the cart back. How do I get wand rights, asked Harry unfamiliar with the term. Well that's simple you need to get your o.w.ls in the basic wand subjects, data, 
charms, and transfiguration. These are the internationally recognized exams in your fifth year. Explained grip hook before adding, alternative if you manage to get emancipated, you would automatically gain access to your vaults until your OWLS. Although this will be hard to complete before your O.W.Ls with the current ministry if you don't bribe them with a considerable amount of money. After thanking the goblin for the information, and learning a bit of what kind of institution the ministry truly was, they soon arrived back at surface. The others were already waiting for him. After stepping out of the bank Harry asked, what should we get first? How about we split up, I will order your school clothes. I already made sure to take your measurements from Lena, random Gremory made responsible for clothes, Rias, Aquino, and Kaneko, can pick up a telescope, and writing tools for you I already gave them some money, while also doing some shopping. While you get the rest and whatever else you need. We could meet in four hours at the ice cream parlor. Offered Lord Gremory, since he wanted to investigate possible business ventures in Diagon Alley and that wouldn't leave them enough time for much shopping. Sounds good, are you okay with heading off by yourself, Harry, asked Rias, as she much rather wants to explore the different artifacts and the beauty store in Diagon Alley than hang around a bookstore or an apothecary. No problem, since you getting me the other stuff will save me some time. Nodded Harry, since this was optimal as he knew neither of them was interested in studying magic as much as him and would enjoy a casual trip more. Once they split up the first stop Harry took was an apothecary, hello, I need the standard Hogwarts ingredients package, and I would also like some of these. Approached Harry the shop owner after collecting some samples of all ingredients he was unfamiliar with currently on stock. That would be twelve galleons and three sickles, young man. Replied the old owner of the apothecary. After handing the money over Harry had a question, do you also sell seeds for the different plants? Ah, an herbology enthusiast. Unfortunately, I only have preserved ingredients in stock. For seeds and other herbology materials, you should visit four stores down the street. They carry what you are looking for. Replied the old shopkeeper with a smile. Thank you very much, sir. On his way to the herbology shop, he still got a pewter cauldron and the other potion equipment. Inside the herbology store, he got as many different seeds as possible, but also some magical fertilizer, different enchanted tools, pots, and similar recommended equipment to start one's own greenhouse. He almost left 100 galleons in that store but gained a lot of new plants for the universe inside of his sacred gear. He will have to be careful, of what he let his gardening squirrels and monkeys let handle since many of the plants needed special treatment, which were tasks too complex for the minds of these animals. The next stop he decided on, was a second-hand bookstore filled with many different old books. He picked up every book that he sounded interesting, he chose the older version in the hope to gain access to some knowledge that was edited out in newer versions. Next, he stopped at a store called Flourish and Blots, getting the school books for all seven years, as he predicted that he would be reading ahead since he was now accustomed to a much faster learning speed than average children. He also picked here any book that got his interest. But the most shocking thing he discovered was, why is there a whole section with Harry Potter storybooks? They are making money with my name, by writing such ridiculous stories. He complained as he watched the rows of books about him with things that never happened. After paying he left the store a bit disgruntled. At least he now had many books he could look forward to, after all, he almost spends 500 galleons on books. Now the only thing left for him to get was his wand, but on his way, he was distracted by a store called, Elop's Owl Emporium where he spotted the most beautiful owl in the window of the store. A beautiful white snow owl, after hesitating for a moment, he reasoned because his gut was telling him he should get the owl, even though she won't be able to travel from the human world to the underworld, I will still make friends in the human world and probably will have to order things per owl since they have an owl order service. And there won't be any harm, since she can enjoy the vast space of my sacred gear if there is nothing else. Once he bought the beautiful owl he named Hedwig, some equipment, food and snacks, a cage, and everything he needed to take care of her, he continued to the wand store. The shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door read Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382b.c. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. Since he didn't see any other wand stores while shopping, he decided a look inside wouldn't hurt. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. The store was tiny, 
filled with thousands of narrow boxes piled up to the ceiling. The wooden counter of the store was empty, as Harry walked deeper into the empty store. Good afternoon, said a soft voice from behind him as Harry jumped slightly. I didn't sense him. Thought Harry as he whirled around looking at an old man his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Good day, greeted Harry awkwardly after calming down. Ah, Harry Potter. Said the old man as he recognized the boy, I am happy to see that the articles about your untimely passing were exaggerated. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself, buying her first wand. Ten one. And a quarter inches long, swishy, and made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander remembered as he moved closer to Harry, watching him with unblinking silvery eyes, your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany wand. Eleven inches. Pliable. A little more power and is excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favored it, it's the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Strange, wasn't there supposed to be a scar with powerful residual dark magic? Oh there it is, but it's almost vanished. Muttered Mr. Ollivander as he was now very closely staring at Harry's forehead, I am sorry to say that, I sold the wand that did that, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches. You. Powerful wand, very powerful, and in the wrong hands. Well, if I'd known what that wand was going out into the two. World to do. Don't worry about that Mr. Ollivander. You couldn't have known what the wand would have been used for. Said Harry, getting his bearings again. Well, I would like to purchase a wand. How does one choose me? Pretty simple. We try and see. The more wand you try the better a feeling I get for which wand is the right one for you. But I have the feeling you will be a tricky customer. Replied the old man, with a distant look, which one is your wand's arm? I am right-handed if that's what you mean Mr. Ollivander. Answered Harry as he stretched his right arm out. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and round his head. As he measured, he said, every Ollivander wand has a core of a powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heartstrings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands are the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are quite the same. And of course, you will never get such good results with another wizard's wand. And what are the measurements for? Harry asked curious to learn more. Ah, an inquisitive one. Keep that mindset Mr. Potter. I am taking your measurement to determine the best wand length for you, not only the current you but also once you are grown up. With these measurements I can predict how much you will grow, and choose a wand of appropriate length. Explained the old wand maker as he began to walk between the boxes, right then, Mr. Potter. Try this one. Beechwood and dragon heartstring. Nine inches. Nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. The moment Harry grabbed the wand with his right hand, an explosive spark flew out of the tip, hitting a wall and creating a big hole in the back side of the store. Quickly dropping the wand, Harry turned to Mr. Ollivander, was that normal? There is usually a rejection reaction at the first few tries since I have to determine a general direction from which kind of wands I should pick, but such a strong one was a first. Replied the old wand maker absentmindedly watching the big hole revealing his workshop. Oh, I see. Watching the old man putting the wand away, is it because I am a devil? Can I even get a wand? Not that I need one for magic, but I would fit better into Hogwarts. And a foci is useful to have. Don't worry Mr. Potter, there will be a wand for you no matter what. Said the old man holding another wand out, try this one, maple and phoenix feather. Seven inches. Quite whippy. The moment Harry touched the wand a flame shot out putting some of the boxes on fire. After putting out the fire, Mr. Ollivander continued his search for the perfect wand for Harry. Wand for wand, rejected the boy the moment he even touched them, the pile of tried wands became bigger and bigger, but none of them wanted to fit. Tricky customer, eh? And every reaction is so violent. Said Mr. Ollivander who had an excited glint in his eyes, as if he had a lot of fun. Which he had in fact, finding wands for tricky customers, was always such an exciting adventure for the old wand maker, we'll find the perfect match here somewhere, I wonder, now, 
yes, why not, unusual combination, holly and phoenix feather, eleven inches, nice and supple. Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden warmth in his fingers and suddenly the wand itself exploded, splinters flying everywhere through the store. Well, that was a first. Muttered the old man, how curious, this is the first time I watched a rejection so strong that the wand exploded. And especially with that particular wand. Sorry, will I have to buy that wand? Harry said, before asking, what was so special about that one? Don't worry Mr. Potter. You won't have to pay for that one, it's part of the journey. Reassured the old wand maker, I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather, just one other. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, why, its brother gave you that scar. Oh. It seems I and him are fated to be enemies. Realized Harry, if even a wand related to Voldemort would react in such a way. It almost seems that way. Fate is a strange thing. I expected that wand to choose you to be completely honest. It would be a show of your strange relationship. Added Mr. Ollivander as he was deep in his thought, well this is a first. I have no choice. What is a first? Do you have no wand for me? Asked Terry. None of the wands in the store will fit you. I will have for the first time have to craft you a custom one. Said the wand maker with an excited smile, follow me Mr. Potter. They headed to the back of the store into the workshop that was visible through the hole in the wall. Let's first determine a fitting wand core. Said the wand maker as he guided the boy to a big shelf with many different glasses and containers, stretch your hand out and close your eyes. I will place different wand cores in front of you, if you feel something tell me. Harry did as requested and tried to feel as Mr. Ollivander searched through the shelf, placing core for core in front of the boy. After a while, Harry had the strangest of feelings, a deep boundless warmth in front of his hand. This one, it feels really warm and comfy, but so deep and borderless at the same time. It's hard to explain. Interesting. This is a dragon heartstring, left behind by one of my ancestors. We don't know which dragon it belonged to, but it never aged or withered, and for generations no Ollivander ever felt like using it. But now I have the feeling I will create a truly wonderful wand. Explained Mr. Ollivander in excitement, now let's find you a fitting wand wood. They stopped in front of a pile of different wood pieces. These are just samples, I want you to touch them, one by one, and tell me which one feels right. So we can choose a fitting branch for your wand later. After feeling each of the different wood pieces, none of them felt fitting. Even Mr. Ollivander was at a loss for words of what to do. Suddenly Harry had a spark of an idea, Mr. Ollivander what qualities must a branch have to be good enough for a wand? Listening to Mr. Ollivander explaining a good wand branch, understood what he needed. He closed his eyes and focused on the central area of his sacred gear, where the green tree of innovation was standing. He carefully searched all the branches of that tree, until he found one that fit the qualities Mr. Ollivander was speaking of. A long and straight enough branch. Let's hope this works and I can take it out. I really need it. Soon he felt the texture of wood in his hand, as he showed it to Mr. Ollivander, will that one work? The old man carefully inspected the branch, yes, it fits all requirements. I can't identify the wood, but its magical conductivity is really out of this world. And it shares such a deep connection with you. Do you have more branches like that, Mr. Potter? Sorry, I don't it was a once in a lifetime chance. Replied Harry feeling that he couldn't take any more, so is that all you need, Mr. Ollivander? How long will it take to create my wand? Too bad. I am very excited to work on this wand, it may become my best one yet. Answered the old man, it shouldn't take any longer than two hours. I will start immediately how about you return later? Okay, see you later Mr. Ollivander. Replied Harry, he had still a bit of time until he met with the rest. They could pick the wand up afterward since Harry still had over an hour until he needed to meet up with Rias, Aquino, Kaneko, and Lord Gremory, he decided to look around the different stores for interesting things and inspirations. One of the most interesting things he found was a trunk shop. They didn't sell normal trunks, but enchanted ones with many features like anti-theft enchantments, indestructibility, weight manipulation, and similar. 
but the most interesting ones were the ones with extension charms, wizards found their own ways to manipulate space, to such an extent that they were able to create completely portable homes. Space manipulation beyond teleportation was a really rare form of magic like time manipulation, even in the supernatural world. Unfortunately, he found out that this kind of magic was strictly regulated by the Ministry of Magic. Harry had the feeling that the Ministry was hiding all the good stuff. Although it is understandable, to regulate magic that bends the laws of reality, and almost enters the domain of gods. For being not a powerful faction, the wizarding world had some cool stuff. A house trunk is also really expensive and required one to register with the ministry. Although he wished to study such a trunk, it didn't justify borrowing such a large amount of money from Lord Gremory especially since his sacred gear served a similar role and did everything better than a house trunk. So Harry had to be satisfied with the fact that they would be able to learn the lesser version of the charm during his later years in Hogwarts. But who knows, if the ministry was really as incompetent as they sounded, who could stop one from going on a little shopping tour through it, after all, Harry was a devil now how could his pride and greed allow the ministry to keep amazing knowledge from him. For the rest of the time, Harry explored other artifact stores, and even bought some smaller trinkets, until it was time to meet up at the ice cream parlor. When he arrived he already spotted the girls waiting, with large bowls of different ice cream. Harry, there you are. Did you get everything you needed? asked Rias from behind her bowl. Almost, I will have to pick up my wand after we are finished here. It had to be custom made since none of the others would fit. Replied Harry as he sat down at the table winking for a waiter to come over. Is that normal? wondered Rias, as she thought that it may have something to do with him being a devil. Not really, apparently I am the first that ever happened to me. But I am really excited about my new wand. It's made with the heartstring of an unknown dragon, but most importantly the wood Mr. Ollivander will use comes from the tree that was inside my sacred gear. Explained Harry after ordering ice cream for himself, who knows what kind of effect that will have. Well, it's fine as long you have one. Agreed Aquino, after listening to the story. Yes, that's true. We should have enough time to pick it up before we need to return. Nodded Rias, as she had to agree that since he had a wand that it should be all right. And I also got this beautiful girl here. Harry summoned Hedwig from his sacred gear, showing the young Snow White Owl to the girls who instantly began to pet it, Lord Gremory joined the group also soon after, having completed his business. He spent the afternoon purchasing property in Diagon Alley, to start some stores and a hotel there. Good for Harry was that he also enlisted the services of a solicitor in the wizarding world, Lord Gremory agreed to let him also check out the exact circumstances of the Harry Potter story books. Once all of them finished their ice, and Kaneko bought some for home, they headed down the alley back to Ollivander's wand store. Ah, there you are Mr. Potter. Greeted the old wizard from his workshop, is that your guardian? Indeed, I am Lord Gremory. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Ollivander. Replied Sioticus. It's nice to meet you too. It's good to see that young Mr. Potter is in capable hands, after the business with his previous guardians. Smiled Mr. Ollivander before pulling a long box out of his workshop, it's finished, Mr. Potter. And I have to say this is without a doubt the best wand I ever created. It rivals the work of my ancestors who created wands even for the Hogwarts founder. May I? asked Harry as he took the box from the aged wand maker after he nodded and opened it. Inside lay an eleven-inch long wand, it was straight and the wood looked polished black but in the light had a rainbow shimmer. Only while looking at it, it already emanated a warm feeling. The moment Harry held it in his hand, the warmth spread all over his body and a green glow emanated from his chest as the wand disappeared in his palm and a tattoo of a tree appeared. Truly my best work. Muttered Mr. Ollivander as he watched that spectacle, a wand completely bonded to his owner, that it even became another part of him. Can you make it appear again Mr. Potter? I think so. Once he thought about it the wand appeared again in his hand. Magnificent. I will expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. Said the old man excited before adding, but I would try to carry the wand normally around if I were you. Many wizards would be envious of such a wand. There are precedences of how far they would go. Mused Mr. Ollivander with a distant look. I will. Is there something like a holster for wands? asked Harry. 
Yes, of course the wand is 17 galleons and the holster another two making it 19 overall. Answered Mr. Ollivander. After paying for his new wand and testing his new holster, he let the wand vanish and appear in the holster, then in his hand and back in the holster again, before they got ready to leave. And Mr. Potter I would try to keep the fact that you possess a sacred gear a secret. They are very rare amongst wizards, and if I say rare, I mean every few centuries one appears. Very few know of them, and that could earn you that kind of attention that you don't really want. Said the wand maker before Harry and the others exited through the door. You know about sacred gears Mr. Ollivander, wondered Harry curiously. Yes, many members of my family tried to study them. Even I myself wandered the world when I was young to learn more about the mysteries of the world amongst them sacred gear. Have a good day Mr. Potter. Said the wand maker at last. You too Mr. Ollivander. And thank you for everything. As the door closed behind them Rhea said, what a mysterious old man. That's true that man isn't simple. Agreed Lord Gremory, we have everything, let's head back the car is already waiting for us. Meanwhile, Mr. Ollivander finished penning a letter in his workshop and sent it off with an old grey owl, they returned to the underworld in the evening, and Harry couldn't wait to test his new wand out and try some of the wizarding spells from his new books. He knew that underage wizards and witches weren't allowed to use magic outside of school, but he was in the underworld and the ministry had no way to track his magic. Their monitoring magic only worked inside of Britain. He tested some of the simple charms like Lumos, and its counterpart Nox. He had no problem in figuring out how they worked, next, he tried the same spells with magic circles to figure out the difference between using a foci like a wand and using magic without one. What he learned was that he had a much easier time casting a spell with the wand as it required less focus, but the power output was lower since he only could channel a limited amount of demonic power through it. Using a wand would be useful for precise and controlled spell casting, but less effective when he needed to focus on fast destructive power or large scale spells. Another disadvantage was that he could only cast one spell at the same time with a wand, making combination spells impossible. He felt that it should be possible to combine wand casting with magic circle casting, but he didn't manage it yet. So no matter what he won't rely on his wand, he will do his schoolwork with it, but practice every spell without one. Harry felt that this was the best route to take, since he wouldn't limit himself to one specific method that way, and kept himself flexible. Hogwarts Headmaster Office An old man very tall and thin, with silver hair and a beard so long that they could be tucked into his belt was sitting in an office. He had a very long and crooked nose that looked as if it had been broken at least twice and two of the most soul-piercing blue eyes twinkling as he read a letter that he just received from a grey owl. This man was Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore, a man with far too many names and responsibilities. He was currently sitting in a circular room with many windows and many portraits of old headmasters and headmistresses of Hogwarts, on a shelf rested an old worn-off brown hat. On a number of spindly tables were sets of delicate-looking silver instruments and trinkets that whirred and emitted small puffs of smoke, as well as an incredible collection of books on many shelves that were part of Dumbledore's private library. In a corner stood a glowing basin, while in another stood a golden perch, where a familiar phoenix was sitting on. The bird watched the aged wizard as he focused on the letter. He really is alive. Muttered Dumbledore relieved as he set the letter on the table, but how did he survive such a powerful obscurus transformation? His piercing blue eyes took on a distant look, as he remembered the devastation and consequences of one of his greatest mistakes. The moment many of his instruments for monitoring Harry's vital status exploded, he fire traveled with the help of his phoenix to Privet Drive 4. Only to arrive at the ruins of the formerly orderly house. From the Dursleys only remained splatters of blood and organs were distributed in the area. From a contact in the Department of Mysteries, he learned the true status of the boy before his death. And he began to blame himself, he couldn't believe the family could treat someone in such a way. None of his tools could determine the exact status of the boy just whether he was alive. While others monitored whether the wards were under attack. None of them focused on an attack from the inside, since this was never the purpose of that protection formed by purest love. But that damned prophecy, restricting many of his actions, was still active, even if his tools indicated that the boy died there. He wondered many times in the last months if he made a mistake in identifying the subject of the prophecy, but now he knew that Harry was indeed the subject. Taking a deep breath, 
as Fox's loyal phoenix calmed him down with a beautiful song, Where did I go, wrong old friend? What is the power he knows not? The piece of ancient magic Lily created in her last moments broke mostly, but the prophecy is still active. So love wasn't the answer. Muttered the aged wizard as he thought about many possibilities, neither did the wand choose him. Things were so much easier if it weren't for that damned prophecy. The war could have gone so different. He sighed. What should I do now? And who is that Lord Grammary? questioned Dumbledore as he stood up walking to one of his many shelves filled with books, pulling a book bound in dark leather titled Ars Goetia, one of his rarer and more exotic books before pulling the book open focusing on its content. While his thoughts raced through the many different possibilities. The trip to Diagon Alley made one thing clear for Harry Potter, he needed his private space, a place where he could relax, enjoy, and also study magic however he wanted. Hogwarts was a good school for magic, but at the same time had its disadvantages in Harry's eyes. From his new books, he learned quite a bit about his new school, especially Hogwarts, a history was very informative. Shared rooms were troublesome in Harry's eyes since he didn't get along very well with people of the same age class as him, his past experiences clouded his judgment, especially if everyone would keep their distance from him, to not be targeted by Dudley in his small gang's bullying. Rias, Aquino, and Kaneko were different, they had completely different upbringings and views on the world than normal children, similar experiences like him, and they also were his new family. Another concern was their view and black and white magic, especially black magic, they vilified anyone publicly if they studied this kind of magic, because of their limited understanding of negative emotions and their residual effect. They called black magic the dark arts, while not only putting emotion-fueled magic into that classification but many spells that could have a negative outcome or dire consequences if used wrongly. For example, ritual magic was classified as a dark art, just because the whole ritual can blow up, if one step is wrong, instead of making sure that people are properly educated and taken care of, the ministry simply classified all ritual magic as dark arts. But Harry understood that magic was just that magic and a lot was determined by the user. Even simple spells could kill. He especially bought a book on wizarding laws and restrictions just so he could see what kind of magic they had and forbid so he could look for them in the future so he could study them. The rules and laws of the wizarding world wouldn't stop Harry from studying this kind of magic, but he didn't want to wait until he was at home in the underworld. He wanted to be able to practice any kind of magic whenever he wanted. And the trunk shop in Diagon Alley, with its amazing house trunks, made him realize what he was missing in his universe inside of Innovate Clear. Every master of magic needed a tower. Well, he was still far away from master, but he still needed some kind of personal space. Here in the Gremory Mansion, he had his room where he could retire to and have his privacy, that's probably the reason he didn't realize what was missing in his sacred gear. He usually put the stuff he stored in his sacred gear, in his gardening hut where he also stored all his tools, but a place with different rooms for different things sounded amazing. And any time he needed it he could just go there and do his things undisturbed by other students. That's why he invested a large part of August before his first term started, inside of Innovate Clear creating a new island. Inspired by different anime, novels, video games and other fictional works Rias introduced him to, he decided to construct a wizard tower with many future ideas in mind he wanted to put there. For now, he decided to keep it simple, so he could expand it easily in the future. Rooms that he constructed were a living room, a library, a bedroom, a nice kitchen, a magic practice room, a ritual chamber that was currently empty since he had no idea what he would need for one, a potion lab. And a few more empty rooms just in case he ever needed them, and finally some storage rooms where he stored things like the potion ingredients he bought in Diagon Alley. On the island around the tower he created some greenhouses, inside of them he planted the magical plants he purchased at Diagon Alley. He had to care for them himself since he didn't trust his enhanced monkeys and squirrels with that task. Hedwig also had her own place in the tower, her perch without the cage stood next to a flap leading to the outside, which allowed her to come and go as she pleased to explore the outside. Next to her perch was a door to a nice balcony where Harry could also relax. The island also got a nice beach with some sun loungers and other equipment, which he and anyone he brought could use to relax. The island of Noir and his garden island were also close by. This was pretty much the most he could do right now since it was already energy intensive. 
but he had plans to expand and enchant the place further once he was more powerful and knowledgeable to turn it into a proper wizard's lair. It was the 1st of September, 2000, and Harry was already up very early. Today he would leave Gremory Mansion, for his first year in Hogwarts. Yesterday he spent the whole day with Rius and the rest of the peerage since he wouldn't see them for a few months. But they still could talk over the devil phone, he had all his electric devices stored in his personal quarters inside of his new tower. Meanwhile, his things for Hogwarts were neatly packed inside his trunk that he chose to carry normally so he wouldn't look suspicious. The clothes that Lord Gremory picked for him during their shopping trip to Diagon Alley, were all of a high quality, different from the standard set of school robes. He also got three sets of dress robes for Harry, for different social gatherings and added a vast collection of higher quality everyday clothes. Apparently, Harry was not only representing House Potter, already a noble house but also House Gremory who was slowly making itself a name in the wizarding world with new business ventures. It was only appropriate that he looked that part. Do you have everything Harry, asked Graphia, who was back from her pregnancy, she gave birth to a healthy boy, they named Milikas. The whole Gremory family dotted on the small red-haired boy since children are so rare amongst devils. Today Graphia would teleport him to the human world, since the rest of the adults were busy with work, and already said goodbye yesterday. Yes, I have everything. If not it's probably stored in my sacred gear, worst case we can use a summoning circle. Nodded Harry as he turned to the others. Rias, Kaneko, and even Akino had a sad look on their face, that he would be gone for such a long time. In the last year, there wasn't one day where they didn't do something together, so it was self-explanatory that they were sad, hey, don't be sad. We can always talk over the phone. And the time will pass faster than you think. Calmed Harry them as he rubbed the head of the white-haired girl. I will still miss you. Said Rias as she hugged him, while the other two nodded at that. So will I. Replied Harry as he gave each of them a hug and goodbye, take care of each other, and work hard. Don't just play around Rias. Reminded Harry the girl as he had often pulled her to do some extra work since she usually only did what she needed to. After saying his goodbye he stepped into Graphia's teleportation circle and was sent to the new main office of Gremory Large Enterprise in Diagon Alley. Here were all business ventures in the wizarding world managed, one of the employees already waited for the boy and led him to the fireplace that was recently connected to the Flu network. A short explanation later Harry stood in the fireplace, grabbed a handful of Flu powder, and threw it down as he shouted, Platform 9 and 3 quarters. As he vanished in green flames dot on a platform that began to fill up with Hogwarts students and their families, one of the fireplaces located on one side began to glow with green flames, as Harry fell out of the fireplace with his trunk in his hand, ouch, what an annoying way to travel. He muttered as he began to stand up and gather himself again. Looking around he saw a wide train platform, with a few people already there since he was quite early, it wasn't too full yet. On one side was a wrought iron archway, with the words, Platform 9 and 3 quarters where people were arriving from. On the train tracks stood a scarlet steamed train billowing smoke, above it was a sign that the train would depart at 11 o'clock. The platform gave off a distinctive magical feeling that was raising the spirit of the people on it. Harry took his trunk and entered the train, so he could choose his spot freely. The train was one with many compartments, to be not bothered too much Harry picked an empty one at the end of the train. After placing his trunk on the rack above him and summoned Hedwig with her cage, placing her beside his trunk, so people would see he came with an owl, he pulled a book on practical household charms out and made himself comfortable. As he enjoyed the book, the time for the departure of the train was approaching, as the door was opening and a girl his age with bushy brown hair opened the door. Excuse me, is here still free, she asked with a slightly nasal voice, sounding slightly arrogant. Not trying to interpret too much into it Harry replied, of course. Would you like to come in? The girl smiled relieved as she nodded and pulled her trunk inside, after helping her store her trunk on the other rack, Harry introduced himself, I'm Harry Potter, and who may you be? I'm Hermione Granger. Introduced Hermione herself before blinking for a moment, wait are you really? I read that you died. She blurted out before turning red out of embarrassment. Eh, don't worry about it. I expect many people to ask the same question today. And no I survived, I got saved by a foreign lord who took me in. He replied with a shortened summary with a few changed details. Oh, that's good to hear. 
I'm glad that you got a better place to stay. After that both of them fell into awkward silence, as the train started to leave the station and Harry refocused on his book, he was not really the social type. After around an hour Hermione tried to start a conversation, can I ask why you are reading a book about household charms? Because they seem pretty useful, I already read the books for our first year so I thought I should broaden my understanding. And practical simple charms that save time seem to be very useful. Answered Harry as he looked up from his book. Hmm, that's true. But most of the household tasks get taken care of in Hogwarts. And you can't use magic for a few years yourself at home. Pointed Hermione out. Well that's true, but I live outside of Britain now, where their tracking charms don't work. But that's illegal. Hermione was quite shocked by that idea, after reading some books she learned that underage magic was forbidden and stopped trying spells herself out. She read that the trace gets applied at Hogwarts, but didn't want to get in trouble. And now she learned that there was such a workaround. You are right. But the different ministries aren't working together so nobody can prove it if you don't do it obviously. And most children with magical parents do the same since the monitoring charms can't differentiate between who is using the magic. Explained Harry. What? That's so unfair. I am a muggle-born so I can't practice magic at home. She complained. You can do it if you go on holiday, of course in private. If you do it in public, you get in even more trouble than with underage magic at home. Hmm, that is an idea. Thank you I will remember that. But I still think it's unfair. Nodded Hermione before the both of them began to discuss different spells they already tried out at home. While they had an exciting discussion about magic, the train progressed toward Hogwarts. Suddenly there was a knock on the door to their compartment, as two girls were looking inside. One of them had long blonde hair and blue eyes while the other was brown-haired with hazelnut-colored eyes. Excuse me is there still space in this compartment, asked the brown-haired girl, while pulling the blonde with her who eyed them warily. Of course, come in. Nodded Harry with a polite smile. Thank you, I am Tracy Davis and this is my friend Daphne Greengrass. Introduced Tracy the both of them with a bright smile as she sat down beside Harry, and Daphne on the other side with Hermione. Harry instantly recognized the name Greengrass as one of the oldest pure-blood families amongst British nobility. Having been trained in etiquette for a while now, getting literally these lessons beaten inside of his head by Grafia, Harry introduced himself properly, it's a pleasure to meet you, Ms. Davis and Ms. Greengrass, I am Harry Potter. The heir of House Potter. Both girls widened their eyes, they obviously recognized the name, Harry Potter. For the first time, Daphne spoke, thank you, Heir Potter, it's a pleasure to meet you too. I am Daphne Greengrass the heiress of House Greengrass. It's a welcome surprise that the rumors about your death were false. Yes, I was saved and taken in by a foreign lord. And you may call me Harry, Eris Greengrass, and you too Ms. Davies. Okay Harry, you can also call me Daphne. And me Tracy. Chirped the brown-haired girl in. So what chased you out of your original compartment, asked Harry the two newcomers after they finished their introductions. Daphne looked again guarded at him, why do you think we were chased out of our compartment? Well, since the journey is halfway over, and you just joined us now. And I don't believe you spend so long in the corridors, especially since you don't have your baggage with you. Explained Harry his reasoning. Let's just say politics. The company we were expected to be in for a while wasn't very pleasant, and we decided to take a breather until the rest of the journey. Explained Daphne. Good that he thinks that Harry Potter died, or he would be looking for him all over the train. Muttered Tracy. And who may that person be? Why would that person be looking for me? Asked Harry interestingly, this is an opportunity to give him a bit of insight into the politics of the wizarding world and inside of Hogwarts. After sighing Daphne explained, Draco Malfoy, he was planning for years that he would befriend you to raise his status, and bring you to the proper side. The proper side? What's that supposed to mean? Asked Hermione a bit weirded out. Pretty much supporting the purebloods in their view that muggles and muggleborns are below them, and a menace on our society. Destroying our ways and traditions. Summarized Daphne the general idea. What? There is something like that. But most people in Britain are muggles. Said Hermione offended. Ah, I understand where this conflict developed from. 
although the overall view is extreme. Realized Harry after thinking about it for a moment, Hermione, you are already making a mistake. You are working under the conclusion that we are still in Britain. But magical Britain is a completely different country. If we act like we would in Britain and don't consider their traditions, we are trampling over their culture. And this whole view had probably developed into this extreme doctrine as all the racists jumped onto the whole thing. Explained Harry. Oh, I didn't think about that in such a way. You are right, I was assuming I still am in Britain. Replied Hermione before she turned to Daphne and Tracy, I am sorry if I should have done something to offend you. Don't worry about it too much, you did everything okay. As long as you are polite and don't parade around wanting to change anything to how you know it, you are fine with most people. The people who have problems with muggle-borns, won't change their view and trouble you either way. Explained Tracy was familiar with the difference between the muggle and wizarding world as her mother was a muggle. But why was that Malfoy troubling you, asked Harry still wanting to learn more. The Malfoy family is pressing my family for my hand, as they want to get our name and good standing. We even had to vacate the country during the first war with you-know-who because they were his supporters and tried to force us. Now that he is no longer here, they are using financial and political pressure, they are even trying to exploit my sister. Daphne rambled as she explained her problems, now he will always annoy me in Slytherin. I see. That sounds annoying. Nodded Harry before he added, then just don't go to Slytherin. The people going to Slytherin don't really fit into that house either way. Why would anyone who truly represents the Slytherin values like cunningness and deceptiveness, go to Slytherin? Everyone would be on guard of you. It's not Slytherin to be a part of House Slytherin. Explained Harry as he thought for a while about the different houses. The other three occupants looked now shocked at him, it's not really Slytherin to be part of House Slytherin. Muttered Daphne as if Harry had opened her eyes, the steaming Hogwarts Express entered the train station in Hogsmeade, the train slowed right down and finally stopped. You can leave your luggage on the train. They will be transported to the castle. Said Daphne as Harry wanted to pick up his trunk from the rack. All four of them already in their school robes left the compartment. People were pushed out of the train, onto a tiny dark platform. The cold night air made the students shiver, as a lamp appeared above their heads of the students. Furs years. Furs years over here, shouted the biggest man Harry had ever seen, maybe he is part giant or another big race. All first-year students gathered at the big bearded man's side pushing through the crowd of students leaving the station, come on, follow me, any more furs years. Mind your step, now. Furs years follow me. Slipping and stumbling, they followed the big man down what seemed to be a steep, narrow path. Getting their first view of the castle in the beautiful moonlight the first-year students arrived at the edge of a great black lake. Perched atop a high mountain on the other side, its windows sparkling in the starry sky was a vast castle with many turrets and towers. On the shore waited a fleet of little boats as the giant pointed at them, no more and four to a boat. Harry entered with Hermione, Daphne, and Tracy one of the boats. With a shout from the giant, the small fleet took off, moving across the smooth lake towards the castle. With his superior eyesight in the darkness, Harry was awed as he saw a giant squid below the surface of the lake guiding their boats toward the castle. Wow, we are getting pushed by a big squid. Stop joking Harry. How could you see that in the dark? Giggled Hermione. The boats are pushed by the giant squid, wondered Tracy trying to look below the boats. Wait, there is really a dash, questioned Hermione before she got distracted as they entered a dark tunnel at the side of a cliff. The tunnel led right underneath the castle towards a small underground harbor where they climbed out onto the stony ground. After a nervous-looking boy was reunited with his pet toad who traveled with them in the boats, the giant led them up a passageway towards a massive castle door. Where he knocked three times against it before it opened revealing a tall, black-haired witch in emerald green robes with a stern look on her face. The first years, Professor McGonagall, said the big man. Thank you, Hagrid. I will take them from here. So his name is Hagrid. Noted Harry. Professor McGonagall led them through a big entrance hall, as big as the one in Gremory Manor, on the stony walls were torches giving light to the area. They followed her until they arrived at another doorway, hearing hundreds of voices from the other side. Welcome to Hogwarts, greeted Professor McGonagall. The start of term banquet will begin shortly, 
but before you take your seats in the great hall, you will be sorted into your houses. The sorting is a very important ceremony because, while you are here, your house will be something like your family within Hogwarts. You will have classes with the rest of your house, sleep in your house dormitory, and spend free time in your house common room. She explained as the first years focused on her. The four houses are called Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. Each house has its own noble history and each has produced outstanding witches and wizards. While you are at Hogwarts, your triumphs will earn your house points, while any rule-breaking will lose house points. At the end of the year, the house with the most points is awarded the House Cup, a great honor. I hope each of you will be a credit to whichever house becomes yours. What's the point of the cup? It's not like we get anything for it. Thought Harry confused, is it just a system to keep clueless students in line or are they serious? Not like any employer will care if their resume has won the house cup in it. The sorting ceremony will take place in a few minutes in front of the rest of the school. I suggest you all smarten yourselves up as much as you can while you are waiting. Finished the stern professor as she gave all of them a critical look, especially at a red-headed boy with a dirty nose. Harry was completely calm since he kept his clothes and himself in pristine condition, he didn't want to be punished by Grafia his etiquette teacher again if he looked inadequate since she had a really mean streak. So he made it a habit to always look good. I shall return when we are ready for you, said Professor McGonagall. Please wait quietly. She left the chamber entering the great hall, as the first years began chatting amongst themselves, wondering how the sorting would go. Harry watched in wonder as he saw about twenty pearly white and slightly transparent beings flying through the wall across the room. Ghosts. He realized as he identified them, he never saw one before but he learned about them, the imprints of a soul with enough magic or similar power, bound to earth through a lingering regret or strong enough desire. They were gliding through the room as they discussed another ghost named Peeves before they introduced themselves to the first years. Some of them tried to influence the first years to choose their house before Professor McGonagall arrived, sending the ghost into the Great Hall to witness the sorting. Now, form a line, Professor McGonagall told the first years, and follow me. Following the professor in an orderly fashion, the group of first years passed through the massive double door into the Great Hall. It was lit by thousands and thousands of candles that were floating in midair over four long tables, where the rest of the students were sitting, whispering and muttering with each other as they watched the first years following the professor. These tables were laid with glittering golden plates and goblets. At the top of the hall was another long table where the teachers were sitting. The ceiling was a beautiful piece of magic, a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. Hermione whispered, it's bewitched to look like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts, a history, and Harry wondered, how does it work? It would be an impressive view to have at home. Harry had to look down again, focusing on Professor McGonagall as they arrived in front of the teacher's table, where she put down a four-legged stool. On the stool, she placed an old patched and frayed, an extremely dirty hat. He could feel the magic radiating from it, it was old, at least a thousand years old, definitely a magical artifact, is this the artifact they used to sort us? What does it do? As he observed the hat, it suddenly began to twitch and a rip near the brim opened wide like a mouth, and the hat began to sing. A strange but in its own way beautiful song describing its task and the quality of each of the houses, that he already learned from Hogwarts, a history. Didn't they mention the sorting in that book, so it would be a surprise, wondered Harry as the whole hall was applauding, and the hat bowed. Professor McGonagall now stepped forward holding a long roll of parchment. When I call your name, you will put on the hat and sit on the stool to be sorted, she said. Abbott, Hannah. And thus the sorting began, the first girl landed in Hufflepuff, while Harry did his best to memorize each name and face during the sorting. When they discussed the houses they wished to land in, Hermione wished to be in Gryffindor because the headmaster the greatest wizard alive came from there. But Harry pointed out that her personality would probably conflict with the members of their house, since the house of the brave sounded rather loud and hot-headed, this discussion seemed to have an impact on the girl, as it took the hat for a while to sort the bushy-haired girl before finally shouting out, Ravenclaw. The next notable sorting was that of Daphne Greengrass after Hermione, when the hat talked with her, he began to snicker before calling out, Ravenclaw, as the girl proudly walked over to the blue and bronze colored table. While the hall clapped you could see some confusion at the green and silver table of Slytherin. 
One of the people Harry was watching out for, Draco Malfoy sorting was very fast, the platinum blonde boy didn't even make contact with the hat before it already shouted, Slytherin. Student for student was sorted into their respective houses before Professor McGonagall halted for a moment, looking at the old headmaster watching the sorting from behind with his deep blue eyes, as he only nodded, and she continued to read out, Potter, Harry. Instantly silence spread over the hall and Harry stepped forward, and the students began to murmur. Harry Potter. Is it really him? Didn't he die? I can't see a scar his hair are in the way, and similar mutters were heard all over the hall, as he sat down on the stool. The last thing he saw was the eyes all over the hall watching him in suspension. The next second he was looking at the black inside of the hat. Hmm, a devil how fascinating. No, a reincarnated devil, I knew that devils existed but that they can reincarnate wizards is very interesting, said a small voice in his ear. Difficult. Very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Also a strong mind with a powerful thirst for knowledge. There's talent, oh my goodness, yes, and a nice thirst to prove yourself, now that's interesting. But also resourcefulness and cunning in spades, so it's you who I have to thank for, being sorted in Slytherin isn't Slytherin at all. So where shall I put you? Well let's analyze my options, first Hufflepuff hard work and loyalty. Does it fit on me? asked Harry in his mind. Hmm, not really. You have plenty of loyalty to the people important to you. But it's not the kind of loyalty important for a Hufflepuff, and your hard work is towards knowledge and magic. So Hufflepuff is out. What's your opinion Slytherin? Well, as a devil I have a lot of Slytherin traits, but as you already learned from Daphne being in Slytherin isn't Slytherin at all. So it's an option but I would prefer other options. Replied Harry as he thought about it, Gryffindor will probably be similar to Hufflepuff, although I am brave, I am not really the heroic and brash type. I prefer to use my head. I wouldn't really fit into that house. You are probably right, although they would love to have you. Your parents were in that house. Replied the hat. I know but I am neither of my parents, I walk my own path, and they would probably support me wherever I went. Thought Harry after hesitating for a while. Well, then there is one option remaining, like your mother you would fit there also right in with that bright head of yours. Better be, Ravenclaw shouted the hat into the great hall, as everyone was staring with anticipation at the boy and the hat. The Ravenclaw table broke out into loud applause, as Harry stepped down towards their table being welcomed by a lot of students as he sat down beside Hermione and Daphne. Once the ruckus calmed down they continued with the sorting, besides Tracy being sorted into Ravenclaw with a relieved smile, the only other noteworthy sorting was from the red-haired boy Ronald Weasley. The sorting hat and the boy had clearly an animated discussion about something before the boy got sent to Gryffindor with a disgruntled look. While walking down he sent longing glances towards Harry at the Ravenclaw table. Please no. I don't swing that way. Thought Harry as he saw that. As the sorting was finished Professor Dumbledore stood up and welcomed the students to a new year at Hogwarts before he opened the feast with a few mad words. During the feast, the first years got to know each other and the older students also joined them in their conversations. Many had questions about Harry and what had happened to him. So he had to retell his cover version about his death before they discussed other topics like the ghosts of Hogwarts or who was who at the teacher's table. The meal ended and vanished with a wave of Dumbledore's hands as he stood up once again and the hall became silent, ahem, just a few more words now that we are all fed and watered. I have a few start-of-term notices to give you. First years should note that the forest on the grounds is forbidden to all pupils. And a few of our older students would do well to remember that as well. Dumbledore's twinkling eyes flashed in the direction of the two red-headed twins that must be related to Ronald Weasley as they resembled each other. I have also been asked by Mr. Filch, the caretaker, to remind you all that no magic should be used between classes in the corridors. Quidditch trials will be held in the second week of the term. Anyone interested in playing for their house teams should contact Madame Hooch. And finally, I must tell you that this year, the third floor corridor on the right hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a very painful death. Said Dumbledore with a serious twinkle in his eyes. Is he serious thought Harry, why would be something so dangerous in a school for children? A few students laughed at that announcement but not many, most took it seriously. 
And now, before we go to bed, let us sing the school song, cried Dumbledore. Harry noticed that the other teacher's smiles had become rather fixed. Dumbledore gave his wand a little flick as if he was trying to get a fly off the end, and a long golden ribbon flew out of it, which rose high above the tables and twisted itself, snake-like, into words. Everyone picked their favorite tune, said Dumbledore, and off we go. At this moment Harry heard the most chaotic song of his life, everyone was truly singing to their own tune, especially the Weasley twins singing along to a very slow funeral march. Dumbledore conducted their last few lines with his wand and when they had finished, he was one of those who clapped loudest. Ah, music, he said, wiping his eyes. A magic beyond all we do here. And now, bedtime. Off you trot. Being dismissed from the Great Hall the Ravenclaw first years were guided by a female perfect, called Penelope Clearwater to their common room. The entrance to the Ravenclaw common room was located on the fifth floor, on the west side of the castle. They had to climb up a spiral staircase until they arrived at the top where a door without a doorknob or keyhole was waiting for them. A bronze knocker in the shape of an eagle was the only remarkable feature on that door. Different from the other houses our house doesn't use passwords. Explained Penelope as they stopped in front of the door, to gain access to our common room you need to answer an riddle given by this bronze knocker. Ravenclaw values knowledge and wisdom, and that's why she chooses such a system. If you get it wrong you will have to wait until someone else comes and answers the riddle. So who wants to try it? What has an eye, but cannot see, asked the bronze knocker, and the first years began to think. After a few moments, Hermione's eyes lit up as she said, a needle. Correct. Said the knocker as the door flew open revealing the Ravenclaw common room. It was a circular airy room with graceful arched windows that punctuated the walls which were hung with blue and bronze silks and a midnight blue carpet covered in stars, which reflected onto the domed ceiling. Multiple blue tables with chairs, and a divan furnished the room. On one side of the room was a small library with shelves filled with books. Next to a door leading upstairs stood a white marble statue of a woman, that Harry assumed was Rowena Ravenclaw. This is our common room. The door leads to the sleeping area, inside are two staircases the left one is for the boys, and the right one leads to the girls' dormitories, boys can't go up there or the stairs turn into a slope. On the bulletin board beside the library, you will be able to find different announcements. Explained Penelope as she lead the first years into the room, showing them the important details, our library has a nice collection of different books on topics that are related to classes, and other generally interesting topics. On the shelves on the right side you can see numbers, they are indicating for which year's classes the books are. On the other side, you will find other interesting books. It's managed by Professor Flittick who is our head of house. If you have any troubles that a perfect can't solve you can go to him. His office is on the seventh floor. Seeing the library many eyes lit up, on Fridays after dinner we have tutoring sessions for the students from years 1 to 4, some older students who are preparing for their exams are holding them, so they can refresh their knowledge of the old topics and help the younger years out. So if you have open questions or troubles I would join them. Breakfast starts at 7, and goes on until the lessons start at 9. You will receive your schedule there tomorrow from Professor Flittick. If you shouldn't remember the way down, I will be leading a group tomorrow at point seven down. Finished Penelope up before she showed them their respective sleeping rooms and wished them a good night. Harry shared his dorm with three other boys, they were Terry Boot, Anthony Goldstein, and Michael Corner. The room was quite spacey and had four four-posters bed with nice blue and bronze curtains. Their room had a beautiful view of large parts of Hogwarts, they could spot many things from the windows. After introducing each other and talking a bit, they entered their respective beds as all of them were quite exhausted from the long journey and all that excitement. After closing his curtains Harry pulled out his devil phone and made sure that it was working without problems before he sent a short text to Rias. Then he turned also in for the night falling into the world of dreams. There, look. Where? At the Ravenclaw table. The kid with the glasses. Is it really him? Did you see his face? Did you see his scar? No, there is no scar. These were the things Harry heard all morning as he left the common room towards for breakfast, I am really a celebrity. I will have to live with all that attention for now. He sighed internally as he ate his breakfast. What are you sighing for, 
asked Daphne with a smirk as she arrived with Tracy, Hermione, and the other Ravenclaw first-year girls at the table. Just the attention is a bit bothersome. Replied Harry as he drank his orange juice, which he was happy to discover that they had too, since all that pumpkin juice last night was a bit much and monotone. Let's hope it will get over soon. You coming back from the dead was quite the shock for many. Said the Indian-looking girl sitting beside Hermione. Yeah, that's probably right. I am Harry by the way as all of you probably know. And who am I speaking with, he asked introducing himself to the other girls in his year since he didn't have a chance to talk to them yet. Ah, uh, I am Padma Patil. Nice to meet you. I am Lisa Turpin. Introduced the girl next to her after Padma. Followed by an Asian girl, my name is Su Lee. And last but not least, I am Morag McDougal. Where are the other boys? wondered Tracy as they finished with introductions. Wanting to meet them too. They are on the way, it may take them a while. The other boys in his dorm weren't quite the morning people as they had trouble waking up. Harry was different in that regard since once again Graphia made sure at home that neither of them would waste their day by sleeping late. After a while the three other boys arrived at the breakfast table and exchanged introductions with the girls. As they finished with breakfast and chatted with each other learning more about their year mates, Professor Flittick arrived with their timetables. They needed quite a lot of time to find their classrooms and learn that way quite a bit about the castle, especially who they could ask for help like most of the ghosts or the living portraits, and they never should trust Peeves the local poltergeist with any directions, since he would use the opportunity for a prank on them. Mr. Filch for being the caretaker in the castle wasn't a great help either, since he would spend more time suspecting and threatening the students instead of actually helping them out. For being so deathly, it was quite easy to stumble into the corridor while looking for the correct classroom. Good that the door was locked. But besides some monitoring magic, Harry didn't feel any further protection on that door. Even a first year should be able to unlock that door since the appropriate spell could be found in their charms book. His classes meanwhile were quite slow for Harry's tastes, since they are mostly covering the fundamental theory behind magic, and some very simple spells that Harry managed to figure out on his first night after getting his books and wand. But he already expected that classes would be much slower than he was comfortable with. For the first week, he spent a lot of time reading the books in the common room, after he finished his homework. They were quite useful in expanding his knowledge of the things he learned in classes, giving him better fundamental knowledge on wizarding magic. For now, he didn't want to rush too far ahead of the others since he didn't have a complete overview of the planned coursework this year and didn't have all of his classes either since the week wasn't over. Quite a lot of his time, outside of classes and reading was spent exploring the castle, it was quite big. It had a similar size to Gremory Manor, but the most exciting thing was the hidden secrets. There are many hidden passages to discover all over the ancient castle, and Harry had quite a blast finding the many different secret passages. With his sharpened magic senses he had quite the advantage in finding them, but figuring their entrance condition out was quite a hard task. Still, that way he had an easier time than the other first years navigating through the castle. One of the most interesting classes was Transfiguration, the ability to change the shape of the world around him into whatever he wanted. The only piece of magic that Harry knew from the underworld in that class was Transformation Magic, as Professor McGonagall showed her ability to transform into an animal in her first lesson. This form of transformation magic was apparently an advanced form of transfiguration, but far more limited than what Harry knew from the underworld. Even the most basic knowledge in transformation he currently had, fell in the wizarding world into a highly advanced and restricted branch called human transfiguration. Meanwhile, the magic he was completely unfamiliar with, like transfiguring something into something else, was what they started with to his great pleasure. After a quite fascinating theoretical explanation, they started to change a match into a needle. Harry was the only one who succeeded during his first lesson after multiple tries, while only Hermione managed to change the shape slightly. The both of them earned a rare smile from Professor McGonagall, well done Ms. Granger take a point to Ravenclaw. And you Mr. Potter have five for your successful transfiguration, you seem to have inherited your father's talent for transfiguration. She praised the two of them, before she silently muttered, hopefully he didn't inherit his father's talent for pranks, but Harry still hurt her with his sharpened senses. Charms was another enjoyable lesson, especially after he learned that his mother had quite the talent for it, and was one of Professor Flittick's favorite students. His head of house even invited him to visit him for a cup of tea, 
if he wanted to hear some stories about his mother. Apparently, she was doing her charms mastery under him before her death. Meanwhile, defense against the dark arts was a complete joke, not only smelled the classroom unpleasant like garlic. Professor Quirrell their teacher was even scared of his own shadow. With all his stuttering it was impossible to follow anything in his lessons, and Harry quite early had to accept that these lessons would be a waste of time. So he used the time to discreetly do some of his homework. Although he felt that something about the professor with the turban felt wrong, he had a bit of darkness around him. But his least favorite lesson from now on came on Friday, and it wasn't because of the topic itself, Potion was quite the fascinating branch of magic, a sub-branch of alchemy brought to such height that wizards managed to bottle up many powerful effects. They even worked on devils, something that gave Lord Gremory quite a pleasant surprise when he purchased some samples at Diagon Alley, although weaker. But this could be solved with adjusted recipes, opening up a new branch of business for House Gremory in the underworld. No for some reason his professor was targeting him, even though he never met the man before or even spoken to him. Although he heard rumors that Professor Snape was favoring his own house Slytherin strongly, this shouldn't be a problem since Ravenclaw had their potion lessons with Hufflepuff. But from the start when the dark-clothed professor took roll call, he began to target Harry. Ah, uh, yes, he said softly, Harry Potter. Our new, celebrity. Professor Snape had black greasy hair and black eyes. His eyes were dark, cold, and empty, and made you think of dark tunnels, as he began his lesson. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion making, he began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but they caught every word, like Professor McGonagall, Snape had the gift of keeping a class silent without effort. As there is little foolish wand waving here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind, and snaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame, brew glory, even stop or death, if you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as I usually have to teach. The whole class was silent in awe, all of this still sounded amazing in Harry's ears until his big disappointment began, Potter, said Snape suddenly. What would I get if I? Added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood, would create the draft of living death a powerful sleep potion. Replied Harry remembering the information from one of the many potions books he skimmed through, but according to his memory, this wasn't in his first year potion book. Points from Ravenclaw for studying far ahead in such a dangerous art. Said Snape without even thinking, your celebrity status must have gone to your head. Trying to be special Potter. Sneered Snape. What, muttered Harry clearly baffled at how this unknown teacher was treating him, if it were another student, they would fast lose interest in the art. But Harry was determined to learn as much magic as possible, especially such a useful sounding topic like potions. After questioning a few more students, especially the Hufflepuff S that looked unknowing, the professor continued with his lesson revealing a potion recipe on the blackboard. A simple potion to cure boils, a potion that wasn't very hard to make, and Harry felt he did a pretty good job. But it became very fast clear, that Professor Snape hated him for some reason since he was deliberately targeting him. Someone close by did a mistake. Why didn't you warn them, Potter? Preparing potion ingredient? You didn't dice them evenly Potter. That's how his first potion lesson has gone, and Harry didn't feel like any future ones would go better. But that didn't curb his enthusiasm, different from the other students he had his own potion lab always with him and could practice whenever he wanted. Well, Snape seems to hate you, mate. Said Terry Boot as the other Ravenclaw S gave the bespectacled boy a pitying look. Did you do something to Professor Snape, asked Hermione confused, he seems to have a personal vendetta against you. Harry answered with a downcast look, as they left the dungeons, no, I saw the man for the first time at the welcoming feast. Today was the first time I even interacted with him. Strange. It's no secret that he only likes Slytherin S and is heavenly biased towards them. But I didn't hear that he would pick on one student, that's quite unprofessional even for his standards. Added Daphne equally confused, since she heard quite a lot about Hogwarts from her parents and other students during social meetings that she attended. As they arrived in the entrance hall Harry saw that it was quite the beautiful day outside, the dungeons were quite stuffy I will go take a breath of fresh air, does anyone want to join me? 
In the end, he headed out alone, as the others had to finish their homework that he already finished during Dada or wanted to check out the library. The Hogwarts grounds were beautiful green today. As he explored he passed the hut of the gigantic groundskeeper and neared the edge of the forbidden forest. Suddenly a loud voice behind sounded, Oi, stay away from the forest boy. It was Hagrid who is standing in the door of his hut, having spotted the boy closing in on the forest. Hello, Mr. Hagrid. I just were exploring the grounds and took a look at the forest. I didn't want to head in. Replied Harry with a friendly smile. Oh, s yeah Harry. Look at ya yeah, all grown up since I saw ya yeah, the last time. Recognized Hagrid as he beamed at the boy. You met me before Mr. Hagrid, asked Harry interested since he was quite sure he would remember such a big person. Nothing, Mr. Just call me Hagrid. And, yes I met ya yeah, when ya were still a baby, it was me who picked ya up from the ruins oh, your old home. Explained Hagrid as he invited the boy in, come in. I will make us some tea. If I knew what these damn Desleys would do I wouldn't have ya left there. Said the friendly giant with regret in his voice. Don't blame yourself Hagrid. Nobody would expect that they were this kind of humans. Said Harry, following the giant into his hut. Where a big dog was sitting. Harry and Hagrid had quite an enjoyable conversation in that afternoon. Hagrid could tell him quite a lot about his parents, during their school time, since he was good friends with them. He enjoyed this talk with Hagrid quite a lot, he was the first person who could tell him more about his parents who also knew them quite well personally during his second week in the castle, Harry Potter finished his lessons for the day. After saying goodbye to his classmates he decided it was time to check out another important part of the castle. The Hogwarts library stood before him, a haven of knowledge and untold secrets. With its towering bookshelves and hushed whispers, it beckoned to him like a sanctuary of wisdom. The Hogwarts Library was located off of a corridor on the first floor of Hogwarts, as Harry stepped into the vast room, the scent of old parchment filled his nostrils, rows of rows of tens of thousands of books filled thousands of shelves all over the library. A room filled with magic and mystery and Harry was eager to explore every inch of it. His gaze wandered from shelf to shelf, his eyes gliding over titles that promised untold wonders. Books on charms, potions, magical creatures, and the history of the wizarding world whispered their stories. There were so many books that it would take him decades to read all of them, the library far outstrips the size of the one in the Ravenclaw library. Damn, this is a lot. So much of wanting to study all of them. Thought Harry his gaze wandering through the room, a lot of them are probably not about magic itself, but history books and legends could be also useful. So how am I supposed to study them all? Maybe. After having the flash of an idea, Harry stepped towards one of the shelves and pulled a book a copy of, The History of Levitation out. As he held the leathery book in his hand and focused for a moment, an exact replica appeared in the library of his tower inside his sacred gear. All the contents of the book were exactly there, even the signs of age were replicated, you are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigut. Well, that worked halfway. Thought Harry Riley as he compared both copies, his original plan was to directly learn all the contents inside the book, that was something he didn't think of before. But even though he could create an exact copy and understood what it was made of, his sacred gear couldn't just put the content inside his head, and he had to read it normally, well that confirms my guess that Big G isn't omniscient. That he wasn't omnipotent is clear already, or devils would have been wiped out a long time ago. With an excited glimmer in his eyes, Harry looked around the room, well at least I am able to collect all of the books here and read them over time even when I am already graduated. Harry picked up one book after another, creating copies of them inside his sacred gear before picking an interesting one to read, so he wouldn't look suspicious and headed towards one of the tables, sitting down and enjoying a nice book about the light charm Lumos. Spending a few hours in the library, picking some books from time to time up to copy them into his sacred gear before choosing another book to read, Harry noticed an entrance closed by a rope on one side of the library leading to a completely isolated section of the library. Stepping closer to the entrance, wanting to get a better look at the room behind the rope, recognizing it as the restricted section. As he suddenly felt a presence behind him. What do you think you're doing, young man? The restricted section is off-limits to students without the permission of a professor, warned Madame Irma Pants the librarian of the Hogwarts library with a strict look on her face. 
She was a thin, irritable woman who looked like an underfed vulture. Startled by her sudden appearance, Harry tried to explain himself, I, I was just searching for a book. Got a bit turned around, I suppose and just wanted to see what was in there. Harry replied, his voice tinged with nervousness. Madame Pance's sharp gaze scrutinized him, her lips pursed with suspicion. Sensing her disapproval, Harry quickly retreated, his longing gaze lingering on the forbidden entrance behind the rope before he left, deciding it was best to leave the library for today. But he swore to himself that he will get to the forbidden section 2.As Harry left the library, he met a group of people that he managed to avoid for quite a while. These three often tried to approach him after classes, but Harry managed to lose them in one of the many corridors of Hogwarts. Unfortunately today his luck ran out as he met Draco Malfoy with his two attachments Vincent Crabbe and Gregory Goyle as he left the library in a hurry. With no possibility to avoid them this time, they directly approached him. Finally we meet Harry Potter. Somehow every time something comes between us when we try to approach you. Greeted the pale blonde boy. Standing on either side of the pale boy, they looked like bodyguards, oh, this is Crabbe and this is Goyle, said the pale boy carelessly, noticing where Harry was looking. And my name is Malfoy, Draco Malfoy. I remember your names from the sorting. It's nice to meet you Mr. Malfoy, Mr. Goyle, and Mr. Crabbe. Nodded Harry to each of them trying to be as polite as possible. What can I do for the three of you? We came to introduce and invite you to spend some time with proper members of the wizarding world. Replied Malfoy with arrogance, you know some wizarding families are much better than others, Potter. You don't want to go making friends with the wrong sort. I can help you there. Stretching his hand out for Harry. Harry calmly nodded at that before he replied, I understand. Thank you for the offer Mr. Malfoy, but as the heir of a most ancient and most noble family, I will have to be careful. I need to form my own picture of the wizarding world and its members since I lived outside of it for such a long side. Ms. Greengrass was already so helpful to offer me her help. But I appreciate the offer, rejecting the arrogant blonde in such a manner that he wouldn't be offended, while still shaking his hand as a show of respect. During his research about customs in the wizarding world, he read that outright rejecting an offered hand is an insult. So Harry chooses a diplomatic way out, relying on Daphne without offending Draco Malfoy. I see too bad, Mr. Potter. But if you ever need assistance, don't hesitate to approach us. House Malfoy would be honored to be of assistance. Many members of House Slytherin would also be happy to assist you from what I could hear in our common room. Nodded Malfoy a bit disappointed, but he could understand that Daphne Greengrass was faster than him in making connections to Harry. Thank, you Mr. Malfoy. I will keep that in mind. Agreed Harry, absolutely knowing that any assistance would have some form of price, this was the true nature of politics, as he got ready to leave, well then gentlemen. I need to return to the Ravenclaw Tower as I have a further appointment. It was nice to make your acquaintance. You too, Potter. Said Malfoy as he continued to the library with his two grunts following behind him. Harry also continued on his way, relieved that he didn't make a new enemy but he was still confused about what the goal of House Malfoy was. After all from all the informations he could gather they were supporters of Voldemort, his father was even part of his inner circle and only remained free because he was able to bribe his way to innocence. Were they somehow targeting him, or had another nefarious goal in mind? Or did they think Harry could replace Voldemort for their goals? Well, Harry would need to be careful around them, since they were at least former allies of one of his greatest enemies and his parents' killer. On Thursday in his second week at Hogwarts, flying lessons would start. The Ravenclaw had theirs together with the Hufflepuff in the afternoon, while the Gryffindor was together with the Slytherin in the morning. Considering the relationship between House Gryffindor and Slytherin, someone wasn't really thinking this plan through, after all, it's not like the relationship between the two houses wasn't toxic for years. Especially the relationship between the redhead Ronald Weasley and Draco Malfoy brought this whole conflict to a completely different level. Harry even overheard them that they would have a wizard duel, which made him snort secretly since both of them had trouble casting even the simplest spell right now. Well it didn't have anything to do with Harry, he only heard the flying lessons ended with a broken arm and resulted in a fight between the two. His own flying lessons went much calmer, he was a natural talent on the broom. Madame Hooch told him he should apply for the Ravenclaw Quidditch team next year, 
with his talent there was no doubt that he would get in. But Harry himself wasn't sure whether he should, that game sounded so illogical. The seeker position sounded as if someone created it, to give only one person a meaningful special role while making the rest of the game mostly obsolete. Flying on a broom was cool, but flying with his own devil wings was far more amazing, the feeling of freedom they gave was just so wonderful. He loved flying but investing a lot of time training for such an imbalanced sport didn't sound like a good investment of his time, especially if he could use that time to learn magic or explore the castle. He spent quite a lot of time in learning the ins and outs of the ancient castle, he felt it contained many useful secrets. Harry even dared to take a look behind the forbidden door after figuring the unlocking charm out, while nobody was watching he quickly opened the door. Inside he saw a big three-headed dog, a Cerberus the legendary guard dog of the Greek part of the underworld. But it seemed to be a smaller descendant, a true Cerberus wouldn't fit into this small room. Below its paws, Harry saw a wooden trap door leading further into the depths of the castle. Having no way to safely bypass the three-headed dog, he couldn't look at what was below there. The wizarding duel between Ronald and Malfoy ended with Ronald having to attend detentions with Filch, polishing the trophy room for multiple weeks. This duel was a trap by Malfoy to lure the redhead out of his bed during the night and get caught by the spiteful caretaker and his cat Mrs. Norris. This turned Ronald's mood really sour, not only failed all his attempts to befriend Harry Potter, as Harry was doing his best to avoid the fame-hungry boy, but he also turned into the laughingstock of the castle, after falling for Malfoy's trick. Paired with the fact that he lost a ton of points for his house, his mood turned for the worst and didn't get better during the next few weeks. Weeks passed by as September ended and they entered October, on Halloween morning the Ravenclaw had charms with the Gryffindor. While the corridors were filled with the smell of delicious baking pumpkins, their head of house announced they were ready to learn how to make things fly. They would be learning today the levitation charm, Professor Flittick put the class into pairs to practice. To form a better relationship between the houses, the tiny professor paired Gryffindor with Ravenclaw. Daphne worked with Seamus Finnegan, Tracy with Neville Longbottom, Harry was paired with Parvati Patil, the twin sister of his housemate Padma, meanwhile, Hermione had the worst lot, she had to work with the already ill-tempered Ronald. It was hard to tell whether Ronald or Hermione was angrier about this, Hermione had absolutely no interest in working with such a rude and unpleasant person. Ronald on the other hand, was already in a bad mood for the last few weeks, what makes it even worse was the fact that he was highly jealous of the bushy-haired girl, who managed to befriend the boy who lived. He felt that she took his chance for fame and attention away from him. Now, don't forget that nice wrist movement we've been practicing, squeaked Professor Flittick, perched on top of his pile of books as usual. Swish and flick, remember, swish and flick. And saying the magic words properly is very important, too, never forget Wizard Baruffio, who said, S, instead of F, and found himself on the floor with a buffalo on his chest. Harry had no problem performing the spell since he was already halfway done with the coursework for the first year. If he didn't try to master every spell without a wand and create a corresponding magic circle, he would have already completed all the first year spells. After performing the spell and earning an excited squeak with a few house points from their half goblin professor, he focused on helping his partner Parvati. You need to move your wand like that. Explained Harry as he guided her hand to the correct movement so her magic would flow properly for the spell, and then say it like this Wingardium Leviosa. With a blush, the girl followed his instructions and gained a smile on her face as the spell worked and her feather began to float. Parvati also earned house points from the professor, and so did Harry again for helping a fellow student. While the other students were working hard, the partnership between Ron and Hermione turned for the worst and ended with the red-headed boy insulting the girl before she ran out of the class in tears. You are an arse, Weasley. Stay away from my friends. Warned Harry the boy as they were leaving the classroom, if I ever see you insult my friends again you will regret it. He threatened with a cold look in his eyes. Before a hand landed on his shoulder. It was Daphne as she tried to calm him down looking at him with worry. Harry realized that he was leaking a lot of power in his anger, calming himself down again. Come let's look for Hermione. Offered Tracy as she saw the boy had calmed down, she could use our support. This was the last class for the day, and most students headed for the Great Hall, which was beautifully decorated for the Halloween feast. With carved pumpkins, flying candles, 
and a thousand live bats fluttered from the walls and ceiling while a thousand more swooped over the tables in low black clouds, making the candles in the pumpkin stutter. Meanwhile, the three of them were searching the castle for their friend, finding her crying in a locked stall inside the girl's bathroom. After confirming it was empty beside Hermione as everyone was at the feast, Harry followed Daphne and Tracy inside as they knocked at the stall. Hermione are you okay? asked Harry with worry. Go away! shouted the girl as she was crying. We won't. You are our friend. And friends are there for each other. Replied Tracy this time. That's not true. You are probably only hanging out with me because you pity me. She cried clearly with hurt in her voice, it's like in my elementary school, people don't like me. They are just using me for their benefit. Why are you listening to a prat like Ronald Weasley? He is the one who has no friends, and is dislikable. Said Daphne as they could see anger on her face against that redhead. All of us do our own homework. Yes, you are brilliant, Hermione. But we are your friends not because we need something of you. We genuinely like you. You are a young cute and brilliant girl, with a beautiful mind. Consoled Harry her, as he listened to her stopping her sobbing. Do you really mean that? she asked with a vulnerable voice. Yes, Hermione. So come out and let's go to the feast. Let's just ignore that prat and make the most of our time here at Hogwarts. Agreed Daphne. For a short moment, there was silence, before Hermione unlocked the door to her stall and came out. Instantly the three of them pulled the bushy-haired girl into a warm hug. Giving her warmth and comfort. She probably didn't have many friends in her old school because of her brilliance. Children can be that cruel. She is just like me. Realized Harry as he patted her back. Suddenly the door to the girl's bathroom opened and a disgusting stench filled the room, as the four people turned around staring at the entrance. Entering the girl's bathroom on the first floor, was a twelve feet tall creature, its skin was a dull, granite gray, its great lumpy body like a boulder with its small bald head perched on top like a coconut. A foul stench reached his nostrils, a mixture of old socks and the kind of public toilet no one seems to clean. This thing was disgusting. An optimal opportunity to sneak into the restricted section of the library and get his hands on some of the more interesting books, especially the ones focusing on rarer topics of magic. With his newly learned disillusionment charm, Harry was quite confident that he would be successful. Maybe he could also check out the forbidden corridor on the third floor, but he didn't dare to sneak past Fluffy with just the disillusionment charm. He had heard from Hagrid that with its three heads, a Cerberus had an even sharper sense of smell than regular dogs, and its other senses were also sharper. Sneaking past it with just harder visibility would be very dangerous. To even attempt it, he needed to find a way to play music so he could put Fluffy to sleep. Although he had his phone, he didn't want to just leave it behind to keep the dog asleep until he returned, since he didn't know yet what was ahead. So he was looking for magical alternatives. He had already found one, the music charm. It wasn't too complex, but it required a musical instrument to be cast on. Unfortunately, he didn't have one. Conjuration was still out of his reach right now. Transfiguration was overall a very complex class with its own laws to follow. Unlike charms, he couldn't just skip ahead and study more advanced applications. But maybe he could borrow one of the instruments from the music club of Professor Flittick without attracting attention. Well, it was a work in progress. But he wanted to at least check out what was behind that trapdoor before he continued on, so Fluffy had to be taken out without being killed. At least, after visiting Hagrid again and asking why Fluffy was inside the castle full of children, he got another indicator of what was hidden there, the name Nicholas Flamel, a person related in some way to Headmaster Dumbledore. Harry could have sworn he had heard that name somewhere before. The castle emptied, and the Weasley twins got into trouble again for hexing snowballs to follow and hit Professor Quirrell's turban as the last students boarded the train to London and left for the holidays. Meanwhile, the Great Hall and the castle were beautifully decorated with large Christmas trees and other festive decorations. To avoid Ron Weasley pestering him to play wizarding chess, Harry spent most of his time inside the library, where Ron wouldn't set foot since it was related to school and studying. After sending Hedwig with the last of the Christmas presents he had bought, Harry sneaked out of the Ravenclaw common room during the night while under the disillusionment charm. He managed to reach the entrance to the restricted section without any trouble. 
once he made sure there was no magical monitoring charm on the entrance, he sneaked inside. The restricted section was similar to the regular area, filled with a myriad of different leather-bound books. Although slightly smaller in size, some of the books were even chained to the walls, indicating their rarity or value. Unlike the regular books, many of these books emitted a magical aura. To avoid triggering any traps or curses, Harry focused on the books without magical enchantments. He suspected that these magical books required a special method of reading, but since he was sneaking inside, he couldn't ask anyone for guidance. Harry spent almost the entire night making copies of the unenchanted books in his tower. He didn't waste time reading them since his time inside the restricted section was limited. He aimed to complete copying all the unenchanted books during the holidays. That's how he spent the night before Christmas before returning to his empty common room early in the morning to catch some sleep. As Harry woke up with only two hours of sleep before breakfast, the first thing he noticed was a small pile of packages at the foot of his bed. With a happy grin, he picked up the first parcel on the pile. It was wrapped in thick brown paper, and, to Harry, from Hagrid, was scrawled across it. Inside was a roughly cut wooden flute that Hagrid had obviously whittled himself. One problem less, thought Harry with a smile as he blew into the flute. Next, he cast the music charm on it, and it started to play a small melody, albeit a broken version. Well, I will have to practice it more, muttered Harry as he heard the result. From Hermione, he received a large box of chocolate frogs, while Tracy gave him some magical sweets. Daphne sent him a copy of an older book on curses, mentioning that it was a copy from her family's library and contained many books no longer available to the public. He also received gifts from home. Lord and Lady Gremory sent him some new clothes, while Graphia and Sirzex sent him the collected works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. It was likely Graphia's choice, as she wanted to encourage his hobby of reading. Kaneko gave him some sweets, and Aquino sent him a calligraphy set. Rias, on the other hand, sent him all the latest manga volumes he had missed while at Hogwarts, including Naruto, Full Metal Alchemist, One Piece, and more. As he read the new Full Metal Alchemist manga, he finally remembered where he had heard about Nicholas Flamel. It was in one of the previous chapters of Full Metal Alchemist that Rias had gotten him hooked on. In the Full Metal Alchemist universe, Nicholas Flamel was a 15th century alchemist who attempted to create his own philosopher's stone. He was mentioned by Edward Elric, the main character of the manga, while he was researching the Philosopher's Stone at the library in Central. Is this just a coincidence, or is the Nicholas Flamel of Full Metal Alchemist based on a real person? Harry pondered. He pulled out his laptop and connected to the Devil Net, grateful that it worked anywhere in the world. After a quick Google search, he managed to find some information on the real person, Nicholas Flamel. Nicholas Flamel was born in France in 1327 and was said to have created the Philosopher's Stone, granting immortality and the ability to transmute metals into gold. If this is the same person Hagrid mentioned, he should be over 600 years old. So he really did create the Philosopher's Stone. I'll have to check it in the library, Harry realized. The only thing that could be hidden on the third floor corridor is the Philosopher's Stone, but immortality isn't something I need with my natural devil lifespan of 10,000 years. I have enough gold too, but it should still be an interesting object to study. After all, it was created with magic. Unfortunately, there was no devilpedia or anything similar on the devil net. It only had access to the human internet with all its content, and devil specific stuff like the devil tube streaming and rating games, which acted as a supernatural clone of YouTube. There were even tutorials for spells and similar things. Harry stored his laptop back in his sacred gear before returning his attention to his Christmas presents. There was only one parcel remaining. Harry picked it up and felt its weight. It was very light. He unwrapped it, revealing something fluid and silvery gray that slithered to the floor, forming gleaming folds. It was a shiny silvery cloth that Harry picked up from the floor. It felt strange to the touch, like water woven into fabric. Now that it was outside the parcel, he sensed strong and ancient magic emanating from it. No, that's not just magic. There's something more to it, he realized as he held the cloth between his fingers, feeling a distinctive cold and ancient sensation that he had never experienced before. He couldn't quite place it, but this cloth seemed very special. What is it? Inside the parcel, there was a note written in narrow, loopy writing he had never seen before. 
The following words were written on it, Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. There was no signature. Harry stared at the note, thinking, this tells me nothing, except that whatever it is, it belonged to my dad. Harry carefully examined the cloth. It looks a bit like a cloak, but much larger, as if made for a really big person. So maybe I have to wear it. The magic doesn't feel dangerous, just ancient and powerful. After hesitating for a moment, he stood up and put it on. Ha, huh, nothing happened. He walked to the mirror in the bedroom and looked into it. It's an invisibility cloak, he realized, as he couldn't see himself in the mirror, only his head floating midair. Amazing. Just when I learned a spell that makes me invisible, I receive an artifact that does the same, Harry chuckled about his luck before an idea struck him. It would be amazing if that worked. Putting the cloak into the space of his sacred gear, he could feel its power within. Casting his disillusionment charm while channeling the ancient power from the cloak into it, he turned invisible. Not just partially like a chameleon, where he was still visible if one looked closely enough, but truly invisible. But the most astonishing thing was that he couldn't feel magic emanating from him. Just like with the cloak, he could only sense his magic when he touched his skin. However, he still made sounds and could smell himself, although he wasn't sure yet whether that was because he was the caster of the spell or if everyone could smell and hear him. But this was a truly powerful skill that could save his life in the future. Being able to completely erase his presence was an incredibly rare ability. Christmas breakfast was quite the cozy event, regardless of the house or teacher, as they all shared one table together. The Weasleys all wore homemade Christmas sweaters with their initials. Harry and the Weasleys spent a happy afternoon having a furious snowball fight on the grounds before returning to their respective common rooms. As the moonlight shone through his window at night, he once again cast his invisibility cloak-fueled invisibility spell and sneaked out of his common room. Instead of sneaking from the fifth-floor common room to the library on the first floor, he stopped midway and entered the third-floor corridor. Arriving in front of Fluffy's room, Harry pulled out the flute he received from Hagrid and cast the music charm on it before unlocking the door with Alohomera. He opened it, placing the flute inside, and waited for a few minutes. Carefully opening the door again, he checked the situation inside. All three heads of Fluffy lay on the floor, snoring to the gentle music played by Harry's flute. Meanwhile, he also paid attention to the monitoring charm on the entrance, which didn't react at all to his invisible presence. The power of the cloak is amazing. With that, I could become an incredible thief or assassin. Passing Fluffy as he walked toward the heavy trapdoor on the floor, with his enhanced devil strength, he was able to pull it open. Observing the darkness below, he could clearly see what was hidden behind the trapdoor. With his enhanced eyesight, he could see that the room went deeper and deeper, but on the floor, he could still spot something green with snake-like tendrils. This must be a devil's snare. Really? This is the second protection. A plant we study in our first year. It's only dangerous if you have no idea what to do. Well, why should I complain? But this seems to be too easy. With a shrug, he jumped down onto the devil's snare and got captured by its tendrils. Without panicking, he cast an overpowered Lumos charm, illuminating the whole room. Wriggling and flailing, the devil's snare unraveled itself from his body, and he was able to break free. Now standing in the stone room, he spotted a stone passageway continuing further downwards. He reached the end of the passageway and saw before him a brilliantly lit chamber, its ceiling arched high above him. It was full of small, jewel-bright birds fluttering and tumbling all around the room. On the opposite side of the chamber stood a heavy wooden door. Carefully approaching the door while keeping an eye on the birds, he tried to open it, but it was locked, and his unlocking charm didn't work. Harry looked around and found a broom in the chamber, which made him take a closer look at the birds. He quickly identified them as winged keys. Without hesitation, he summoned his devil's wings and took off into the air. All of the keys looked different. Well, at least this is an actual protective measure. It will take some time to find the right key. With the monitoring spell on the entrance, most thieves who aren't careful enough would be caught here. After searching through the many different keys, he finally spotted one of approximately the right size and material as the lock on the door. It was a big silver key with blue wings. 
It fit into the door, and Harry entered the next room. The next chamber was so dark he couldn't see anything at all. But as he stepped into it, light suddenly flooded the room, revealing an astonishing sight. He was standing on the edge of a huge chessboard, behind the black chessmen, which were all taller than he was and carved from what looked like black stone. Facing him, way across the chamber, were the white pieces. So they want me to play across the room, Harry realized, as the white figures wanted to attack him if he got too close to them. Maybe I can trick them. Harry turned invisible and flew over them with his wings directly to the door. Unfortunately, the door was locked and had no visible lock to unlock. After sensing the magic on it, he knew it was connected to the big chessboard. So, I have to beat the white side. But do I have to follow the rules? Stretching his hand out and forming multiple magic circles, he shot a barrage of fireballs at the white king and destroyed the figure. The door remained locked. After a few moments, the king repaired itself and stood there as if nothing had happened. Well, it seems I have to play following the rules. Destroying the door would probably alarm the teachers, so I'll pass on that for now, he decided before touching the floor. He focused on the chessboard with all its enchantments and created an exact copy in one of the rooms in his towers using the powers of his sacred gear. I'm not confident enough to win a chess match here right now, but at least I have a way to practice. With that, he retraced his steps through the previous chambers and flew up through the trapdoor before returning to the Ravenclaw common room. Once he packed his flute away and closed the door behind him, as Fluffy was waking up from his slumber, he heard quick steps approaching his location. Still invisible, Harry hid behind a corner, waiting for an opportunity to sneak by whoever was coming from the direction of the great staircase, blocking his way back to his common room. It was Professor Snape in his dark robes, quickly running towards the forbidden corridor. Opening the door wide, only to be greeted by the three heads of Fluffy watching the entrance. Harry used the opportunity when the professor was distracted with dodging Fluffy's angry heads and escaping the room unharmed to run towards the great staircase. Hold there, whoever you are, shouted Snape upon hearing the steps, pointing his wand at the corridor. Hominum revelio, he exclaimed, looking confused as the spell gave him a negative response, indicating no human presence was there. Before Snape decided to follow whoever he had heard running. Meanwhile, Harry didn't stop running towards the staircase, heading upwards to the next floor to find a place to hide. Using his wings to glide invisibly through the air so he wouldn't make any more footsteps. Behind him, the door to the floor was ripped open as Harry glided around the corner, quietly entering a door that stood ajar to his left. Holding his breath to avoid making any noise, he squeezed in. Snape walked straight past, and Harry leaned against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to his footsteps slowly dying away. It took a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room he had hidden in. It looked like an unused classroom. The dark shapes of desks and chairs were piled against the walls, and there was an upturned wastepaper basket. But propped against the wall facing him was something that didn't look like it belonged there, something that appeared to have been put there to keep it out of the way. It was a magnificent mirror, as high as the ceiling, with an ornate gold frame, standing on two clawed feet. There was an inscription carved around the top, Eris stra eru oit ube kafru oit onwosi. His adrenaline from escaping Snape faded as his curiosity was awakened. He felt strong magic emanating from that strange mirror, magic that invited him to look into the mysterious mirror. Observing the inscription at the top, Harry read slowly, I show not your face but your heart's desire. Interesting. So what does my heart desire, thought Harry with curiosity before standing in front of the mirror and dropping his invisibility spell. There he was, reflected in it, with his wild black hair and emerald green eyes behind a nice pair of glasses. Reflected behind him were at least twenty others, some he recognized and others not at all. Besides him stood Rias, Aquino, and Kaneko with Lord and Lady Gremory, Grafia, and Serzex slightly behind them. Beside them were also Sona, her peerage, and Seraphal. Directly behind a happily smiling Harry stood a woman who was smiling at him and waving. She was a very pretty woman with dark red hair, and her eyes, her eyes were just like Harry's. He recognized her from the pictures Sarah Fall got for him, it was his mother, Lily Potter. The tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her put his arm around her. He wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. It stuck up at the back, just as Harry's did. That was James Potter, his father. 
The other people standing behind them had similarities to him and his parents. Some had the same green eyes as his mother and him, others had her red hair, while others had the wild hair of his father. Well, it's like I expected. My greatest desire is still to have a family, smiled Harry to himself. Well, I have a part of it already. What a dangerous artifact. Someone weak-willed would be standing here wishing for something that could be, instead of living their life. Having already understood the mirror he touched it creating an exact replica inside his tower, after that Harry turned away, becoming invisible once again, and left the room, not noticing the pair of old blue eyes standing in the corner of the room, watching him with interest, Harry never returned to the mirror again. He wasn't interested in living an illusion. Neither did he study the exact replica inside his sacred gear, as his understanding of magic and enchantments wasn't high enough to gain any meaningful insights into how it worked. The rest of the winter holidays, he would sneak every night into the restricted section of the library to copy more books, while during the days, he studied in the library, practiced chess on the enchanted chessboard he copied in his tower, or hung around with the other students who stayed in the castle. During his daytime reading, he also found some books in the library about Nicholas Flamel, confirming the existence of the Philosopher's Stone for him. Although the elixir of life and turning other metals into gold weren't of big interest to him, the mechanics behind the stone were fascinating and of massive research value. Having a copy of it stored in his sacred gear could give him a lot of knowledge about alchemy in the future. Nobody would be wiser since the original was still there. But first, he needed to be good enough to beat that damn chessboard. Grudgingly, he agreed to play multiple rounds of chess with Ronald Weasley. He may have an unpleasant and lazy personality, but in chess, he was a true master, and it gave Harry another reference to learn from besides that enchanted chessboard he copied and online chess over the human internet with his laptop. At the end of the holidays, after the new year, the Hogwarts Express arrived from London, carrying the other students, allowing them to return before the semester started anew. His classmates also returned with them. Hey Harry, how have you been? Was your Christmas pleasant? greeted Tracy as she arrived with Daphne, Hermione, and the other first years in the common room. Pretty nice. It was the first Christmas I celebrated since the family I am living with now doesn't really celebrate Christmas, and before that. Well, it was my first Christmas, and I enjoyed it. Thank you for the gifts, by the way, explained Harry with a smile as he greeted the arrivals. No problem. You too, Harry. I enjoyed the sweets you sent me, although I am unfamiliar with them, replied Daphne with a smile as they joined him on the sofa around the fireplace in the common room. They didn't recognize the sweets because Harry decided to get them a collection of sweets from the underworld. Like the wizarding world, they also had their unique products, even though something like sweets weren't enchanted. But they were still of very high quality since devils had, thanks to their long lifespan, centuries to master their craft to an unprecedented level. My parents first complained when I unwrapped your gifts since they are dentists. But once I gave them some to try, they very much enjoyed them. They even said it's okay to enjoy from time to time if I do it in limits, chuckled Hermione as she recounted her experience. I also didn't recognize them from the non-magical world. Well, they are not from Britain and pretty hard to get. I got them through my guardians, explained Harry a bit. They were really tasty, Harry. Parvati also sends her thanks. Sorry that we didn't get you something, added Padma as Harry also sent them a small gift that they really enjoyed. He pretty much sent all Ravenclaw first years a small gift, and some people from the other houses he talks to from time to time. Just because when he requested some sweets from the underworld, the Gremories sent him a massive amount too much for just the few gifts he was originally planning. Don't worry. I just got too much from home when I requested them for gifts, so I sent some to everyone," he explained with a slight chuckle. All the first years sat down and chatted about their Christmas holidays and discussed the coming restart of the classes. They didn't have to worry about their luggage since it was already sent to their rooms. In that way, they spent the last day of their holiday before classes restarted again for all of them. As weeks passed at Hogwarts, winter's icy grip yielded to the gentle touch of spring. The castle walls resonated with the melodies of chirping birds, and vibrant blossoms adorned the grounds. Students shed their heavy cloaks, embracing the warmth of sunlight filtering through windows. Amidst this blossoming hope, a subtle buzz of anticipation mingled with the sweet-scented air. Exams loomed on the horizon, casting a shadow over the newfound joy. 
Smiles masked quiet determination as students immersed themselves in late-night studies, their laughter blending with whispered revisions. Hermione, don't be so nervous. The exams are ages away, laughed Tracy as she watched the bushy-haired girl color-coding her notes and drawing out study schedules. Ten weeks, Hermione snapped. They will be here faster than you guys think. Sure, but there is no need to panic. We studied the whole semester, kept up with the curriculum, took notes, and did well enough that we only need to repeat our notes, and we will do well enough, said Daphne, also going over her notes. No need to worry, Hermione. You are doing well, just go over every topic again, and you will do fine. If you have any questions, you can ask me. And there are tutoring sessions every Friday if you need more, nodded Harry. He was atop of the class, followed by Hermione, then Daphne in third place. Ravenclaw was dominating the House Cup this year, not that it was important to Harry, but doing well in class automatically earned him a good amount of points. But no matter what they said, Hermione wouldn't relax. She was just that kind of person, overthinking everything related to school and exams. Unfortunately, the teachers seemed to be thinking along the same lines as Hermione. They piled so much homework on them that the Easter holidays weren't nearly as much fun as the Christmas ones. It was hard to relax with Hermione next to you, reciting the twelve uses of dragon's blood or practicing wand movements. Needing a breather, Harry decided to retreat to the Hogwarts library, since Hermione mostly used the one in the Ravenclaw Tower as they had their books organized according to the curriculum of each year, while the big library had more books, it took longer to find appropriate ones. Harry didn't really need to study as much as Hermione felt she needed, as he had a pretty good grasp of the material and would do fine with light studying of his notes. Instead, he focused on his task of copying the Hogwarts library into his tower. He had already finished most of the restricted section. He was only missing a few books that needed special instructions, which he could only get officially from Madame Pants. Unfortunately, he felt like it was incomplete. Most of the dark magic books had references to topics that were nowhere to be found in the restricted section. With the Hogwarts library being the biggest in the whole wizarding world, he felt that there were multiple tomes removed by someone, probably Headmaster Dumbledore. But he didn't read many of the books in the restricted section, as they were far more advanced than his current level of understanding. So he returned to the task of collecting the whole normal part of the library, which was multiple times bigger than the restricted section. His speed was also much slower since he had to sit down and read a book from time to time so he wouldn't look suspicious. Today, something unusual happened. Just when he chose a book to read, he spotted Hagrid. He shuffled into view, hiding something behind his back. He looked very out of place in his moleskin overcoat. Hagrid, what are you doing in the library? I've never seen you here before, wondered Harry as he spotted the lovable half-giant. Just looking, he said, in a shifty voice that piqued Harry's interest at once. And what are you doing up here? A bit of light reading, still trying to read as much of the library as I can, replied Harry nonchalantly. So, any reason why you're researching dragons? Shoo, how do you know that? Are you spying on me, Harry, asked the half-giant with a suspicious look in his eyes. Nah, I'm just familiar with the layout of the library. Since you took a book from the dragon section, it's pretty clear, explained the dark-haired boy before he halted for a moment. Oh no, Hagrid, don't tell me you're doing that because you did what I think you did. I don't know what you're thinking. Can't read minds, answered Hagrid innocently. You got one. It's illegal in Britain, Hagrid. You could get into serious trouble, scolded Harry worried about his friend. Shoo, not so loud. Come later to me hut, shushed Hagrid before he strolled out of the library. He seriously got his hands on a real dragon, thought Harry as he watched the giant leave. When he knocked on the door of the gamekeeper's hut an hour later, he was surprised to see that all the curtains were closed. Hagrid's voice called out, who is it, before he let him in, swiftly shutting the door behind him. As he stepped inside, he felt stifling heat engulfing him. Despite the warmth of the day, a blazing fire roared in the grate. Hagrid busied himself, preparing tea and offering stoat sandwiches, which he politely declined. Where did you get it? asked Harry as he got closer to the fire. Won it, said Hagrid. Last night. I was down in the village having a few drinks and got into a game of cards with a stranger. 
think he was quite glad to get rid of it, to be honest. What are you planning to do with it when it hatches? asked Harry, curious about the consequences. Well, I've been doing some reading, said Hagrid, pulling a large book from under his pillow. Got this out of the library, dragon breeding for pleasure and profit, it's a bit out of date, of course, but it's all in here. Keep the egg in the fire because their mothers breathe on them, see, and when it hatches, feed it on a bucket of brandy mixed with chicken blood every half hour. And see here, how to recognize different eggs, what I got there's a Norwegian Ridgeback. They're rare, them. He looked very pleased with himself. You do realize that you are living in a wooden hut. And it's highly illegal. Not only would you land in Azkaban if you get caught, but also Dumbledore would be implicated, summarized Harry with a deadpan expression. Eh, I didn't think that through, did I? Dumbledore is a good man, don't want to cause trouble for him. What should I do, Harry, realized Hagrid as he stared at the scaly dragon egg inside the fire with sad eyes. Sighing, Harry began to say, no, you didn't. I have a plan. How about you take care of it until it hatches? Then you give it to me. I have a way to transport it to a good reserve where it can live freely. My guardians have many contacts. He explained with a half-truth. Are you sure that it will be taken care of? asked the giant, worried. Nodding, Harry replied, yes, I will make sure of it myself. And he wasn't lying. He would create a big reserve for the hatched dragon where it could live and hunt in freedom inside his sacred gear. Even though the dragons of the wizarding world were lesser dragons with low intelligence, they still reached high-class levels of power even in their lower bloodlines. He had always planned to get some into his sacred gear since he understood how it worked. And Hagrid's dragon would make a good start for his own army of dragons. So, in the end, they agreed on the deal. When the dragon began hatching, Hagrid also called Harry, who took the other Ravenclaw first years with him after they swore they wouldn't share the event. Even if they did, it wouldn't matter, as there would be no proof of an actual dragon hatching there. Together, they observed the hatching of the small dragon that Hagrid called Norbert. During the night, under the guise of his invisibility cloak, Harry snuck to Hagrid's hut, where Hagrid was already waiting with Norberta ready for transport. After taking the small reptile, he sneaked back to the castle. Once out of sight, he placed her into an innovative clear on an island with nice mountains, woods, and some animals that Harry had prepared for Norberta. Once inside his sacred gear, he could sense more about the small dragon. Ha, huh, it's female. So her name is Norberta. Exams were here, while you could see the nervousness of the other students on their faces. Harry blasted through them with no difficulty, by this point, he had almost completed the third year of the Hogwarts curriculum. If he weren't distracted by other things like learning chess, he would have been farther. The first year exams were held under sweltering heat in their classrooms, with extra quills for the exams. They were bewitched with an anti cheating spell, and Harry almost gave in to his desire to test its limits. But in the end, he decided he would finish the exam without troubles and try the quill once he learned the spell himself. They had practical exams as well. Professor Flittick called them one by one into his class to see if they could make a pineapple tap dance across a desk. Professor McGonagall watched them turn a mouse into a snuffbox, points were given for how pretty the snuffbox was, but taken away if it had whiskers. Snape made them all nervous, breathing down their necks while they tried to remember how to make a forgetfulness potion. Since the incident on Halloween, Snape pretty much ignored Harry's existence. Even when he had to hand over his potions for grading, the man just took them and didn't even look at the boy. Harry wouldn't complain if he didn't have to endure the ridiculing of the greasy-haired professor. He didn't have a problem with not being able to ask questions. Yes, there could be a better teacher, but in the end, he didn't care about potions enough, and he did study ahead for all of the subjects anyway. There weren't that many questions he had to ask either way, and Hermione did a good job covering them. Not like Snape did a good job answering them. Their very last exam was history of magic. One hour of answering questions about batty old wizards who'd invented self-stirring cauldrons, and they'd be free, free for a whole wonderful week until their exam results came out. When the ghost of Professor Binns told them to put down their quills and roll up their parchment, Harry couldn't help cheering with the rest. History of magic was one of the worst and most boring classes in the whole curriculum. Not only did their ghost professor have no idea what was actually going on, he didn't even know their names, 
he called them by the names of students who were probably already deceased. He was like a broken recording. No, it was basically like learning the history of what was going on for the last thousand years inside a fishbowl, almost completely isolated from the outside world. Even if they mentioned some events outside of the wizarding world, their perspective was very limited and distant, without even trying to understand it. For wizards, the transition from the horse carriage to cars was one of the most recent events. Completely insular, but sometimes funny to read. But there wasn't much use in it for Harry. However, he still persisted in learning their history so he had a chance to discover some kind of ancient or lost but interesting magic. More magic like their space manipulation in their trunks, the extremely rare kind. That was far easier than I thought it would be, said Hermione as they joined the crowds flocking out onto the sunny grounds. I needn't have learned about the 1637 werewolf code of conduct or the uprising of Elfric the Eager. Hermione always liked to go through their exam papers afterward, while the others could only chuckle. We told you that you were overthinking, said Harry as he could only shake his head when he heard his bushy-haired friend. They wandered down to the lake and flopped under a tree. From there, they could see the Weasley twins and Lee Jordan tickling the tentacles of the giant squid, which was basking in the warm shallows of the lake. At last, no more studying, sighed Tracy contentedly as she basked in the warm sun, leaning against the stump of the tree. Daphne nodded beside her, enjoying the beautiful view of the Black Lake on this nice and sunny day. Meanwhile, Harry was lost in his thoughts. It was time to get to the Philosopher's Stone. He had around an 80% winning rate against his copy of the Enchanted Chess set right now. But his time was running out, he didn't feel like he would improve much more until the school year ended. It would be do or die. Well, fail. He was confident he could survive losing against the chess set or against anything else there was as a safeguard. He had already tried it, and the teleportation circle did work in Hogwarts. They only warded against their specific forms of teleportation they called apparition and port keys. So if he were stuck, he could just teleport out of there. Too bad he couldn't teleport to places he hadn't visited yet. Or he would just have teleported to the last room at the end. Also, he did need enough time to set up a teleportation circle because, unlike their instantaneous version, he first needed to set up a circle that took around half a minute. Some people could do it faster, but he couldn't yet. Also, something was bothering Harry about Norberta, the Norwegian Ridgeback. Although she was growing splendidly, adjusted well to the environment, and hunted her own food, something about her was bothering him in his subconsciousness. But he couldn't tell what. And then it hit him, he finally knew what was bothering him. It had nothing to do with Norberta herself, neither her health nor anything similar. Why would someone conveniently have a dragon for Hagrid? He said he met that someone in the hog's head, but why would he be there with a dragon egg? There is nothing, it's just a small village. Most of the shops there are for Hogwarts students. Nothing even remotely related to magical animals, especially dragons. Poachers would try to sell it somewhere in Nocturne Alley, thought Harry as his mind worked at full speed. See you later, guys. I am going to visit Hagrid, he said suddenly as he stood up. Eh, see you later. That was kind of abrupt, muttered Daphne as the blonde-haired girl watched Harry disappear. Hagrid was sitting in an armchair outside his house, his trousers and sleeves were rolled up, and he was shelling peas into a large bowl. Hello, he said, smiling. Finished your exams? Got time for a drink? Sorry, no time, Hagrid. I really need to ask you something. You know that night you won Norbert? What did the stranger you were playing cards with look like? Dunno, said Hagrid casually, he wouldn't take his cloak off. Seeing that Harry watched him with bafflement, he clarified, it's not that unusual, yeah I get a lot, oh, funny folk in the hog's head, that's one oh, the pub's down in the village. Might have been a dragon dealer, mightn't he? I never saw his face, he kept his hood up. Harry sank down next to the bowl of peas. What did you talk to him about, Hagrid? Did you mention Hogwarts at all? Might have come up, said Hagrid, frowning as he tried to remember. Yeah. He asked what I did, and I told him I was the gamekeeper here. He asked a bit about the sort of creatures I look after. So I told him. And I said what I'd always really wanted was a dragon. And then. I can't remember too well, cause he kept buying me drinks. Let's see. 
Yeah, then he said he had the dragon egg and we could play cards for it if I wanted. But he had to be sure I could handle it, he didn't want it to go to any old home. So I told him, after Fluffy, a dragon would be easy. And did he, did he seem interested in Fluffy? Harry asked, trying to keep his voice calm. Well, yeah, how many three-headed dogs do you meet, even around Hogwarts? So I told him, Fluffy's a piece o oh, cake if you know how to calm him down, just play him a bit o oh, music and he'll go straight off to sleep. Hagrid suddenly looked horrified. I shouldn't have told ya that, he blurted out. Forget I said it. Hey, where are ya going? You already told me that. I don't want to use the stone. Only study it a bit. You shouldn't have told that man, said Harry as he rushed back towards the castle. There was no way he would allow anybody to steal the stone. It was his target for this year. No way in hell would he allow somebody else to take it, even if he just wanted to borrow it for an indefinite amount of time. No, he decided, Dumbledore is clearly incompetent. Who would guard the stone with such simple protections? Devil's Snare is a first-year plant. The chess game may be deadly, but if I didn't plan to continue studying here, I could just blow a hole through that door. It's better if I keep the stone safe. He decided self-righteously with determination, fuck you, quarrel. Rushing back towards the gate of the ancient castle, heading inside in the direction of the great staircase. In an unobserved corner of the castle, with no portraits present, he cast his empowered version of the disillusionment charm, turning himself invisible. Secretly bypassing Snape, who was keeping an eye on the forbidden corridor on the third floor whenever he could, Harry arrived in front of the door. Behind it, he could hear Fluffy breathing and walking around. Once he made sure that nobody was in the corridor that could see him, he pulled the flute out of his sacred gear and cast the music charm on it once again, putting the three-headed dog to sleep. From then, he quickly bypassed all the security measures he was familiar with, rushing through every room without trouble since he already knew what he had to do in each of them. On his way, he collected the devil's snare and placed it in one of his greenhouses. Until he arrived at the familiar door of the room with the giant chessboard inside. Once he stepped again inside the dark room, it began to illuminate wholly with light, revealing both sides of the chessboard. With the black figures on his side and the faceless white figures on the other side waiting for him. He approached the figure of the Black King and touched it, I am going to take your place. Having heard him, the Black King turned and left the field, opening his spot for him. Once he stood in his place, the white side, like in any classic chess game, opened the game by moving a white pawn forward. Harry followed suit with a loud voice, by commanding his pieces to follow his strategy. And an exciting chess match erupted between both parties. Directing his pieces to fight the white ones, killing each other in a brutal match. Every time one of his men was lost, the white pieces showed no mercy. Soon there was a huddle of limp black players slumped along the wall. But there were as many destroyed white pieces as black ones. There were a few risky situations where the white side put him under check, but he managed to evade the loss each time. To end that match, he had to make a risky move. It was a gamble. If the white side was like a chess computer, he would lose since it wouldn't make any so obvious mistakes. But during his practice matches and right now, he felt as if the figures had a bit of their own personality, as if magic gave them life. Using himself as bait, he had to hold his breath. If the other side used their knight, he would lose, but if it used the queen, he would deliver a devastating blow since he could take it two turns after, and the queen couldn't escape. One uncomfortable long moment later, the queen put him under check again, triggering his trap. After taking the white queen out of the match, his side was stronger, and he could safely pull the match through, ending the chess game for his life by putting the enemy king under checkmate. The white king took off his crown and threw it at Harry's feet. He had won. The chessmen parted and bowed, leaving the door ahead clear. And he continued on, having completed this challenge, through the door and up the next passageway. So Hagrid with Fluffy, Sprout with the Devil's Snare, Flittick the Keys, McGonagall the Chess Set, only Quirrell, Snape, and Dumbledore remaining, muttered Harry as he rushed through the passageway. He had reached another door and pushed it open. The moment he opened the door, a disgusting smell filled his nostrils, a familiar smell. His senses warned him as he jumped to the side. One second later, and he would have received a terrible wound as a massive wooden club hit the place he just stood. 
Another troll, even larger than the one he captured, was the challenge Quirrell left in his room. Ha, huh, that's how he got away with letting a troll into the castle. He probably said that it escaped him while he had to transport it here. They probably assumed it returned by itself into the wilds once they didn't find it, he thought as he readied a barrage of enhanced paralysis spells. Hitting the troll with all five projectiles slowed it visibly down but didn't take it out yet. It was clearly a more grown one than the other one. Hitting it with two more barrages of his paralysis spells finally finished it. Unable to move, the troll lay on the floor, steadily breathing while keeping on to its consciousness, its disgusting stench still flooding the room. Not even thinking for long, Harry pulled the massive body of the ugly creature into his sacred gear, placing it with the other troll who was becoming lonely all alone. Expanding the collection of creatures he possessed. Like with the devil's snare, why should he leave free stuff behind? He was just going in and out while blaming everything on Quirrell if someone should ask. The strange stuttering professor was clearly the culprit. Over the last months, the feeling of vile and disgusting magic from him became stronger and stronger. As if the man was breaking the laws of nature itself, without thinking about the consequences at all. Such a person was desperate and clearly already in the eyes of Dumbledore and the other teachers. Snape didn't make a secret of how he was clearly keeping an eye on him. So, an ideal scapegoat for Harry's borrowing tour. After dying and becoming a devil, his values clearly changed. Although he wouldn't harm innocents, he had no problem acting on his devil sins, bettering his own position no matter how. He didn't want to die so pathetically again, and he would do anything to become someone truly great while also keeping the people close to him safe. So, sorry Quirrell, but when you send a troll after me, you should expect to become my enemy and receive my revenge. Having stored the troll away, he pulled the next door open, wanting to finally see the challenge in the next room, the final challenge left behind by Professor Snape. It was nothing outstanding, just a table with seven differently shaped bottles standing on it in a line. He stepped over the threshold, and immediately a fire sprang up behind him in the doorway. It wasn't ordinary fire either, it was purple. At the same instant, black flames shot up in the doorway leading onward. He was trapped. There was no way forward or backward as both entrances were blocked by magical flames. On the table beside the seven bottles was a roll of parchment with a riddle written on it, danger lies before you, while safety lies behind, two of us will help you, whichever you would find, one among us seven will let you move ahead, another will transport the drinker back instead, two among our number hold only nettle wine. Three of us are killers, waiting hidden in line. Choose, unless you wish to stay here forevermore, to help you in your choice, we give you these clues for. First, however slyly the poison tries to hide, you will always find some on Nettlewine's left side. Second, different are those who stand at either end, but if you would move onward, neither is your friend. Third, as you see clearly, all are different size, neither dwarf nor giant holds death in their insides. Fourth, the second left and the second on the right, are twins once you taste them, though different at first sight. Hmm, a logic riddle, clever. From what I could observe, most wizards aren't logical and always look for a solution with magic. Such a challenge will hinder the most of them, smirked Harry as he had to give it to Snape that this was quite clever. Let's see, the leftmost one isn't wine as the first clue said that there is always poison on the left of wine. Which means, according to the second clue, the rightmost is different from the leftmost. The biggest bottle is on the right, it isn't poison but neither wine since the twins have to be wine or on the left of wine. It couldn't always be poison with the smallest one also being safe to drink. Since the outermost ones aren't the way forward, the biggest one on the right leads me back, and the smallest one is the way forward. Clearly thinking through all the clues, Harry managed to identify the correct bottle. The potion forward was in the smallest bottle. Harry took a deep breath and picked up the smallest bottle. He turned to face the black flames. Here I come, he said, and he drained the little bottle in one gulp. It was indeed as though ice was flooding his body. He put the bottle down and walked forward, he braced himself, saw the black flames licking his body, but couldn't feel them, for a moment he could see nothing but dark fire, then he was on the other side, in the last chamber. On the other side was a wide, round chamber made of sandy stone, bathed in the warm orange light of torches hanging from round pillars encircling the chamber. A small flight of stony steps led down into the center of the chamber onto a circular platform. 
There was no other exit or door besides the burning corridor with the black flames he had come from. In the center of the platform stood an object, attracting all the attention of the chamber. This was a very familiar object to Harry, as he had already seen it before and even had a copy inside his sacred gear. The Mirror of Ariste, a fascinating yet dangerous magical artifact. He had spent quite a bit of time studying the copy he had created, but he couldn't figure out the magic behind it yet. He wasn't even powerful enough to create another copy when he tried to test it. The magic behind the mirror was so complex. His ability to create copies of things was much easier if he could touch the original. The more powerful or complex the thing was, the more power it cost him to recreate it inside his sacred gear. Carefully, Harry descended the stairs onto the stone platform in the middle of the chamber. He approached the mirror in the center, feeling the ambient magic for any possible traps. But besides the hot, dangerous burning magic in the entrance from the black flames, all he felt was the powerful, attracting magic from the golden framed mirror. The magic from the mirror felt even stronger than when he had seen it before in the abandoned classroom, as if there was another source of pure magical power emanating from it. This magical power felt very strong and ancient, emanating from all over the mirror of Ariste. That's why the mirror was in the school. Dumbledore must have still prepared the final trap during the Christmas holidays. And the mirror must be the trap. The stone is clearly inside if what I feel is true, he realized as he felt the magic of the chamber. Taking a closer look at the magic, he realized that the spells and enchantments felt different from before. Above the original ones that felt old, there was newer magic, although he couldn't exactly feel what they did. But since they felt similar to the original magic, he could take a good guess. So the magic of the mirror must have been modified by Dumbledore, most likely something like someone can only take the stone out if he didn't want to use it. Well, I don't want to use it, only study it. I have no need for immortality with my long lifespan and enough gold to live comfortably. With my sacred gear, I don't have to worry about food or anything. What I want more than anything right now is to study the stone before anyone else destroys it so I can understand how it works. Believing deeply that he didn't want to use the stone, only learn from it, Harry stepped in front of the mirror, dropping his invisibility again, and looked inside. On the silvery surface of the magical mirror, Harry saw his own reflection, his wild, raven-black hair, his glasses, his neat Hogwarts robe, and his almost glowing emerald green eyes staring back at him. A moment later, the reflection smiled at him. It put its hand into its pocket and pulled out a blood-red stone. It winked and put the stone back in its pocket, and as it did so, Harry felt something heavy drop into his real pocket. The feeling of powerful, pure magic shifted from the mirror to his pocket, condensed into an object. He had the Philosopher's Stone. Just as he wanted to pull it out to observe it, Harry heard footsteps from behind him passing through the sickening black fire. It was Quirinus Quirrell. Looking around the chamber for a moment, before his eyes landed in the center, landing on Harry, Quirrell smiled. His face wasn't twitching at all. Harry Potter playing the hero, I see. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. But that you arrived faster than me here, impressive, I must say. Ah, Professor Quirrell, what a fine day to meet you here. What happened to your stutter, asked Harry, unimpressed by the professor dropping his act. Don't be cocky, Potter. After all, you will die today, said Quirrell as he snapped his fingers. Ropes sprang out of thin air and wrapped themselves tightly around Harry, who was unprepared for wandless magic, as he expected the teacher would have to use his wand. Magic without a focus or a magic circle was really hard, especially with their magic power less potent and smaller than the demonic power of devils. Even devils needed quite a bit of practice or concentration to perform spells without a magic circle. So it was quite impressive that Quirrell was able to use spells in such a way, especially since he hadn't seen any of the other teachers do something similar yet. You're too nosy to live, Potter. Scurrying around the school on Halloween like that, for all I knew, you'd see me coming to look at what was guarding the stone. So you really let the troll in as expected, muttered Harry, readying himself for the coming fight. Meanwhile, fishing for more information, he wondered what Quirrell wanted with the stone. Certainly. I have a special gift with trolls, the troll in the chamber back there was the one I prepared. Unfortunately, while everyone else was running around looking for it, Snape, who already suspected me, went straight to the third floor to head me off, and not only did my troll fail to beat you to death. 
but that three-headed dog didn't even manage to bite Snape's leg off properly. I am still very interested in finding out what you did with both the trolls, as they have disappeared tracelessly. You made me look like quite the fool in front of the school. So once we still have some time, I will enjoy torturing the answer out of you. But first, I need to get the stone. Where is it, Potter? asked Quirrell, staring at Harry. I don't know. It must be somehow protected by this mirror, lied Harry, but suddenly he felt a sharp pain in his head, and a voice spoke without Quirrell moving his lips. He lies. He lies. You are listening to this audiobook on web novel audiobooks Tkthigud. Having realized that something invaded the surface of his mind without even looking into his eyes, Harry did his best to focus on something else, not wanting to give away any more information. Thinking of a way he might be able to protect his mind, he accessed the power of his sacred gear. Maybe I am able to channel power into my mind, but what do I have that could protect it, he thought desperately before his eyes fell onto the mirror of Ariste. Maybe that will work. Channeling the enchantments of his copy of the mirror into his consciousness, a layer of energy formed around it. Not a moment too late. As he felt another intrusion, this time being stopped by the channeled enchantments. The voice from nowhere spoke again, coming from the back of Quirrell's head. Interesting. I've never felt such a way to protect one's mind. It isn't a clemency. Let me speak to him. Face to face. Master, you are not strong enough. I have strength enough. For this. Harry watched as Quirrell reached up and began to unwrap his turban. What was going on? The turban fell away. Quirrell's head looked strangely small without it. Then he turned slowly on the spot. He was shocked by what he was seeing. Where there should have been a back to Quirrell's head, there was a face, the most terrible face Harry had ever seen. It was chalk white with glaring red eyes and slits for nostrils, like a snake. Harry Potter, it whispered. You are Voldemort, realized Harry. Yes, it's me. See what I have become, the face said. Mere shadow and vapor. I have form only when I can share another's body. But there have always been those willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Unicorn blood has strengthened me, these past weeks. Faithful quarrel drinking it for me in the forest. And once I have the elixir of life, I will be able to create a body of my own. Now. Why don't you give me that stone in your pocket? So, that's his goal. He was fast enough with his mind-reading magic to find it out. Hmm, what should I do? I don't feel like I could kill Voldemort here. He seems to have some corrupted form of immortality, and I have no idea how to break it. Revealing my sacred gear right now isn't an option, he is intelligent enough to realize that he could break out of it, and I have no idea how to actually imprison him in such a state, analyzed Harry as he thought of his options. Sorry, I don't think I should give it to suspicious people with two faces. Don't be a fool, snarled the face. Better save your own life and join me. Or you'll meet the same end as your parents. They died begging me for mercy. Harry looked at the disfigured face as if it was an idiot. Yeah, sure, the mass-murdering Dark Lord with a superiority complex would just let me live. Especially after he attacked the home of my parents and me in order to specifically kill me. I have some memories of that night, and it is clear that you wanted to kill me back then. Quirrell was walking backward at him, so that Voldemort could still see him. The evil face was now smiling. It was worth a try. It hissed. I always value bravery. Yes, boy, your parents were brave. I killed your father first, and he put up a courageous fight. But ztcprep.com your mother needn't have died. She was trying to protect you. Now give me the stone unless you want her to have died in vain. Yeah, as if. You may have been powerful with a body. But Quirrell is a joke. Even with you empowering him. Come on, Quirrellmort, come and get it yourself, replied Harry with a serious look on his face. You will regret it, boy, said Voldemort before he ordered, kill the boy. The next moment, Quirrell turned around with his wand in his hand, pointing at Harry. Avada Kedavra, shouted the bald-headed professor as a sickly green lightning flew in Harry's direction. His instincts warned him of life-threatening danger, as Harry jumped to the side, summoning his own wand into his hand. With a green magic circle, a spell formed at the tip of his wand. 
stupefy, and a red projectile shot at the bald wizard. Quirrell simply reflected the spell with the tip of his wand. Quite impressive, Potter, such advanced spells in your first year. And once again, he shot another spell at Harry. This time, the spell had a dangerous yellow color. Harry, with his quick reflexes, had no problem reacting to the spell and dodged without problems. Shit, with simple wizarding magic, I won't be able to beat him. But at the same time, I don't want to reveal too much to Voldemort, he thought. Shooting another stunning spell against the professor to keep him busy, he continued, seems like I have to try to escape. Instantly after he shot his next spell and Quirrell was still distracted, Harry sprinted in the direction of the fire. But unfortunately, the professor was able to react fast enough and used his wand in a circling motion. Accio Philosopher's Stone Feeling a tugging against his pants, a small blood-red stone flew out of his pocket towards Quirrell, who at the same time stretched his hand out to grab it. Turning around, Harry himself grabbed after the stone, trying to catch it again. Both combatants jumped closer to each other, but Harry was able to grab the stone as he was closer to it. But this moment of having to stop was enough for Quirrell to grab the boy's arm. Stay here, boy. Give me the stone, said the bald professor as he grabbed tightly onto the boy, trying to rip the philosopher's stone from his hands. Instinctively, Harry focused on Innovate Clear, feeling the presence of the two trolls inside. He channeled their strength into himself, empowering his own strength. With the boost in his strength, he punched the professor in the face. But while he was using his sacred gear, something strange happened with the philosopher's stone. It was reacting to his sacred gear. The small red stone in his hand became glowing hot, massive amounts of power began flowing from it into his body. Being distracted by this phenomenon, the professor managed to get himself together again. Pointing his wand at the distracted boy, who instantly refocused his attention on the professor, Harry realized that he lost his wand during the grabbing match. Before the professor could even mutter a spell, Harry instinctively aimed his hand at the professor, and a blood-red ray of pure energy formed in his palm and flew at the professor, hitting him in the middle of the chest. Aya! No, master, save me, screamed Quirrell in pure agony as his body began to disintegrate from the ray hitting him all over. The screams of pain became louder and louder as his whole body was destroyed. Meanwhile, the form of Voldemort clinging to him also screamed, No, not again, Potter. Quirrell took his last breath as his whole body turned into ash, and suddenly a dark misty spirit raised from his remains. The dark spirit flew at Harry with an agonizing scream, giving him a dark and cold feeling all over his body as it passed through him, flying through the black flames. So, I was right. Voldemort isn't killable in that form, realized Harry before he had to refocus on his hand. The stone was still glowing hot and gave off red rays of pure energy, destroying everything besides him. Harry realized he had to do something to save himself as the energy was also affecting him. The longer this was going on, the more pure power was released. Having no other choice but to turn to the source of the phenomenon, Harry focused all his willpower and guided the massive amounts of energy the stone was releasing through his body into the universe inside Innovate Clear. Under massive amounts of pain, Harry absorbed every last drop of the energy. Relying on his massive willpower to endure the pain and the destructive forces flowing through his body, until the last drop of power was absorbed, Harry kept a steady focus. When the flow of energy finally stopped, Harry sighed in relief as suddenly a massive wave of exhaustion came over him. I did it. Good, muttered Harry, in relief as his consciousness got blacker and blacker. The last thing he registered was the philosopher's stone in his hand turning to red dust and steps of someone approaching through the black fire before his whole world turned black. Harry landed unconscious on the stony floor of the mirror chamber. Harry Potter slowly regained consciousness, his eyelids fluttering as he groggily blinked his eyes open. As he stirred, he felt a warm and comforting sensation enveloping him from above. Instinctively, his hand reached out to grasp whatever was giving him this soothing feeling. To his surprise, Harry's hand landed on a soft, warm surface. Confused, he looked up and saw Rias with her beautiful crimson red hair leaning over him with a concerned expression. Her small developing chest was inadvertently positioned above Harry's hand, causing him to accidentally touch her breast. Startled, Harry quickly retracted his hand, his face flushing with embarrassment. I I am sorry, he stammered, flustered and apologetic. 
I didn't mean to. I was just trying to find something to hold on to. Rias, realizing it was an innocent accident, chuckled softly and placed a hand on Harry's shoulder, offering him a reassuring smile while a pink blush decorated her cheeks. It's all right, Harry. Accidents happen, she said, her voice filled with kindness. I'm just happy that you woke up. Though the accidental touch brought a momentary awkwardness, Harry was quickly able to think straight again. What happened? Where am I? Harry swallowed and looked around him. He realized he must be in the hospital wing. He was lying in a bed with white linen sheets, and next to him was a table piled high with what looked like half the candy shop. On a chair beside him sat Aquino and Kaneko, who looked at him with relieved expressions. You are in the hospital wing, my boy. All of us were very worried. As for what happened? That's something I would like to learn myself. Turning his head around, Harry saw the ancient form of Dumbledore approaching his bed, his crystal clear blue eyes focused on him while chuckling after witnessing the previous scene. The headmaster was accompanied by Lord Ziodicus Gremory, who looked at Harry with a smile. All I know is that the alarm spells I placed on the third floor corridor went off the moment I arrived there. The shade of Voldemort fled from there, bypassing me as it escaped the school. When I arrived in the chamber, I found you unconscious with the ashes of a person that I suspect is my missing Dada professor, and the destroyed remains of the Philosopher's Stone. Harry remembered what happened in the chamber and caught himself quickly, protecting his mind with the power of the Mirror of Ereast again. He was pretty sure that the headmaster knew how to read minds too, although he didn't believe that he would do it in front of Lord Gremory. Quirrell was possessed by Voldemort. He is still alive. Like some kind of perverted version of a ghost with the ability to possess other living beings, explained Harry quickly. I see. I expected as much when I saw that shade flying by me. Quirinus' condition became stranger and stranger by the week. Please go on. How did you land down there, nodded Dumbledore as Harry confirmed his suspicion about the shade. Thanks to Hagrid, I learned pretty early what was hidden behind the door on the third floor. When he mentioned that it was something between you and Nicholas Flamel, I figured out that it was the Philosopher's Stone that you hid there, Professor. Hagrid also recently told me that he accidentally told someone how to bypass Fluffy. I realized that. How long was I out? Well, after my last exam on Friday, explained Harry, portraying himself as the hero. I couldn't find a teacher that I trusted. The only one I saw was Professor Snape, who was on the list of my suspects along with Quirrell, who was suspicious since the troll incident. So I headed there myself to get the stone and hide it from whoever wanted to steal it. What happened to the stone, Professor, asked Harry, even though he had an idea, as the others listened with interest. Professor Quirrell did not manage to take it from you. During the battle between the two of you, it was destroyed. I found the remains of it beside you, and after analyzing them, I can say without a doubt that they belonged to the Philosopher's Stone. What I am interested in is how this happened. How did you manage to beat Quirrell and Voldemort? And what was the critical mass of energy the wards registered in the chamber? asked the aged professor as he looked at Harry with a serious face. Well, all of that is related to the Philosopher's Stone. When I got it from the mirror, I tried to flee with the stone and almost reached the exit. But at the last moment, Quirrellmort summoned the stone with a spell, explained Harry. He continued when he saw the amused expression of the others present at the name Quirrellmort, I had to stop in order to grab the stone, and that was enough for them to reach me and grab me. In the pulling fight, I lost my wand, and Quirrell was about to send a spell at me. I tried to defend myself, and the philosopher's stone reacted to my instinctive desire for defense. It began to become glowing hot and released a ray of pure energy that destroyed Quirrellmort. After that, Voldemort fled, and I had to endure the power of the stone before I lost consciousness and woke up here. What will happen to the flamels now? Fascinating. I didn't think the stone could have been used in such a manner. Your connection to magic must be really powerful if you could access its power without a medium. Well, Nicholas and I have had a little chat and agreed it's all for the best. They have enough elixir stored to set their affairs in order, and then, yes, they will die, explained Dumbledore. When he saw Harry's sad face, he added, to one as young as you, I'm sure it seems incredible, but to Nicholas and Perinel, it really is like going to bed after a very, very long day. After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. 
Quirrell could just touch you without any trouble, clarified Headmaster Dumbledore with a frown after he let Harry think a bit about the flamel's upcoming death. Yes. Shouldn't he? asked Harry, confused. Normally not. Your mother left a powerful protection on you that should protect you from Voldemort. But it seems to have been completely broken during the incident that led to your disappearance, sighed Dumbledore. I also have to apologize to you. It was me who placed you with the Desleys. Why? Harry asked in a monotone voice, not truly wanting to think back to that time. There were multiple reasons. They were your closest blood relatives, also completely unrelated to anyone in the wizarding world besides your parents. Back then, it was a chaotic time. You couldn't trust anybody. People who were completely trusted before turned out to be traitors. So it was a safe option to protect you from any revenge attempts, explained Dumbledore with a sad look on his face. But most importantly, the protections your mother left on you through a piece of ancient magic could be kept powered by your aunt and cousin and could keep you safe from any outsider wishing you harm. Outsiders, muttered Harry. Yes, unfortunately only outsiders. The protective magic didn't work against your own blood. While I had someone keeping an eye on you in the neighborhood, she couldn't see what was truly going on in the house. She only saw that you weren't the happiest and had to do a lot of housework but seemed fine otherwise. Back then, I made the call to keep you there. I judged the protections more important than a sad childhood. Unfortunately, things were in truth far worse than they looked on the surface. This is my mistake. I still have trouble believing that people could treat their own family that way. I see. I can understand your reasoning, Professor Dumbledore, but I won't forgive you for now. I don't know you enough to tell if you are truly honest with me, explained Harry, while Dumbledore nodded in acceptance, already having expected something like that. Why was Voldemort after me back then? Why shouldn't he be able to touch me? That is something I can't tell you, said Dumbledore, now troubled. Remembering what Sarah Fall said a while ago, Harry asked, why not? Is it a prophecy? So you know that much? Yes, it is indeed a prophecy. But I won't disclose the contents to you. The same way you don't know and truly trust me, the same is it for me and your new guardians. Lord Gremory was able to convince me that you are safe wherever you are staying with them, but I don't trust them enough to disclose such vital information. Even if it's related to you, there is too much involved in this. Harry, since he was reborn, became a person strongly following logic. Although he wanted to know more, he could understand where Dumbledore was coming from. And he didn't say he wouldn't tell him ever. Well, I think we have talked enough for now. How about you take a rest and show your family the school? You have my permission. After Dumbledore said that, the faces of the others brightened up. They had listened closely to the discussion and were troubled by the content, so a tour through the school was a welcome change. Once Harry finally managed to convince Madame Poppy Pomfrey, the matron of the hospital wing, a nice elderly woman but very strict in her job of taking care of her patients, to let him leave since he was fine, his body had completely healed. He had been unconsciously channeling the powers of the trolls when he was knocked out, which were famous for their high vitality. Any burns he sustained from the pure energy of the philosopher's stone had vanished in the process. After reluctantly agreeing that he was healthy, once she performed a few scanning spells, Madame Pomfrey allowed Harry to leave the hospital wing and spend time with his visitors that day. Leading the members of his peerage and Lord Gremory out of the hospital wing, Harry began to guide them down from the first floor, where the hospital wing was located, towards the bottom of the castle, showing them his school, starting with the potion classrooms. His gifts were safely stored inside his sacred gear, except for some chocolates that he gave to Kaneko, who had been eyeing them with interest in the hospital wing. Harry chatted idly with the others as he showed them some of the hidden corridors he had discovered. And what's new at home, he asked casually. Don't think we forgot about the kind of danger you ran into alone. I'm pretty sure you left some things out when you talked with your headmaster, Rhea said sternly, deflecting his attempt to get out of trouble with her. I was worried sick. You weren't answering your phone, no messages from you for days. You were unconscious for a week, Harry. She complained. I'm sorry, Rias. I didn't mean for that to happen. Let's talk about this at home, sometimes the walls have ears, Harry tried to calm her down, while the others also looked at him unhappily. Each one of them was worried about him. 
They came to Hogwarts as soon as they learned that something was wrong, and when they heard he was unconscious, they watched over him for the last two days. This isn't over, Harry. I want to hear the whole story at home. And please, next time, tell us. We are a peerage, a family. Please trust us, whispered Rius with a sad look. Harry could only nod, feeling bad that he had made them worry. But he had planned to just get in, take the stone, and leave without anyone knowing. The one taking the blame was the thief in this case, Quirrell since he couldn't bypass detection magic with the power of the invisibility cloak. That Quirrell would be that fast behind him was a surprise. So, what's new at home? Sighing, Rius replied, I got a new peerage member. His name is Kiba Yudo, and I reincarnated him as my pawn. He has some issues but is generally a nice person. But he wasn't in the right state of mind yet to accompany us. I will introduce you once you return home, she explained with a small smile. Nice, can't wait to meet him. Finally, a bloke to befriend. To be honest, my closest friends are all girls, said Harry jokingly. Era, Era, do you want to say that girls are bad, Harry? Or are you some kind of Casanova, already collecting girlfriends left and right? What a bad boy teased Aquino from the side. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted to say. Nothing against girls. I just wanted to have a guy friend. The others in my house are cool, but our interests don't really align. They mostly talk about Quidditch or other sports, while my interest is in magic. And I am unable to form a real connection with them. Maybe it will be different with Kiba, explained Harry, shaking his hands defensively as the other two girls looked at him with a frown. And the four of them continued to chat casually about the different things going on in the last year, while Lord Gremory accompanied them with a content smile. Harry showed them each floor of the castle, with the important locations like the classrooms, Great Hall, Library, and more, until they finally arrived at the Ravenclaw Common Room. On their way, they met Professor Flittick, and Harry introduced his head of house to Lord Gremory and the others. The small professor, who was excited to meet the people Harry was living with, gave him permission to show them the Ravenclaw Common Room. They arrived at the Ravenclaw Common Room, where Hermione, Daphne, Tracy, and Padma were sitting in one of the reading corners, chatting with each other. Harry's eyes lit up with excitement as he spotted his friends, and he quickly ushered Rius, Kaniko, Aquino, and Ziotikus Gremory forward. Hermione, Daphne, Tracy, I'd like you to meet Lord Ziotikus Gremory, the head of the Gremory family, who took me in and is raising me, Harry introduced, gesturing towards Lord Gremory. Also, this is Rius Gremory, his daughter and heiress, and his other wards, Akino Haimajima and Kaniko Toju, introduced Harry, pointing at each person respectively. Continuing with the introductions, this time with his friends from Ravenclaw, this is Hermione Granger, the brightest witch of our age and one of my closest friends, he said, pointing at the bushy-haired girl who blushed at the introduction. Next, we have Daphne Greengrass, heiress of House Greengrass and an equally bright witch as Hermione, always competing with her for the top spot, he continued, pointing at the blonde-haired girl who bowed politely. Then we have Tracy Davis, another close friend of mine, a retainer of House Greengrass, introduced Harry, before pointing at the brown-skinned girl. And this is my friend Padma Patil, from the Patil family, a noble house from India. All of them are members of Ravenclaw, like me. It's nice to meet all of you. I'm happy that Harry found good friends in Hogwarts. You should really come to visit him one day, greeted Lord Gremory with a polite smile. Followed by Rius, who also looked excited to meet Harry's new friends, nice to meet all of you. Thank you for taking care of Harry in Hogwarts, and especially for keeping him out of trouble most of the time. No problem. We wouldn't have let him leave if we knew he would do something so stupid and end up in the hospital wing for so long, replied Daphne with a nice smile, before looking sternly at Harry, similar to how Rias had looked at him a while ago. Nodding, Hermione also agreed, and thank you for taking Harry in. I'm happy that he found nice people he can live with. Don't worry, Harry is an invaluable part of our family, nodded Lord Gremory, while Kaniko strongly nodded from behind. The group chatted for a while as the four Ravenclaw girls joined them to look at the outside of the castle. Lord Gremory engaged in an interesting conversation with Daphne about the politics in the British wizarding world, while Padma added what she had heard from her father, who recently began to build connections in Britain as the Patil family wanted to expand their business ventures. 
In this manner, they spent the day pleasantly before the Gremories had to leave for the underworld. The school year wasn't over yet, and Harry would see them in a few weeks, the last few days of the school year passed in the blink of an eye as the summer days got warmer and warmer. Hermione, Daphne, Tracy, and the other Ravenclaw first years watched Harry carefully so he wouldn't get in trouble or seriously hurt again. Him being in basically a coma for almost a week shook them deeply. Harry was really flattered by their worries, but at the same time, it annoyed him a bit. He had no real opportunity to be alone and check the inside of his sacred gear. Through his connection with Innovate Clear, he could clearly feel that the energy of the Philosopher's Stone was still there. All his things, animals, magical creatures, and plants were fine and unaffected. There was just a mass of energy floating around. Since everyone was watching him, he couldn't actually enter and see what he could do with it or what it truly was. He was sure that if he studied the remains of the energy closer, he could get a deeper understanding of what the Philosopher's Stone actually was. During his fight with Quirrell, he hadn't had the presence of mind to create a copy in his sacred gear, although he was sure that it wouldn't have worked since the stone seemed to have been a mass of energy, something he couldn't create. Well, it would have probably been expensive and beyond his capacity, as he didn't have such massive amounts of energy like the stone released to concentrate into another stone. It was Satan-level amounts, if not beyond. He wasn't really sure since he had never felt this amount before, but he felt ultimate level reserves that his teacher had and Lord Gremory. Anyway, he couldn't enter Innovate Clear since everyone was keeping an eye on him, even the boys. They would even check whether he was really in his bed sleeping. He was sure the girls put them up to it. Another uncomfortable and slightly painful encounter Harry had was with Hagrid. The lovable half-giant was blaming himself for this whole event, especially that Harry got hurt. In his eyes, it was his fault since he told Quirrell how to bypass Fluffy. Harry had to invest quite a bit of time to calm Hagrid down, who in the end enveloped him in a strong hug. Harry was sure that if he wasn't strengthened by his devil physiology, he would have spent a night in the hospital wing again. But one nice thing that he got out of it was another album of photos of his parents, this time even more personal ones, as Hagrid contacted old friends of his parents to collect them. In such a manner, the last days of the school year passed by, and the end of the year feast approached, getting all the students excited to visit their homes again and enjoy the free time of the summer holidays. Harry was also excited to return to the underworld, he had quite a few plans for the summer. He was also sure that if he were still living with the Desleys, he would have begged Dumbledore to spend the summer at Hogwarts. The Great Hall was adorned with Ravenclaw colors of blue and bronze, a vibrant display celebrating Ravenclaw's dominance in the House Cup race. A grand banner depicting the majestic Ravenclaw eagle adorned the wall behind the high table. As Harry entered the Great Hall, a sudden hush fell upon the room, followed by a cacophony of whispered conversations as everyone had heard some kind of rumors about what supposedly happened. Taking his seat between Daphne and Hermione at the Ravenclaw table, he tried to ignore the curious gazes fixed upon him. Fortunately, Dumbledore arrived, and the noise subsided instantly. The headmaster's cheerful voice resonated throughout the hall. Another year has come to a close. But before we indulge in our delicious feast, allow me to share a few words. What a remarkable year it has been. I hope your minds are fuller than ever. And have the whole summer to empty them before the next year begins. Now, as it is time to award the House Cup, let us review the current standings, in fourth place, Gryffindor, with 312 points, in third, Hufflepuff, with 352, Ravenclaw has surged ahead with 426, and Slytherin follows closely with 425. It was no wonder that Ravenclaw was in first place, even with all the favoritism from Snape. Ravenclaw always earned a ton of points with their good schoolwork, but with first years like Hermione, Daphne, and Harry, who even though he himself didn't really care about house points, he still earned a ton of them with his excellent schoolwork. The other first years couldn't simply compare. So with the strong natural work ethic in school from Ravenclaw's and domination in the first year, Ravenclaw reached the first spot, even though just closely as Snape still tried to manipulate things. There were grumbles and whispers from Slytherin as they felt they should have won, that the unfair manipulation of the system from Snape was the only reason they came so close didn't come into their minds. This was really a good representation of the traditional pure-blood mentality that established itself in the wizarding world. Cough, Dumbledore cleared his throat. I have a few last-minute points to allocate. For Mr. Harry Potter, 
for wearing such a nice tie today, I award 150 points to House Ravenclaw. Announced Dumbledore before he began to clap as the hall followed in confusion whether he was serious, and Harry had to blush in embarrassment as people were looking at his tie trying to find out what was so special about it. Just joking with all of you. It's, of course, for his brilliant tactical skill in the game of chess, the sharp mind and calm logic in the face of danger, and the outstanding courage to stand up to danger to do the right thing. And now this should solve any confusion about who is truly the winner of the House Cup this year. And the Great Hall broke out in jubilation as they celebrated the finally broken streak of the last six years of Slytherin winning the House Cup. Although they still won the Quidditch Cup, as nobody could outplay their stretching of the rules on the field with pure skill. With this, the year concluded, and every first year passed the school year. At the top of the class was Harry, closely followed by Hermione who only lost to him in the practical exams as he could get their bonus points for skills beyond his age, and she even outdid him in the history of magic exam. In third place came Daphne who did an excellent job of keeping up with Hermione and Harry in all her grades, and only missed slightly a few points here and there. They enjoyed a nice travel with the Hogwarts Express back to London. On their way back, Harry gave them the address to a postbox in the headquarters of the new Gremory business in Diagon Alley. They would send all his post back to the underworld to him since owls couldn't reach him there, and he still wanted to keep contact with his friends. After greeting his friend's parents who were picking them up, Harry left through the Flu network back to the new hotel of the Gremory family in Diagon Alley. From there, he took a teleportation circle home as he got special permission. The moment Harry's teleportation circle stopped glowing, he found himself standing in the spacious entrance hall of the Gremory mansion in the underworld. Not a minute later, Rias, Aquino, and Kaneko arrived in the hall, followed by a boy. Welcome home, Harry, greeted Rias, pulling him into a hug. Her crimson hair tickled his nose as he enjoyed her warmth. Shortly after, Kaneko and even Aquino also hugged him in welcome. Thank you, it's good to be home, nodded Harry with a bright smile before turning to the unfamiliar boy. He was quite handsome, even though his face still had a boyish look. He had blonde hair, blue eyes, and a mole below his left eye. He appeared to be around their age, maybe a year younger or a bit older than Kaneko. Hello, I am Harry Potter, the pawn of Rias Peerage. But you can call me Harry. You must be Kiba, it's nice to meet you. Seeing the outstretched hand, Kiba hesitated for a moment before grabbing and shaking it, as the deaths of his friends were still fresh in his mind. Hello, Harry. It's nice to finally meet you. I am Kiba Yudo, the new knight of Rias. With you, I have finally met all the current members of the peerage. Harry noticed that Kiba was still quite uncomfortable and had his own issues, just like any other member of the peerage. So he shifted the attention from Kiba and began asking them what they did while he was away, and shared his own experiences during the year, this time in person instead of through text messages. He also met the other members of the Gremory family during dinner, who welcomed him back, including little Milikas, the son of Sirzex and Grafia, who was still a toddler. He had a nice first day of the summer holidays, chatting and hanging out with the others, recovering from the stress of the school year, after bidding goodnight to the others, Harry entered his room and summoned an invigoration draft from inside his sacred gear. He gulped it down, boosting his energy level so he could spend part of the night doing something useful. He also stocked up on some useful potions for the summer in Diagon Alley before teleporting to the underworld. During his nightly visits to the library of Hogwarts, he realized that he had no problem with mental fatigue as a devil, for some reason. The time he could spend awake was only limited by his body's stamina. Discovering this made him realize that if he could boost his stamina, he could spend more time doing something useful. So, after looking for a suitable potion, he found the Invigoration Draft, a fifth-year potion. Since he hadn't tried brewing it yet, and potions weren't his greatest talent, although he was more advanced than most others, he decided to buy enough for the summer in Diagon Alley. He also made sure to buy a stock of the necessary ingredients so he could attempt to brew the draft himself. Whether he would succeed was something he wasn't sure about yet. In potions, he was advanced in theory, but in the practical part, he had only followed the first-year curriculum as he experimented with other magic. He also bought all the necessary seeds for the plants that were part of the ingredients for these drafts. Unfortunately, it was quite hard to get living magical animals in Diagon Alley, so he couldn't buy any billywig stings, which were an ingredient of the draft. 
Since they were native to Australia, capturing some would be quite the detour for now and not fitting for his summer plans. So he had to stock up on dried billywig stings. Refreshed and filled with energy, Harry entered the universe inside Innovate Clear for the first time since the battle for the Philosopher's Stone. The instant he stepped onto the ground floor of his tower, he could feel the change in the atmosphere. It felt chaotic and energized, a strange feeling. Even though he wasn't outside, he could sense the energy pulsating through the space. Walking toward one of the windows and looking outside, he could now clearly see the change. The sky was no longer the calm natural blue he had decided on, as he wasn't powerful enough yet to create a natural weather cycle. Instead, it was a strange, pulsating red and white. Millions of white wisps, like shades, flowed chaotically through the sky around his entire planet, radiating red energy waves and tinting the sky red. It looked very different from the red beam of pure energy that the stone had released, but it was far calmer and no longer destructive. At the same time, it didn't feel like pure energy anymore, it was something else. And no, that energy didn't vanish, it changed. Is this the natural state of the energy that was crystallized in the Philosopher's Stone? Where did Flamel find this, wondered Harry as he left the safety of his tower and observed the light show in the sky. Stretching the palm of his hand out, Harry guided one of the flying wisps into the palm of his hand with the natural control and authority he had inside his sacred gear. What are you? Observing the warm glowing orb in his hand, he closed his eyes and focused on it. With his natural authority, he began to feel what exactly made up this thing. He could feel that it was made of some form of energy, but there was more. The deeper he forced his will into the red glowing orb, the more he could feel something like emotions, strong emotions like hate, resentment, pain, anger, agony, and sorrow. This is a soul. All of them are souls. I have millions of souls inside my sacred gear now, resentful souls full of pain and regret. What did Nicholas Flamel do? Did he kill all of them to create the Philosopher's Stone? After confirming that each of the orbs flying through the sky was a soul filled with negative emotions, he made an approximate calculation of how many there were. He counted over 20 million souls, far, far more people than most Dark Lords killed in the history of the Wizarding World. The only Dark Lord who actually surpassed this headcount was Grindelwald, who played a major part in causing the Second World War from the shadows. The headcounts of other Dark Lords were maybe in the thousands to hundreds of thousands. Now the only question swirling through Harry's head was, is Nicholas Flamel the greatest Dark Lord in the history of the Wizarding World? Of course, Harry didn't care whether he was truly evil or something. He was a devil, after all, and his moral compass turned grey the moment he became one. He was strongly affected by his own sins, like pride, wrath, lust, greed, gluttony, envy, and sloth. He may be interested in keeping the people close to him safe and neutralizing his enemies before they could harm him, but he wasn't a hero. The only thing he cared about regarding Flamel was how he did it, how he remained undetected, and what Harry could gain from it. The knowledge behind it was definitely worth pursuing. Dumbledore didn't seem evil or like a fool who would fall for a dark lord, so maybe there was a way to harvest souls before a death god did. But for that, he had to do some research first. And most importantly, did he just get spoiled about Full Metal Alchemist? Harry's library at this point was impressive. It contained around 70% of the regular Hogwarts library and almost the whole restricted section. He hadn't completely added it yet as it was a ton of books. He also added his own collection of books and manga. He even created a section for different pop culture works like movies, series, and anime. Rias had simply managed to hook him on that stuff. One of his future plans was to get a cinema inside his tower so he could enjoy the entertainment completely. Also, he would add the Gremory Library to his collection this summer. Once Harry confirmed the birth year of Nicholas Flamel in multiple history books that he copied at Hogwarts, he discovered that Nicholas Flamel was born between 1300 and 1326. Even the historians in the Wizarding World had multiple different sources that provided different dates but agreed on that time frame. He began using his laptop to research any mass deaths in Europe around that time. It didn't take him long to figure out the fitting event, as there was one historical event that affected the world massively. The Black Death caused havoc from 1346 to 1353, resulting in a massive tally of deaths. Historians and scientists estimated the death count between 75 million to 200 million in Eurasia. 
They arrived at this estimate by researching agricultural changes from pollen samples originating from that time. Since the numbers didn't completely fit with the slightly over 20 million souls minus the ones already used, Harry concluded that either flamel caused the plague and the method for harvesting the souls wasn't perfect, and most of them were normally harvested by the death gods. Or another option was that flamel wasn't the cause of the plague and just used the opportunity to harvest some souls for the philosopher's stones. In either case, the souls would have passed on to the afterlife after their energy was used up in the stone, and the death gods wouldn't have cared enough since they still were in their domain. But now it was different. Harry, having learned about gods, knew that they protected their respective domains vehemently, especially death gods with their souls since they would be powered up by them. Now the twenty million souls left their domains by entering a different universe, falling under Harry's control. Although twenty million was less than the number of people who died every year at present, it was still a noticeable amount. So he had to hope that they simply forgot about them, or they couldn't track the disappearance to him. Anyway, he didn't plan to release them. This was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. Not only did 20 million souls provide an amazing amount of energy for Harry to use and expand the universe inside his sacred gear, but they were also souls he could use to create living beings who would create more souls. Currently, his universe followed the same universal laws as the universe he lived in. He didn't have enough power to change them. Living beings would create completely fresh souls when they gave birth to new living beings. Unfortunately, that didn't work for simple-minded animals, as their souls were too fragile to exist. They would disperse, releasing a bit of energy into the universe, but that's it. But these were human souls, which had good quality for souls. He could create humans with them and use them as energy substitutes for other creations. With them, he could finally put one of his more advanced plans into motion. Well, plan was a big word. It was just an idea that he had for a while. He wasn't really sure if it would work, but it was supposed to allow him to create anything that he could think of inside. So even things that he got inspired by in a manga, for example. Now that he had human souls, he could create actual humans. They would reproduce and create more humans. Each of them emitted life force into the environment, which would expand his energy reserves. At their death, they would leave a soul for him to use again. But what if each of them was born with a gate of truth? Harry had multiple ideas on how to exploit his sacred gear, and he was only limited by the amount of demonic power or energy he had available to realize these ideas. And one of these ideas was based on the Full Metal Alchemist manga, The Gate of Truth, to be precise. Not a gate filled with alchemical knowledge. He probably could make it work inside Innovate Clear but not outside of it. No, a gate filled with knowledge on magic, science, and more. Knowledge was power after all. Why not exploit his sacred gear to gain a lot of knowledge? His idea was pretty simple. He would create a main gate of truth inside himself where all his knowledge would be stored and directly connected to his brain. Each human born in his universe would receive a lower version of the gate of truth, where all the knowledge they gained would also be added to the main gate. With that, he would be able to let others learn for him and even research new magic or knowledge. But to establish that plan, he had to renovate a bit. After all, he didn't want to share his own stuff with the new inhabitants. In order to make amazing gains, he would have to invest a part of the souls. It's not like he would get them back after some time. Unfortunately, he couldn't change the fundamental laws of the universe yet. Yes, he could temporarily accelerate time, but this also used up his energy. For now, he could only do it for a few minutes, and he couldn't do it permanently with his current energy reserves. But he felt it was possible to fundamentally change this universe or even just parts of it, like the flow of time or how gravity worked, and stuff like that. It would have been amazing if he could just accelerate time in here and let the humans reproduce quickly, giving him more souls. But well, it didn't matter right now. With a wave of his hand, Harry disappeared from his library and arrived in the swamp area, in front of his familiar lair, to be precise. Hey, Noir. Wake up, he called out. The small black snake wasn't quite that small anymore. It had grown to a length of three meters over the last year, an impressive growth for a magical animal with a lifespan of thousands of years. But apparently, Noir felt that this was nothing, and he still considered himself in his infant stage. With a yawn, the black-scaled snake opened its eyes. Morning, Harry. What brings you here, 
asked the young snake lazily. Not much, just wanted to inform you that I will move this island to another place. I need to renovate a bit for new inhabitants. But I don't want to share my stuff with them or accidentally hurt you in the future, explained Harry with a smile as he scratched the head of the small snake. No problem, boss. But what brings the change? Didn't you say you weren't strong enough yet for anything major, asked Noir, confused as he tilted his head. Yeah, still am. But I got an amazing external source of power to use. Well, I snatched it since the original owner didn't want to have it anymore, grinned Harry before he left, the snake appearing in the sky above his small planet. In the sky above his planet, Harry stretched his hands out and focused. With so much energy available, he could complete his idea in one night instead of doing it bit by bit with his small reserves. Additionally, he already had the most important part to create intelligent life ready, the soul. This was the part he understood the least and took massive amounts of energy for his current self to create. But first, he had to do something with the negative emotions that clung to the souls. If he created new life forms with them, he wanted them to be like newborns unaffected by their previous lives. Emotions were also energy, and his sacred gear didn't care what form of energy it used, but it couldn't create energy out of nothing. He couldn't simply transform his demonic power into negative or positive emotions, life force, or any other form of energy. So it would be a waste to use this specific form of energy he had a bit of for this project if he didn't have any way to create more in the near future. The souls would regenerate over time, but for negative emotions, he would have to create a mechanism that caused and harvested them in the new life forms he would create. Since he didn't have a plan to do something like this in the near future, he decided to store the energy from the emotions for now. Therefore, he had to create a few additional dimensions that he could transform into completely different planes in the future as part of his universe. Harry had already roughly calculated how many souls he would need to create one dimension, approximately one million souls per dimension. He needed at least three different dimensions. Focusing, Harry invested three million souls in creating three separate dimensions that were completely empty at the moment but separated from the main space where the main planet was floating. For the first dimension, he separated the energy of the negative emotions from the souls, leaving them in a pure state, and stored them there. If he were to enter that dimension, he could feel the effects of the emotions, putting him in a dark state of mind or even uncontrollable rage. Using a bit of his demonic energy, he turned the second dimension into a sunny place with a nice blue sky, similar to the main dimension but without the day-night cycle. Next, he levitated the important islands and sent them into that dimension, letting them float in the middle of it. The islands he sent there were his tower, Moir's biotope, the troll biotope, Norberta's island, and his garden. These were all islands with things he brought from the outside that he hadn't yet had enough to include in the main dimension or were his belongings that he wanted to keep with him. Luckily, the trolls were male and female. The larger one he found in the mirror chamber was male, and the smaller one that attacked them in the bathroom was female. Besides their body size, there wasn't much difference in their appearance. But with some luck, they would reproduce in the future, and he could send some of them into the main dimension. Lastly, all that was left was the third dimension, which would become the most important part of his plan. It would be named the Dimension of Truth, where the main gate of truth connected to him was located. Currently, it was a vast empty white space. Harry imagined all the functions he wanted his gate to have and began to create it as the souls began to be consumed at a rapid speed. Firstly, the gate had to be connected to himself, acting as a storage extension for all his knowledge. Having it as an extra storage was important so that his brain would never be overloaded with all the additional knowledge in the future. Next, he created an artificial spirit from a soul connected to his subconsciousness, which would maintain the gate and all its functions with limited authority. Essentially, it was an emotionless AI that would solve problems and manage this dimension while asking Harry for important decisions. He gave the spirit, which he would call truth from now on, the task and ability to create a subgate of truth for any newborn being in the main dimension. These subgates would have the following tasks, adding all the things the being with a gate of truth learned to the main gate belonging to Harry. Once the being with the gate died, it would open, swallow the soul, and transport it to the dimension of truth before the subgate dispersed and fused with the main gate. Additionally, there were some small functions that Harry could activate, like forcefully giving them new knowledge if he ever wanted to inspire them to study new stuff. With that, he had a system in place that allowed him to learn a lot of new things without having to do it himself, 
and it only cost him 5 million souls, leaving him with slightly more than 12 million remaining. All that was left was to create the first civilization responsible for studying. Landing back in the main dimension and observing the planet, all that was left were a few relatively empty islands with a bit of vegetation. First, he created a massive continent located in the middle of the different islands. In the center of that continent, he created a rudimentary city with enough housing for a few million people. He also placed warehouses there with tools, food, clothes, and similar items so that they had their basic necessities covered from the start. In the center of the city, he placed a stone building, a large library modeled after the Great Library of Alexandria, with a copy of his own library. He omitted the manga and other stuff for now, but he planned to add more books in the future. Next, he populated the rest of the continent with plants, animals, and natural resources. The city was surrounded by lush forests with many berry bushes, mushrooms, and other harvestable food sources. Multiple plains, ideal for constructing farms, were also nearby. Having invested a few million souls to create the basics of this civilization, all that was left was the people themselves. He modeled them after wizards, allowing them to learn wand magic, although they didn't have the materials for wands yet. But there were other possibilities to use magic, and the knowledge of how magicians practice magic was also available in the library. He created an equal number of women and men, making them similar to humans, wizards, and witches from his own world. But he gave them an inherent desire to learn and discover as part of their natural instinct. Whether it was science or magic, they would pursue all of it. Since the natural laws were the same as in the outside world, Harry would be able to use anything they learned. Finishing up, he placed the five million unconscious people all over the city and used the small gates of truth that his spirit, truth, had given them to impart basic knowledge like language, writing, numbers, information on food, hunting, growing, and, lastly, what the library contained. Now they had everything they needed, and Harry was left with less than one million souls, which he sent back into the truth dimension so that it could be used to keep the system running. Once the first people began to wake up, he disappeared from inside his sacred gear and arrived in his room. It was in the middle of the night, and he was exhausted. Phew, with that done, it's finally time to sleep, he muttered as he fell into his bed, once the first people began to wake up, he disappeared from inside his sacred gear and arrived in his room. It was in the middle of the night, and he was exhausted. Phew, with that done, it's finally time to sleep, he muttered as he fell into his bed, the civilization inside his sacred gear began to develop splendidly, having imparted enough knowledge that they realized they would need to cover their basic needs quickly. Harry's worry about them starving stopped quickly. Although they were freshly born without much knowledge, they quickly began to split into different groups, beginning to plan out a supply chain. While the food inside the storehouses would hold them afloat for a few months, they began foraging the surrounding forest for edibles on the first day in order to stretch their existing resources. They also began to explore the surrounding areas. After discovering the plains, they sent a group to set up a farming operation on it. For now, everything was going fine, and Harry could focus on other things. Meanwhile, the acquisition of new knowledge was very slow as they were only in the early stages of discovering magic, far behind anything Harry had already learned. But with millions of people studying magic, a few small tricks were discovered that were unfamiliar to the boy. Of course, with the current setup, the diversity of discoveries would be limited, but at least he had someone who could study all the books for him while he could focus on other things. After all, this planet was missing seasons, climate diversity, weather, biological diversity, a lot of magical animals, natural wonders, and more. He, of course, was planning to obtain and create more of that, but it took more energy than he had available, and also time. Notable gains would take time, but Harry wasn't in a hurry right now. He was confident that he would unlock how to fasten time in his sacred gear rather sooner than later, and then all this would accelerate. For now, he had other things to focus on, like lessons, especially the ones from Graphia. DXD, 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 DXD. The whole peerage, including Kiba, was gathered in one of the reading rooms connected to the library. This was the room where they usually had classes together before Harry left for Hogwarts. Graphia, this time, stood in front of them, wearing her typical maid outfit with a strict look. Good, now that all of you are present today, and Harry is also at home, we can finally talk about one of the most important aspects in the life of a devil, 
nodded Grafia as she looked at them, satisfied with their punctuality. Harry also didn't seem to have forgotten her lessons on etiquette that she taught him during his absence. Today, I will teach you about devil contracts. She directly dropped to get their attention. Contracts are one of the most important ways for a devil to gain power and standing in the underworld. There are two types of contracts. The first type is the common deals that you make with another party, usually humans. First, you have to complete your side of the deal. In exchange, you get something of value that you have determined previously and their excess soul power, which will make you slowly stronger. But it is really minuscule, and you need to complete a lot of contracts to truly feel it. Early on, it will be more noticeable, explained Grafia as all of them listened until Kiba raised his hand. What about souls? Don't devils deal in souls? That is at least a common perception, asked Kiba worriedly as he felt uncomfortable about taking other souls. Even though the church betrayed him, he doesn't want to harm normal humans. Dealing in souls is an ancient practice from the time of the original Satans. We no longer do this, as it always gave devilkind a bad image among the other factions. Even though the standard practice was taking the soul after the contractor died, many devils are greedy by nature and tricked many humans into their deaths directly after the deal was completed. So it is now forbidden by law, and if you should get found out, you will be prosecuted, explained Grafia seriously. The first step to being able is to create your own unique summoning circle. With that, your contractor will be able to summon you directly. We also have the Gremory Summoning Circle. Rias will have her own and will manage that. Through that one, a summoning request can be sent, and she can decide who among you is most fitting for that task and be assigned to it. Then you can travel through the Gremory Circle to that target. You will be required to complete a certain quota as you are employed by the Gremory family and part of Rias' peerage. 25% of your income will belong to Rias, the rest is yours to keep, continued Grafia. This time Harry raised his hand. What about our personal circle? Will we be required to share our profits from them, he asked, interested. No, they are basically part of what you do in your free time. All you earn through them is your own. You will still gain more power through them and renown in devil society. As part of the main family's peerage, you also won't be required to do many tasks, and it's mostly your free choice, added Grafia with a nod. I will show you later how you create your own personal summoning circle and leaflets for it. For now, let's talk about the other kind of devil contract. These are contracts you make with a magician. These are packs of mutual benefits, since both sides gain renown if they form one with a famous and powerful magician or devil. Both sides will have to assist and protect each other, and they are also used to exchange knowledge. At that, Harry's eyes lit up. This sounds useful. I could gain access to the libraries of different magician organizations. With my copy of the Hogwarts library, I have quite a lot to exchange, he realized. These are the two kinds of contracts you can make. I will now show you how to create your own summoning circle. Grafia spent the next hour guiding them in the creation of a summoning circle connected to them. Once they completed that and tried them out, she showed them how to usually bring them among humans. First was the more modern variant of a summoning leaflet where a small part of their magic was stored, so they could be activated anytime. She also showed them how the more traditional summoning worked through a circle drawn onto the floor or a surface powered by a sacrifice, although it wasn't used as often anymore. Okay, good work, nodded Grafia as she saw that all of them had grasped the concept of summoning circles. If you want to learn more about summoning magic in general, we have quite a few tomes in the library that can help you out. If you want some recommendations, ask me later, and I will show them to you. Tomorrow, each of you will complete your first contract. Lord Gremory was so friendly to prepare an easy request with humans for you. This will show you how this whole process works, and you will experience it for yourself. She finished, dismissing them for the rest of the day to enjoy the warmth of summer. In a dimly lit room, Emily sat on the floor with a mixture of hope and skepticism. She held a small flyer in her hands. On it was an obscure circle with multiple strange symbols. It had arrived mysteriously in her mailbox, and curiosity got the best of her. On its backside was a small and short manual on how the summoning worked. Having discovered its purpose, Emily thought it was worth a shot and decided to give it a try. Emily whispered, tracing her finger along the summoning circle, if there's any truth to this. 
if it can really help me find my lost wedding ring. I'm willing to give it a chance. As Emily finished tracing the summoning circle, a soft shimmering light filled the room as it began to glow, and she watched in awe as a young dark-haired boy materialized in the room. He had a curious look on his face. With a polite smile, Harry introduced himself, having already learned her name through the magic of the summoning. Good day, Emily. I am Harry. It seems you have summoned me. What can I do for you? Emily began stammering, oh, goodness, you are real. I didn't think this would actually work. B but what kind of devil is called Harry, she wondered in confusion. I am, chuckled Harry, not expecting such a question. We have all kinds of names in the underworld. And my parents decided to call me Harry. Eh, sorry. I didn't want to. Well, laugh at your name, she apologized, embarrassed. Don't worry. Harry is really a strange name for a devil. Well, what can I do for you, asked Harry, eager to complete his first contract. Having calmed down, Emily asked, so. You can help me find my lost wedding ring? I am looking everywhere for it, but I can't find it. My husband is coming home tomorrow, and I don't want to have to explain that I lost it. It must be here somewhere. But. What's the catch? What do you want in return? At the last question, she was nervous again, having heard stories about devils taking souls and tricking people. If the ring truly was here, this task wouldn't be hard for Harry to complete. The question was just what he should ask for in return. No need to be nervous. It's a wise question to ask, especially with the many prejudices being widespread in the public folklore. But things work a bit differently these days, explained Harry as he looked around the room, having seen the TV with a gaming console with multiple games, including some RPGs, it's like a typical quest in a video game, just that you had to summon me first. You give me the task, I decide whether I can complete it. Next, I ask what I want for it, which can be money, some of your possessions, or even a favor, but souls are forbidden for devils to trade. Once we both agree that the deal is fair, I complete the task, and after that, I get my quest reward. So far so good. Nodding and grasping the concept, Emily asked, so what do you want in exchange? It's not that hard to complete, but it still did cost a bit of my time. Since this is in the US, I want $50 if the ring should be inside the house, and $200 if I have to get it from the outside. Sounds fair, asked Harry, unsure whether he was asking for too much. But for Emily, it was no problem. It was totally worth it to get something of such emotional importance back. She agreed, yes, that's fine. I just want to have my ring back. Okay, then I will complete the task. Can you describe the ring to me, or do you have a photo of it? Knowing what it looks like would make it easier, explained Harry as Emily pulled out her phone, showing him a picture of the wedding day with her wearing the ring. She also told him there was an inscription on the inside. Having memorized the round golden form with simple decorations and the inscription, Harry focused while putting his hand out as a magic circle formed in his hand. Accio Emily's Wedding Ring Harry felt his spell succeed, and they didn't have to wait long as the golden ring flew through the door from the kitchen into the outstretched hand of the young devil. There it is, your wedding ring. You seem to have dropped it while doing dishes. Thank you. Thank you, said Emily as she hugged the boy. You have saved me so much trouble. Once the ring was safely back on her finger, she got her purse and pulled a stack of bills out of it, handing him one hundred dollars. That's too much. It really wasn't that hard, tried Harry to reject, but Emily wouldn't hear of it. For me, it was very important. So please take it. You have more than earned it, she decided vehemently. Accepting the money, Harry said goodbye with a small bow before activating the reverse summoning circle, returning to the underworld. Summonings were an exception from the rules, and they could directly travel from and to the underworld without any special permissions necessary. With the glow of the magic circle, Harry arrived back in the conference room, where he left from for his contract. Besides Graphia, who sent them off, Rias was also present, having completed her task before him. Welcome back, Harry, chirped the crimson-haired girl happily as she saw Harry return. Did you complete your contract? Did everything go well? asked Graphia, eyeing him curiously. Harry nodded at their question, showing them the small stack of dollar bills. 
Yes, these are my earnings from the deal. Seeing the small stack of money, Grafia nodded in approval. Not bad for a first-time deal. You earned even more than Riyasama. TCH, Grafia, how often do I have to tell you, stop calling me Sama. It's Rias. R.A.S. We are family, there is no need for any special treatment, at least in private. Don't call me Lady Rias or Riyasama or similar, complained Rias before turning to Harry. So what did your contractor want from you? She lost her wedding ring and needed me to find it for her. I could complete the task easily with a simple object summoning charm. And what about you, he asked, interested. Now Rias got a small blush on her cheeks. Well, my contractor was some really muscular buff guy. Definitely a bodybuilder. Okay, what is so special about it? Did he want something perverted from you? Harry questioned with killing intent radiating from him. No, 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 nothing like that. It was just such a hilarious situation I was summoned into, and a bit embarrassing for my first contract ever. The really muscular guy stood on a chair crying for help in his kitchen because there was a cockroach in his kitchen, she explained, shaking her head and laughing. What, deadpan Harry? He was crying the whole time in fear, not daring to climb down from his chair while we were deciding on the details of the deal. In the end, I took his dumbbells he was training with and wiped the cockroach from existence with my power of destruction, she explained, pointing at a set of dumbbells on the floor, making Harry laugh. Once Harry stopped laughing, they waited for the others to finish their contracts, who returned one by one. Having completed their deals, the lesson for the day ended, and they were free to go. From the balcony of their lavish suite at Hotel Le Narcisse Blanc, Harry Potter gazed upon the breathtaking sight before him. Paris, the city of lights, sprawled beneath the azure sky. The Eiffel Tower dominated the view, its majestic form reaching for the heavens. Harry marveled at its grandeur, a testament to human ambition. As his eyes wandered, Paris unfolded in all its splendor. Elegant boulevards, charming cafés, and historic buildings painted a vibrant tapestry. Across the Seine River stood the Regal Louvre Museum, beckoning with its treasures. The air carried tantalizing aromas of pastries and blooming flowers. Harry imagined savoring the city's culinary delights, indulging in macarons and espresso. But it was the atmosphere that truly enchanted him. Paris hummed with an energy that blended history, art, and romance. It was a place where dreams thrived and love stories unfolded. Though he considered himself too young for love stories, Harry was eager to explore the wonders of the city with his own eyes. At first glance, Paris appeared as an amazing city teeming with life and culture. Many beautiful sights to visit and a rich history to explore. During Harry's holidays, he, Rias, Aquino, Kaniko, and Kiba decided to travel somewhere after completing their necessary lessons. The Gremory family owned several hotels worldwide, including the one they were currently staying in Paris. Over the summer, Harry also completed his lessons with McGregor for these holidays, who provided useful pointers to enhance his understanding of magic. McGregor was impressed with Harry's progress and the unique style of magic he was developing. One particular ability fascinated Harry and his teacher, the power to channel the energy of objects and living beings inside Innovate Clear. Initially, he could only tap into their energies with special properties like fire and poison, enhancing the power of his spells. However, during the battle with Quirrell, he discovered his ability extended beyond mere energy manipulation. He could channel the powers and abilities of beings such as trolls, including their strength, regeneration, and magic resistance. This ability also extended to the mirror and the invisibility cloak. Through experimentation, they discovered that the conversion rate of this power was not yet perfect. A significant amount of power was lost in the process. Currently, Harry could only channel 10% of a living being's power, but he could fully harness the power of a not-living object. They were unsure why the amount was lower with living beings, maybe because they had a will of their own or some form of natural restedance, but they anticipated improvement as Harry grew more accustomed to his sacred gear. Awakening his balance breaker remained a goal for the future. And a clear sign that he reached high level of mastery with his sacred gear. The possibilities this ability offered were formidable. With sufficient energy, Harry could create anything he could imagine inside Innovate Clear. The vast world of fictional works, mangas, movies, books, and more, 
provided him with a vast arsenal of new ideas to exploit his sacred gear. The Gate of Truth one of his first ideas worked wonderful, continuing to provide valuable knowledge, expanding Harry's understanding of basic magic. Although not groundbreaking, it significantly deepened his foundation in magic, despite only working on it for less than a month. The human population also began fulfilling their basic needs themselves by raising animals such as chickens, cows, sheep, and pigs, while the first quick-growing plants yielded their initial harvests. Another intriguing topic was Harry's invisibility cloak, inherited from his father. When he showed it to his teacher, he sensed its connection to a death god's divinity. However, his teacher couldn't reveal the creator's identity. It was likely someone from a forgotten pantheon in England, many of whom perished during or as a result of the Great War. In the meantime, Rias and her peerage decided to spend the remaining summer in France until Harry's Hogwarts letter arrived, signaling his return to London and his meeting with friends. Each member of the peerage had their own desired destinations in Paris the French capital, leading to several days of exploration and sightseeing. They visited renowned places such as the Louvre and the top of the Eiffel Tower, indulged in shopping at the city's famous fashion boutiques. Aquino and Rias took it upon themselves to outfit the other three members with new outfits. Although it was a taxing experience for Harry, he didn't complain. The two of them were having especially a lot of fun, and Rias, with her boundless resources, covered the expenses. Harry was in a comfortable financial situation himself, thanks to his allowance from the Gremories and his inheritance from the most noble and most ancient house of Potter, but some of the prices on the clothes still made him visibly gulp. Shopping in Paris was expensive. Harry, are you ready? Rias asked, impatiently knocking on the door of his room in the shared suite of the peerage. Startled, Harry snapped out of his thoughts and headed to the door. Yes, I'm coming, he replied, leaving his room entering the shared hallway. Rias, with her beautiful and excited face, awaited him. Her crimson hair moving up and down as she was bobbing in excitement. She wasn't the only one waiting, the others had already gathered and were only waiting for him. Finally, muttered Kaneko, snacking with gusto on some sweets as the white-haired girl eyed him. Well, then, let's go, Harry said awkwardly, aware that everyone had been only waiting for him as he was lost in thoughts in his own room. Kiba the blonde-haired boy could only chuckle at that sight. Lead the way, Harry Cohen. We have no idea where we should go, Akino chimed in with her typical smile and calm beauty, following him out of the door, her styled black hair shaking in the wind. Neither do I. I just read about it. So let's head to the address, we shouldn't miss it once we're there, explained Harry, as it was also his first time in that area. He only learned about it in his library. Their destination. The magical district of France. They had decided to visit the French counterpart of Diagon Alley, located in Paris. Excitement filled the air as they anticipated the unique experience awaiting them in the French wizarding world. All of them wanted to learn the difference between the two, as Diagon Alley was something they enjoyed very much. Leaving the hotel, they entered the awaiting black limousine and told the driver, a low-class devil their destination. Rias made sure that they had always transport ready if they should need it, like this limousine. After a twenty-minute drive through the beautiful but bustling city, they arrived at their destination. Standing on Rue Richer, they looked around in wonder as Aquino asked, Where should we go now, Harry Cohen? To the best of my knowledge, this should be the entrance, Harry explained, pointing at a bronze statue depicting a woman sitting on a pedestal. They all gazed at the unassuming statue, noticing its abutant and rich magical aura that could only be sensed by beings like themselves. With curious looks on their faces, they decided to approach the statue, eager to uncover its secrets. As it was clearly enchanted. Something is supposed to happen if we approach that statue, explained Harry as he took the lead, carefully walking towards the bronze statue. Some kind of mind magic was at play as none of the other people on Rue Richer paid attention to them. Once they were close enough to the statue, as if responding to their presence, it began to stir. Its stone features softened, and the life within it awakened. Slowly and gracefully, the statue moved its leg, stepping away from the pedestal that had anchored it. Its dress, intricately carved in stone, billowed and swirled as if caught in an unseen breeze. Between its legs, the entrance to Place Cachy, the French counterpart of Diagon Alley, was revealed. None of the non-magical people were any wiser, continuing with their daily lives. Well, this seems to be it, 
said Aquino with a polite smile as she observed the entrance. It seems so, muttered Harry. What are we waiting for? Let's go, decided Rias excitedly as she moved forward through the entrance, disappearing in it. With a shrug of their shoulders and a helpless smile, the others followed her lead and passed through the entrance between the legs of the bronze statue. Behind the entrance, a big stone plaza revealed itself. The place was crowded with people shopping in this magical place. Multiple small streets led away from this big central plaza. The streets were lined with whimsical shops, their colorful facades adorned with intricate carvings and shimmering signs. Unlike the architecture of Diagon Alley, the French wizards seemed to have progressed from the Middle Ages towards the Renaissance, as the architectural style was more modern and elegant. It was quite a sight for them. While Diagon Alley had its own unique flair, this place was bustling with elegance. Wow, this place looks amazing, said Rias in wonder as she watched the different stores in this place, with their magical goods on display in their windows. Magical lights, moving objects, or the strong feeling of magic encompassed this place. The others could only nod and agree with her assessment of wonder. A particularly colorful shop caught Kaneko's attention, as the smell wafting from there was wonderful. It was called Confisory Enchanté de K. Remel, a magical sweet shop with a varied collection of enchanted sweets. Well, it seems we already have the first place to check out, laughed Harry as he patted Kaneko's head, who only nodded in excitement. Luckily for them, they didn't need to look for a bank first to exchange some money, since the galleon was the global currency of the wizarding world. Goblins and the Swiss gnomes had a monopoly on banking and determined a unified currency centuries ago. All they had to do was request Lord Gremory to exchange some currency for them, and they had a comfortable amount of spending money ready for today. They bought quite an assortment of sweets at the store, like cakes, sugar unicorn horns, pumpkin pasties, and many other different sweets. After they finished there, Harry stored the bags filled with sweets inside his sacred gear as they continued on. They made another stop at a magical café called Café Abringer, where they enjoyed quite tasty magical beverages like taste and color-changing tea, tasty cappuccino with magical cinnamon aroma cream, and more. As they walked down the street, they checked many of the stores out, like cauldron shops, astronomy shops, and in an apothecary, Harry added ingredients not available or rare in Britain to his stock. They stopped at a pet shop called Le Corbeau Mystique, where the others each bought their own owl, as they had developed a method for owls to teleport between the Gremory Hotel and the Underworld, allowing them the possibility to communicate with Harry in the wizarding method. It was a bit more inefficient but added its own charm, and each of them now had an intelligent pet bird as an additional companion. They could also form a summoning contract with them, making them another familiar for them. In this manner, everyone had something they wanted to explore and continued to explore every possible corner of Place Kashi, checking all kinds of different stores and learning about more magical items at every store. As Harry had to store more and more goods in his sacred gear, acting as their personal inventory. Harry chose the next shop he wanted to check out, the bookstore for any interesting tomes to add to his library, so they visited Magillard, Plume's E.D. Tome. It was a store filled with many colorful books. But they were all in French, although their devil's physiology allowed them to communicate in any language in the world. It didn't mean that they could just read every language in the world, and they had to learn it normally. But once Harry knew he would be visiting France, he began studying the language in his free time, as he always planned to add tomes from anywhere he visited to his collection. His understanding of French was good enough for him to identify and purchase the most interesting books on every topic. But quite a lot of books in stock were just versions of many books he already possessed, just in French. In the end, he still managed to add a lot to his collection. While leaving the store to join the others who got bored as they couldn't read anything, he had a flash of inspiration. Why was he even learning French himself? All he had to do was to buy some books teaching French to English speakers and add them to the libraries in his sacred gear. The inhabitants of his planet would do the work for him. He absolutely should do it with every language. With this new idea in his mind, Harry happily continued towards the next store where the others said they would be waiting for him. His goal was a clothing store called Maison Cape Noir, located next to a Quidditch shop called Gaston McCarran Equipment Quidditch on Rue Juridon, the street he was currently walking down. Once he arrived at the clothing store, holding multiple fashionable items in their window, he could already see from the outside that something was wrong. Rias, Aquino, Kaneko, 
and Kiba were standing protectively in front of a pair of beautiful blonde girls. One young girl a bit younger than Kaneko, while the older girl seemed to be around three years older than them. Both of them were very beautiful and clearly related to each other as they looked quite similar. They were probably sisters. The strange thing about them was that they were releasing some kind of magical aura trying to affect them, but his sacred gear seemed to interrupt the effect of this aura, blocking it from affecting him. Stepping inside the store, he could see that the whole peerage was quite angry. Rhea said to someone in front of her, What are you doing here? She was ready to fight whoever it was that stood in front of her. Kiba even had pulled out a sword that he created with his sacred gear, Sword Birth. While the two girls behind them watched with awe and concern. What is going on here? asked Harry his voice cutting through the tension as he approached the group, trying to see who they were confronting. Rhea's relief was evident on her face as she heard Harry's voice coming from the entrance. She turned her head, her crimson hair swaying, and a smile formed on her lips. Once Harry stepped forward, he recognized the other person causing trouble for his friends. Oh boy, what is he doing here? How unlucky can we be to meet that idiot here, Harry deadpanned as he saw Riser Phoenix with short blonde hair and blue eyes. Beside Riser stood three girls. One of them, a voluptuous teenager about the same age as Riser, had long wavy purple hair cascading down her back, matching her eyes. The right side of her hair fell over her breast, covering her right eye, while the left side reached near the top of her skirt. She wore a purple tunic, and Harry recognized her as Yubaluna, Riser's queen, whom he had seen at a previous event. Harry couldn't quite place the two other girls, who seemed to be around the same age. One of them was tall, with long black hair tinged with a subtle dark blue hue flowing down her back. Her captivating brown eyes held a mysterious allure. Delicate ponytails adorned her hair, encircling her head, and a golden hair accessory held them in place. Her attire caught Harry's eye, a white top with elegant black accents, reminiscent of a Chinese chongsam. She paired it with vibrant red shorts, knee-high boots adorned with protective armor, and matching gauntlets. The diamond-shaped cutout on the top accentuated her chest and cleavage, making it an eye-catching detail. The other girl, of Chinese descent, had a well-endowed figure, her shoulder-length black hair framing her face. Her captivating blue-green eyes held a hint of mystery. She styled her hair in two traditional Chinese buns on either side of her head, while bangs formed a graceful V-shape across her forehead. Her ensemble exuded grace, a navy blue chi-pao adorned with intricate gold accents, cinched at the waist with a white sash. Completing the look were black, low-heeled shoes that added a touch of sophistication. Harry, you're here. Rias greeted with relief. But it was evident that they were clearly part of Riser's peerage. TCH, that commoner is interrupting his betters again. How dare you interrupt Riser when he is talking to his fiancée, complained Riser, recognizing Harry as the one who annoyed him at Rhea's birthday party. Well, I am part of your fiancé's peerage. And you are clearly threatening my king and friends. Both sides have their weapons drawn. And why are you still talking in the third person? That's something children do who haven't learned to speak properly yet, Harry complained, already annoyed by Riser's behavior. How dare you mock Riser? That's how higher-born people talk. Not something a filthy commoner like you would know, replied Riser, his cheeks turning a hint of pink. Yeah, sure. Higher born. I haven't heard Rias speaking like you, and she is the heiress of House Gremory, a duke-ranked house, while you are the third son with no hereditary titles of a marquee house. So, who can tell me what's going on, asked Harry, ignoring Riser for now but not letting his guard down. He is trying to force us into his peerage, said the elder of the two blonde-haired girls with a French accent. She spoke in French, but Harry's devil magic automatically translated her words for him. Nice to meet you, Mississippi. I am Harry Potter. May I know who I have the pleasure of talking to, he introduced himself, throwing a critical look at Riser. I am Fleur Delacour, and this is my younger sister, Gabrielle. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Potter, she replied, recognition flashing through her eyes as the small girl freed her head from her embrace and looked at Harry with awe. Call me Harry, Ms. Delacour. By what right is he trying to force the two of you into his peerage, he asked, genuinely interested. After a short moment of hesitation, she explained, we are part Vila. 
The Vila Enclave our Grandma Man is part of has a contract with the Phoenix family for protection in the supernatural world. Riser recently spotted us and has been trying for the last few days to force us into his harem, abusing the protection his family provided our enclave. We are apparently a beautiful blonde sister pair, Fleur said as she watched Harry with curiosity. I see that aura I am feeling is your allure. I've read about that. It's good that it doesn't affect me. No wonder that womanizer is after you, joked Harry before turning to Riser. So, am I right to assume that you will push through with your threat until you add them to your harem? And will you abuse the power built by others in your family? He asked, staring down the older boy with anger simmering behind his eyes, aware that he couldn't attack him or it would worsen his position. Yes, they belong to Riser. They are nothing more than servants of the Phoenix clan and have to obey. Riser announced arrogantly, without hesitation. Meanwhile, Harry could see a momentary flicker of helplessness on the faces of the two girls behind Riser. Harry turned to Rias, who angrily glared at Riser. It was obvious that she would stand against him. While such behavior wasn't uncommon among devils, it was frowned upon these days. Am I right to assume that you won't allow that, Rias? asked Harry with a smile. Not at all. They are free people, not his slaves to do with as he likes, she nodded assertively. I see. Well, the solution is simple, said Harry with a grin as he turned to Fleur. As you've already heard, this is Rias Gremory, the heiress of an even higher ranked devil family than the Phoenix clan. How would your enclave like to form a contract with them, especially with Rias? As the heiress, she is allowed to make this kind of decision, Harry asked, his grin widening as he saw the ugly frown on Riser's face. Fleur's face lit up with relief. My grandma man is the leader of that enclave. I am sure she would love to change the partnership to the Gremory family, as the Phoenix family is clearly abusing their power, she eagerly nodded. I, Rias Gremory, heiress of the Gremory family, would love to form a contract with your enclave, Rias agreed without hesitation, observing Riser's displeasure with glee. You can't do that, shouted Riser as fire formed in his hands. Are you sure you want to do that, Riser? asked Harry as a magic circle formed in his hands. I am sure you will already have a hard time explaining to Lord Phoenix or his heir how you lost a contract with a Vila Enclave. Adding a broken engagement because you attacked your fiancé would make things much harder. The flames disappeared as Riser realized the trouble he had caused himself. With no other choice, he clicked his tongue as Yubaluna placed a hand on his shoulder and shook her head. In the end, he turned around and left the store, the two other girls following him with a longing look. As Riser and the members of his peerage disappeared from their sight, the small blonde girl, Gabrielle, freed herself from her sister's embrace and ran to Harry, giving him a hug. You really are Harry Potter. A hero just like in the books, she said excitedly in French. A groan escaped Harry's mouth as he was reminded of the annoying inaccurate storybooks about him. Books that he couldn't do anything about since the wizarding world had no naming rights or copyrights. Yes, my name is Harry Potter, nodded Harry resignedly as the young girl, about eight years old, hugged him. He awkwardly patted her back. So, you are the one from the Harry Potter book series, she asked with an excited glimmer in her eyes. Not wanting to disappoint the little girl who looked at him with hope, he carefully explained, well, yes, kind of. They are stories within them. No, they are not just stories. You are like a real hero. You scared that ugly bad guy away. And you are not like the other boys who always look at me or my big sister with a bad look, she continued in French, nodding her head as she had a great realization. Gabby, come stop hugging him. You can't just hug other people that you don't know, scolded Fleur, her younger sister, as she freed Harry from the small girl with a smile. But I know him. That is Harry, she pouted, pointing at Harry, and nobody could really disarm her logic. I am sorry for Gobby's enthusiasm. She isn't often among people, well, she can't really allure yet. It's quite impressive how you are not affected by it. Even devils are affected by it, especially the ones with a strong sin of lust. Look at your blonde-haired friend, she pointed at Kiba, who had a flushed face as he looked at Fleur. Not sure if I feel it's there, but it isn't really affecting my thoughts, said Harry, unsure if the reason was just his sacred gear that he didn't want to reveal in public or something else. Fleur could only nod in response before turning towards Rias and the others. 
Thank you for protecting us. I don't think he would have let us go if it weren't for you. No worries, we just did what we felt was the right thing to do, said the crimson-haired girl with a smile, as the others nodded. Are we really going to form the contract? Will it not cause problems, she asked with concern, both to Fleur and Harry. It was Harry who answered, and Fleur became concerned again that she would have to join Riser's harem. Of course. Sure, it will cause some tensions with the Phoenix house, but this isn't really our problem, as Riser was acting beyond his standing. If we are lucky, he will even be severely punished and lose some of his freedom. Though they can't really cause any trouble for you or House Gremory, as we are in the right. Anything they do could be used as a reason to breach the contract, since they are in the wrong, explained Harry, as the politics behind it weren't that complex. And the best part is, this shows again that Riser isn't fit to be your husband. Technically, we could push for a raiding game any time to break the contract, but I wouldn't do that yet, as we are not strong enough. The strength of his pieces isn't that bad, since they are all older than us. But the quality of our peerage is much higher, and we will surpass them over time. And this event can be used to mitigate any political damage after we break the contract, since many pure-blooded devils are pushing for this marriage. Ugh, I hate politics, complained Rias, understanding the mechanics behind it before turning to Fleur. So, who do we have to talk to, to form that protective contract? To my grandma man, as I said, she is the leader of the Vila Enclave, explained Fleur. How about you accompany us home? She is currently visiting us because she heard about the troubles that douche is causing us. Rias's eyes lit up. That would be the best. We are home and brought a guest, announced Fleur as she guided them inside an upper-class home in the middle of Paris, close to Place Cachy, as they didn't have to walk far from there. Fleur, Gabrielle, you are safe, said the relieved voice of a beautiful blonde woman entering the hallway and pulling both her daughters into a hub. Your father sent a message from the Auror office that he heard the two of you were in trouble with that buffoon, explained the blonde woman. TCH, that boy seems to have been wrong again. How is he leading his office if he just listens to false rumors, came another female voice from the door. This time, an older, more mature blonde woman arrived in the hallway. She was another kind of beauty, although she looked human, her appearance somehow felt inhuman, almost elvish. Not like house elves, but like the elves from different fantasy works. Maman, stop saying such things about my husband. He is doing a great job. After all, he is the head of the French horror office, scolded the younger woman, probably Fleur's mother. Grandma man. That phoenix douche tried to force us into his harem. But thanks to the intervention of Rias Gremory and Harry Potter, he had to leave us alone. They also have an offer for us, but first of all, this is my mother, Apollon Delacour, introduced Fleur, pointing at the slightly younger of the two women. And this is my grandma man, Helene Delacour, the leader of the Parisian Vila Enclave, introduced Fleur before she did the same for them. It's nice to meet you, greeted her grandmother in kind. What kind of offer does the heiress of the prestigious Gremory family have for me, she asked, interested with a raised eyebrow. In my function as heiress, I am here to offer you the opportunity to replace the Phoenix family as the protector of the Parisian enclave under the same conditions, announced Rias, as businesslike as she could. I see. Are you aware of the exact conditions? asked Helene, intrigued. Yes, Fleur filled us in on the details. You will receive protection from different supernatural factions as an official vassal of the Gremory family and will assist the Gremories however you can. A fact that Riser tried to exploit by forcing himself on your granddaughters. Also, you will pay a certain amount of tribute in the form of different villa ingredients that you shed naturally without harming any of your kind, summarized Rias, remembering everything Fleur had told them. Exactly, and the Gremory family would be fine with such an arrangement, interjected Apollon, now also intrigued. Yes, I have my own issues with the Phoenix family, and agreeing to such a contract would be beneficial to me without any additional conditions, nodded Rias, while Harry sighed internally as she gave away the possibility to gain some profit. The moment she admitted that it was also beneficial to her. Rias was still inexperienced, not that he was much better, but he would have to point that out to her later. Hopefully, the Delacours wouldn't take advantage of that. 
As long as you agree not to force our members into your peerage against their will, I am fine with making the agreement under the same conditions with the Gremory family, nodded Helene, who noticed the mistake but was grateful to the young girl for helping her granddaughters and didn't want to push them away. Yes, but if they want, they can join any Gremory peerages out of their free will, added Harry, not wanting to leave such a small loophole in the contract. No problem. Then we have a deal. How about you stay for dinner? I am sure my incompetent son-in-law would also love to meet you, especially the famous boy who lived who turned out to be a devil. That gives my lawyer time to set up a proper contract, added Helene with a smile. Yes, that would be lovely, agreed Rias eagerly.